So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first presentation and the first uh, plenary session today. Uh, welcome also everybody who is online uh, here participating at the conference. My name is Andreas Zimmer. I'm coming from Graz, University of Graz in Austria, and I'm really very happy to uh, chair this session today. It is the first time after the outbreak of this pandemic situation. I, I really appreciate uh, to be here and uh, thanks also to the organizer for inviting us and having this nice meeting um, uh, this year, yeah, definitely. So um, the first uh, plenary session is dedicated to continuous and additive manufacturing of uh, drug delivery systems. We have two speakers today in the morning. First speaker is Johannes Kinas. He's also from Austria. It's the, coming from the University of um, uh, Technology, Graz University of Technology, and he is head of the Institute of Process and Particle Engineering and also the scientific head of the Research Center of Pharmaceutical Engineering which is a spin-off of the universities in, uh, in Graz. And uh, he will give us a talk about a very recent and uh, very interesting topic today. Uh, the title of the presentation is High Speed Technology for the Manufacturing of Next Generation Trucks. I think this is a very important issue we have seen during the pandemic situation that this is an, an urgent need in terms of uh, manufacturing of uh, these drugs and we need to speed up and to scale up all these new technologies. So Johannes, welcome. The floor is yours. Please start with your presentation. Here we go. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks to the organizing team. Uh, we all know it's not easy to put together such a conference. A lot of things can happen and do happen. And so thanks again for rescuing me yesterday at the airport. So really appreciate this. I'm happy to be here. And as Andreas already mentioned, I want to talk about something which I would think has been around for more than 20 years now, this uh, continuous manufacturing. But in the last months and years, a lot of people have understood how important this is. So what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about the background. I want to talk about the challenges. I also want to talk about the business cases. How can such a technology really be used because this has not been clear uh, and a lot of people have been working in various directions but i think only now funding agencies industry also business sponsors start to understand what the potential of all of this is okay so and that means i want to be a little bit more philosophical than usual i won't show you 100 slides. I mean, I still will do it. Don't worry, we'll still know you with a lot of slides. But um, <clears throat> I want to really reflect what all of this means to us. And I want to start by saying that there's a large number of new, very complicated products that are coming to the market. Of course, we still have advanced solid dosage forms, and they are important. The pipelines are full of them. I mean, if you just look at kinase inhibitors, there are at least like 20 or 30 of them currently in phase two to three studies. So there's a lot of interest in this area. Okay, so, uh, and by the way, I just copied this out of nature. This shows you the approvals by modality type of FDA last year. And what you can see here is that small molecules are actually dominating by far, right? So people are already asking that the small molecules coming back, right? So uh, almost uh, more than two thirds, actually, almost three quarters of molecules are small molecules. Then, of course, there are biologics, proteins, monoclonal antibodies, uh, one or two ADCs, and a few nucleotides as well, right? So and everybody expects that this area is, of course, rapidly increasing in the next years. But still here to show you that even today, okay, the small molecules are very important and they will stay important. Nevertheless, we 
all know, right? There are more complicated products coming to the market. They're like uh, biologics, they're uh, monoclonal antibodies, they're polypeptides, they're oligonucleotides. We've all seen it with the mRNA vaccines, very successful. The mixed modalities, antibody drug conjugates, um, <clears throat> nanostructured systems, uh, nanostructured lipid carriers, all of this, right? Liposomes as drug delivery vehicles. So products are becoming more complex and we cannot deny this. And we from, a, I mean, I'm coming from manufacturing, right? We from a manufacturing point of view, we have to kind of um, realize that there's a lot of pressure on manufacturing. You have more complex products and you need to make them faster and you need to make them very, with very high quality. So what, does, what this means for us, right? From our point of view is that we have to, adopt new ways of making stuff right the old technology the old ways of doing it is not really perfectly suited to the developments of today so that's what we essentially doing that's what i what i want to talk about today maybe one last slide about the scope also drug delivery is becoming more uh, challenging this viral delivery of, of rna and dna okay so this is happening gene therapies are becoming reality uh, nose to brain, a lot of interest in this area because at the end of the day, we need to be able to deliver drugs, medicines effectively to the brain, uh, avoiding the blood brain barrier. Then there's inhalation, still not completely solved the problem, still a lot of technological challenges uh, in, in many ways. And RNA delivery, we all are experts in mRNA uh, delivery now. So we no, but this is interesting, right? There's little, still a lot of uh, challenges and all those <clears throat> lipid structured systems are not optimal yet for delivery. So there's still, I mean, what we have now works, but there are better ways of doing this. I guess and companies are spending enormous amounts of effort, especially on this, sorry, especially in this area here. So that's the scope. That's what I want to say. More complex products, nanostructured products, biologics, but don't forget the small molecules. And all of this requires novel ways of manufacturing. So we have these more complex products. We need to reduce process variability, having better processes. And by doing so, we will, we should improve quality. We also, and Andreas already uh, talked about this, we need to drastically shorten supply chains. Currently supply chains are in the order of six to 12 months, okay? From the start of the production until it's being shipped from the factory to the large scale farmer distributor. So 12 months, this is, this is very long if you really urgently waiting for something, right? If you have drug shortages, in case of pandemics, have you just seen, right? Everybody was super excited. I mean, I'm not sure how your uh, vaccination status is, but in, in February, every or in January, everybody was frantic to get a shot, right? So people were saying, "What's the problem? Why is it such a hard thing to make billions of doses?" It's a hard thing, but because the manufacturing technologies are not made for rapid and fast uh, production, so shortening supply chains is very important. And and directly connected, this is the resilience. Another issue which has become very apparent, we completely depend on Asia, especially on China, to supply APIs. Also, India depends to a great extent on China. Even India uh, starts to invest in their own API manufacturing technologies. I mean, they have them, but they, they are still 60, 70% dependent on China. And we, we are depending on China as well. And if uh, for some reason, okay, there's some... We don't hope, of course, if there's some regional conflict, if there's some geopolitical power struggle, China really can turn off the API supply for Europe or for US if they want. Okay? Nothing that I'm, um, nothing that I'm uh, foreseeing, but I'm saying politicians have understood and the Americans especially have understood that resilience is one of the most important strategic um, strategic endeavors of the future. And the Americans are investing heavily okay, in their own 
supply chains, where everything from the small building block of the chemicals to the, to the, to the fill and finish uh, dosage forms is made in US. Okay, so um, that's the trend of the times. And um, we as pharmaceutical technologists, we, for us, this is perfect, right? I mean, it couldn't be better. So we are able to contribute a little bit. And five years ago, when I was talking to people about my research area, everybody was bored after two minutes. Now it takes them 10 minutes to get bored. But so what I'm saying is like, it's really starting to become uh, known to the public that resilience, shorter supply chains is very important. Of course, individualized manufacturing is something which we've been talking about for, for many years now, um, very important. I will not talk about it today. Standardized development efforts, platforms, that's something important, robustness, that's important. So bring this together, I think pharmaceutical technologists have a very important role now in this world, right? Because we need to be able to develop uh, robust processes, to be faster, to be more efficient, to have higher quality. And I think that's exciting, at least it's exciting for me. So what is our definition of advanced manufacturing? Just to give you a little bit more of, uh, of, of background, I think controlled is very important. So not doing a process without integrated real-time control. That is something which we need to learn and no process should run in patch, have a trajectory, and then at the end of the day, you test the quality. It should always be monitored. It should be able to control the process in the sense of if there's a deviation, I need to react. It needs to be understood. For controlling something, I need to understand it. If I don't understand what I'm doing, there's nothing I can do in terms of control, uh, basic chemical engineering knowledge. So understanding and especially mechanistic understanding is very important. And I, am, I, I love all this data science. Don't get me wrong. I love machine learning because it's amazing, right? If I'm calling US company these days, you don't, uh, you cannot distinguish between a human and a machine anymore. It's that perfect. You can say, look, I need to open a bank account and they will answer you in, in a totally normal way. Yes, how can I help you with this? So they understand completely and they sound like humans. So machine learning is amazing, okay, in many areas. <clears throat> but uh, still, uh, I believe that for, for a, a rational development of processes, a mechanistic model, okay, something comes in, something comes out, and maybe there's some change in between. That's a mechanistic model. This helps you in a much better way than data-driven models, because this is true for every system, for a small system, for a large system, for a system that has blue things coming in and for a system that has red things coming in. And I don't need to train a model on everything, right? This is the, the, the great disadvantage of data-driven models. You always need training data sets. And if you don't have them, your model predicts garbage. So if you change something, you get garbage. And that's why mechanistic models are also important. So under, understanding stuff is very important. And that's one of our main mission of uh, my center, actually, to contribute to controlling and to understanding. Should be also robust, meaning small changes in some excipient grade shouldn't uh, upset the whole process, should be intensified if possible, meaning uh, I should combine unit operations or should simplify unit operations, bringing processes together. It's always a good thing. It can, can reduce solvent use or energy use or environmental impact. They should also, a process should be scalable, meaning they should work on a small scale, on a large scale, ideally, right? Because it's uh, there are many technologies which are very, very hard to scale works super well on a small scale, but big surprises on a large scale. I mean, just as an example, a bioreactor is something like this. A bioreactor in the one liter fermenter is completely different in its shear and its oxygen mass transfer than a 15,000 liter bioreactor. Completely different things. And for some cases, it's very bad. For some cases, it doesn't matter. Okay, but some, some biological uh, systems, cell lines, are not as sensitive, but some are. And then you're sitting around with a bioreactor which doesn't produce uh, enough. And uh, actually, actually, one of these uh, AstraZeneca vaccines suffered from this 
uh, scale up issues uh, when they try to, to make them in France, I believe. <clears throat> so scalability is very important. Of course, it needs to be economic at the end of the day. You need to be, and that's another uh, thing which is very relevant. If you don't have technology, which is cheaper than what is made in China, you will never be able to compete. So you need to be cheaper and faster. Otherwise, nobody will buy your products. Okay, so this all of this, it, it's a multidisciplinary challenge. But uh, I think we all, I mean, not we, but we all are able to address this and uh, come up with new technology. And that's what I'm uh, referring to when I talk about high speed uh, manufacturing. So I think almost everybody has heard what so this is the difference between continuous manufacturing and batch manufacturing uh, just for those few of you who have who have, who have escaped this uh, just in the batch manufacturing paradigm you have a step then if another step then if another step and it all those steps in the synthesis easily it depends on how complex your molecule is easily spans 10 to 20 steps at each step you stop take your intermediate, your test, your store, then if it's released, you go into the next step. And of course, it uh, has many disadvantages. It's slow, it takes a lot of testing, uh, you need to store everything, so warehousing becomes uh, problematic. And the continuous way of doing it is that something flows through the system. So the synthesis happens in, in the molecules are flowing through your reactors, uh, flow chemistry also called, then you do a continuous crystallization, then you do blending, then you do granulation side, and then you have a tablet press and maybe a coat at the end. So it's flowing through a system that would be a continuous manufacturing approach. But this is of course also not ideal. It doesn't work that way, right? So um, <clears throat> what you usually see is that we have a synthesis between batch steps and continuous manufacturing steps. But this is, I think, what we uh, need to think about, how to do this in a smart, integrated way, scheduling it, having three steps, API synthesis in flow, then stopping, solvent change, crystallization, um, and then you do uh, in batch, and then you do another continuous step. So I think this is, at the end of the day, how the uh, factory of the future will look like. <clears throat> But that's a little bit uh, the idea for you to understand. So this is the classic way of doing it. it. Takes a long time. That's the kind of new novel way of doing. It. That's what we call the high speed manufacturing. And just to explain a little bit where this is coming from. Uh, actually, the biggest driver of this was uh, Rutgers University when I was there. Uh, I was young faculty there. I came to Rutgers, I think 1997 and there was Professor Musio, O. Mishniak, Ben Glasser, and there were a young team of professors who started to work with local pharma companies. It was Bristol Mass Grip, it was Merck, it was Johnson and Johnson, and <clears throat> and I also joined this team. And we started 1997 the first consortium on continuous pharmaceutical manufacturing, and at this time. Everybody was telling us this is complete BS. Okay, so nobody will ever do this. But then uh, we also invited a lot of people from FDA. And at this time, I think the older ones of us remember Edges Hussein. He was uh, the, the deputy commissioner of CEDAR, the Center for Drug Evaluation Research, at the same position that Janet Woodcock has these days. And he was always at Rutgers and he was a very visionary guy. This was a really cool guy. And they started to, be, to get really excited about this continuous manufacturing for, for different reasons than we were, right? So we just said like, look, chemical engineers, we want it better, faster, cheaper, right? But they, FDA saw it from a completely different angle. They saw it as a measure to be agile. If I have patience and the need drug supply, I need to make something fast, okay? In terms of agility, in terms of reacting to shortages and pandemics. So FDA got really excited about this and they started to push this 
whole topic around uh, 2001, 2002. Then they came up with the PAD initiative, uh, as you may remember, 2004. But that was all graded at Rutgers at this time uh, in discussions with FDA. And then, of course, all those big initiatives came, the MIT Novartis Center of uh, Continuous Manufacturing and so on. Okay, so But it really started more than 20 years ago. Uh, and all of those guys we still know super well. Um, they're all like uh, FDA guys, and we we're working with Janet and uh, Thomas and uh, and many others. Okay, so that's basically the idea. To repeat, okay, what are the advantage of continuous manufacturing? First of all, you have small reactors. Since everything flows in and flows out, and it happens, and you're doing it for a few days or a few weeks, you don't have to turn it off. It's a big, you, you, you don't need a big reactor, you have a small reactor. So everything is much, much smaller. And I will show you a few examples of this later. So smaller footprint is very important. Okay? Plus, that's another advantage. You're using the same system for development as you use for production. That means all the scale-up trouble, okay? The anxiety, the, the, the uh, angst of uh, scale-up is gone, right? Because you know your system, so that's an advantage. You need to, by definition, integrate quality assurance in your process, in quality control, or quality control, because uh, you have online sensing, you have real-time sensors, you have headline sensing, which ensures that your process is in a state of control. It provides flexibility and agility because you can turn on the <clears throat> system and let it run for two days or for two weeks, right? On demand. It allows also decentralized production because you don't need a huge facility. Actually, a room like this, you can put everything, a complete pharma company, on the continuous manufacturing paradigm in a room like this. You don't need huge facilities. Um, as, as I just said, it reduces floor space, inventory, can support resilience. So if you are able to make your APIs continuously, your drug products continuously, and this quickly and at low costs, you don't depend on China and India anymore. You can do it in your own country. That's what the US are doing now. It's much faster. That's why we start to call it now high-speed technology because you're factor 10 faster uh, overall than with traditional technology. And of course, the different flavors of continuous manufacturing. There's pure continuous manufacturing, as I showed you before, then there's semi-continuous, also called micro-patches. A lot of companies are doing this. And then there's a integration of continuous and patch. And that's what I believe is the is combination of those two uh, ideas in a smart way, that's the future. So those are the advantages of continuous manufacturing and uh, it has disadvantages too, of course, okay? And these disadvantages I'll talk about later uh, when we talk about the challenges. But if I'm, and this is just, these are just numbers which I made up, okay? So this has no scientific uh, basis. It's just what I feel from what I've seen in discussions with companies where can I apply this? When I talk about solid dosage forms, okay, I think this can be with current technology to 100% transformed or transferred to continuous manufacturing. With API synthesis, also a lot of things can be done in flow. Not everything, especially solvent changes. Uh, intermediate crystallization is also not easy, okay? Filtration, washing, continuously, uh, it works, okay? So there's a lot of people working on this, but it's a mess, okay, at the end of the day. There's always something uh, not, not going well. So I would think like there's uh, still a few steps in between you need to do in batch, and batch makes a lot of sense. Batch filtration, batch washing, batch crystallization maybe <clears throat> makes a lot of sense. So that's my feeling. Then when you talk about biologics, I think we are, we are actually going even lower than that because a bioreactor takes weeks sometimes to make your um, monoclonal antibody and the advantages of continuous manufacturing are not so apparent. If it takes weeks anyway, then 
the speed is not your bottleneck, right? So for, uh, we believe, I mean, for some areas, it makes sense, especially in the purification area from the cell lysis to the uh, purified systems, but for the, for the fermentation itself, less so although i mean i'm not saying this is not uninteresting there's a lot of interest in this and a lot of groups working on this actually but i think from a technical application at the end of the day biologics classical biologics will remain batch manufacturing for a long long time and when we talk about rna vaccines that's something which ideally actually is suitable for continuous manufacturing i'll show you a little bit about this later that's our field oral dosage forms so that's the last blah 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 slide, but I think that's a very important slide, and that's the reason I'm taking a little bit of time to go through it. What are the challenges? And I think there are three major areas of challenges which kind of uh, which we have to solve and think about, and that's what we've been doing for the last year to think very very hard about what actually is the advantage. And we, I think we came up with a few cool or interesting conclusions, uh, especially down here, which I want to share with you in a few minutes or seconds. But let me go through this first. Process design, plant design, that's certainly a challenge. So there's no ideal continuous manufacturing plant on this planet, which works smoothly without a problem. So every Big pharma company today, most of them at least, have continuous manufacturing installations, which are very different. Roche does micro batches. Um, Pfizer has a completely continuous uh, direct compaction uh, paradigm, what they're using. So everybody is doing it a little bit differently, but there's, and, and you know, the Novartis efforts on, on continuous manufacturing developed by MIT. Kind of right, and put together by Markus Krumme. He was the one. I mean, some of you know him very well. They have this complete integrated facility, but it's also, uh, I think, not the, the perfect role model. So there's still a lot of challenges in this area. When we talk about API synthesis, how to do this effectively, I have not seen the perfect solution. As I said, my belief is integration of continuous and batch, two, three steps in flow, then purification batch, going back to flow, going back to batch, and so on. Solid dosage forms, yes, there are still issues. I will show you some of the problems. Biologics, how to do this in biologics is a question. So there's, there's no, in my, to my knowledge, some, some uh, facility that does biologics in continuous mode. Vaccines, super new, okay especially mRNA vaccines, so there's no, no, nothing has been done. Also for nanostructured systems, there's a lot of challenge there. So nanostructured systems, a lot of interest in lipid carriers, polymeric carriers, and so on, right? Uh, making this in the lab on a small scale works well. It's been published thousands of, thousands of times, but transferring this to an industrial manufacturing floor is not easy. Okay, so we need to invest a lot of this in this. And now comes the whole control of this. Process control is very challenging. How to do this in an effective way? How do I detect out of spec products? How do I remove out of spec products from a process? We call the segregation. Um, how to do this, right, is, is process control. How to match the throughput of uh, subsequent uni, unit operations. If you have a disturbance upstream, how to react downstream. If you have a disturbance downstream, how to react upstream. When you have like 10 unit operations, this is becoming a super complicated exercise. And for this, you need a lot of modeling and simulation. So this is intimately tied to process control modeling and simulation. Only if you model your process properly, you can do this. And of course, online analytics as well, right? Without analytics, you cannot control anything. You cannot model anything. You need this whole package. So this really uh, is summing a whole package, a whole area of research, which is still ongoing and not completely um, 
yeah, solved because there are also a lot of areas where we don't have sensors. Do we have a sensor for mRNA encapsulation efficiency? No, you don't. Do you have a sensor to measure API concentration for low dose APIs down to when you have like in the microgram range 0.1%? No, you don't have this either. No NIR or Raman spectroscopy will be able to do this for you. Okay, so or powder density to say something very trivial. Uh, there's no sense of powder density, which is a mess. Nobody came up with the online sensor. You, can, you cannot put a pycnometer into your process. You need an online sensor. It doesn't exist. So there's a lot of uh, still open questions, and which is good, I guess, for us academics. Then, of course, all of this is also very important. This is something we very often overlook from a research point of view. But this whole thing has to be able to work on the GMP. So cleaning is important. Qualification of the equipment. How is this done? They cannot come up with some crazy process where, where all this uh, all this powder sticks to the walls and it's very hard to clean because you have all those spray shadows um, for your zip line. So this is something challenging. And how do you make it flexible, right? So that very much connects to this one later, but I'll talk about it later. So this, this is how to mix and match and how to have a flexible phase. Actually, we're just in the process of building something up at Kratz. So I start to understand the pain of all of this very well. How to do the cleaning, very important. As important as the manufacturing, without good cleaning, there's nothing you can do in terms of manufacturing because you get, don't get approved, then you cannot do anything. So I guess uh, certainly, left out a few points, but I think what I want to demonstrate is that in the process design, there's still a lot of cool things to do. Okay? And we still have, and even myself, it was five years ago, I was really getting a little bit bored with this whole continuous manufacturing, because it was always the same blah, blah. And, uh, and yeah, and essentially everybody was saying the same thing and some companies were doing this, but I think now, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, why I strongly believe that. I think now the, the, the uh, recent developments have really shown us how exciting this whole thing is and how important this is. And this will be, this pandemic will be also a disruptive change of how we will make drugs in the future. And uh, I think that's the, that's the basis. That's the reason why I'm excited again about it. Uh, material selection, next challenge. Okay, so when we talk about powders, I think I'm... Oh, I'm slowly running out of time. I don't, will not show you much. Uh, when we talk about powders, you will see all of this is very painful. Okay, you need a good powder in terms of flowability. You need powders. You have ten components. They all need to flow well. They have to mix well. They don't are not supposed to segregate, um, which is you, you actually less of a problem. But what is a big problem is adhesion ele electrostatic charging because these materials stick to your uh, process equipment and then they don't flow through the process so this is very um, a complex issue then of course for biologics you need to make sure that it's sterile that enough infections you need to worry about grading quality all the time do you get the same grade no you usually don't right you have a supplier and then it changes this process so the grade and the quality is a little bit different but this might affect your process so in terms of variability and even more dramatic now, okay? something which we scientists like to overlook is availability to international supply chains, which are super vulnerable, as we learned. So this is something which you always need to uh, keep in, uh, in, in, in your thoughts. So this is what also called supply management. And we started now re a relatively large research project um, using artificial intelligence, actually, that automatically studies all international websites to understand how companies um, create the supply networks. Because the, the Chinese guys, they're also buying from DuPont, right? The, the building stuff, so from a Malaysian company, and they're getting the vials maybe from shot glass in Germany. So this is super complicated. Nobody understands this. Even companies don't understand this. Don't think that uh, Pfizer knows the supply network. They don't. They know the first tier suppliers. And maybe the second tier, but they don't know the whole depth of this supply chain. So this is something quite uh, 
interesting, I think, and challenging. So this whole materials and supplies is a big topic for future manufacturing. And then, of course, the whole <laughs> area of uh, regulatory science and business. What's the business motivation? And this is, I think, where I think you see the biggest um, issues right now. I mean, batch definition. <clears throat> I think this has been kind of, it was, everybody was worried about batch definition five or 10 years ago. This works. EMA, FDA, the Chinese, the Japanese have approved many processes and batch definition is not an issue. How does providers, what did it do? Real-time release, these are things we worry about, uh, state of control, online analytics. <coughs> but then it's becoming tricky. <coughs> so the validation and qualification of emergency products, that's something not easy, okay? This is something which is not solved at all. So you have a facility and you say, this is something which I can turn on in case of a pandemic to make rapidly vaccines to make rapidly antivirals and then your agency comes and says no 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 you have to qualify you have to validate the three batch validation and it takes you at least half a year a year to do this so the bottleneck then becomes the regulatory aspects okay so working with regulatory agencies and they understand this of course as well how to kind of pre-file processes to to pre-file processes for certain medications which might become important this is something um, which we are thinking a lot about and others too of course what do you do with generics it's fairly easy uh, especially if you have pcs uh, one and three and if bio wave approach but um but what do you do with patented drugs if what if um this remdesivir you may remember people thought about remdesivir being a remedy for corona it was not but if it had been the patent was with, uh, was it Abbott? Uh, no, 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 it wasn't neither. Uh, I, I remember in a second, but what do you do then? How do you produce this? Um, and then the business case in pharma, how do, what, what's the business case in pharma? And uh, I believe, frankly, I, well, I've come to the conclusion that for large pharmaceutical companies, continuous manufacturing is more or less a toy something nice to have it's it's not relevant to them at the end of the day because they're looking at patients so the the money they get is from patients and if the patients get a little bit later than earlier so what they sell the same amount of drugs so continuous manufacturing does have advantages it makes this flow space maybe smaller and it makes it a little bit uh, more effective but you know, at the end of the day, manufacturing is not the big problem that they have, uh, the big bill for them. Okay? So they make money from patients and manufacturing is, of course, a pain, but in, in complex and costs money. But it's not the great game changer, a novel molecule for them or licensing in a biotech company with a cool little uh, inhibitor. That's what they're really excited about. So I think the business driver will come from a different Angle. It I think it will be a disruptive, disruptive change in uh, in in technology. So, <clears throat> in the sense of that, small companies will be able to rapidly supply medicines to the market. Something like a something like an Uber for pharmaceuticals. And these small companies, they will learn and learn more. Okay, and they will be better and better. And suddenly, they will completely eliminate the supply chains that exist today, right? I'm not saying that patents are invalidated. I'm saying that the whole way the supply chains work today will be something of the past, maybe 20 years from now. But this will happen, not happen via the route that we've been thinking about a few years ago. I think it will happen via different routes, um, disruptive international supply chains, maybe local production of drugs. Maybe 20 years from now, we're doing it in your garage. Could be, uh, because the technology certain is here. And yeah, well, just that's coming to the end of another 500 slides. That's like a classic downstream plant. We have this at RCP. I already told it that in our view, uh, 
Um, modeling and simulation is very important. So let me just show you one last slide about this. So this is something we've been doing with Pfizer. Direct compaction line, trying to understand the feeders very much, just blenders, feed frames of every machine coders. And we're also rolling this out now to many other things like RNA vaccines, hot metal extrusion of nanostructure products. Uh, RNA vaccines are already mentioned because this is something, this is pure chemistry. When you're starting with your mRNA, all this you can do in flow very easily and you can actually churn out a few million doses per week. So you can supply a country within a month. Uh, this is not even scaled up. This is just one little facility which fits in one container, by the way. Okay, so there's a very small footprint. So one container can supply a country uh, in terms of these vaccines. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I think the technology is there, it has challenges. It gives you a lot of advantages <clears throat> in terms of speed up, faster, smaller, top quality, flexibility on demand, resilience. And I think that the change will come via a disruptive way of doing stuff, okay? And by small companies, startups, which are um, filling this niche. Thanks a lot. And by the way, this is for the PhD students, a motivator. If you think your life is hard in your lab, and if your professor is really pushing you too hard, always think that there are worse jobs. You can also have this job of this guy. He's like scraping ice off a, off a <laughs> cable, car cable, somewhere in the, in, uh, in the, in the Rocky Mountains, not the Rocky, it's Whistler Mountain. That's what I seen last year, just before the pandemic. All right, thanks a lot. So thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Do you have any questions? I think, yeah, there's an initial question over there. <coughs> thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. My name is Paweł Pietkiewicz from Pol Pharma, and I'm representing a pharmaceutical company. And the question is, uh, what is the best way from your perspective to implement new brilliant idea from the university to pharma industry? And uh, what is the best way to convince uh, EMA and FDA to approve, for instance, new model for the manufacturing processes? Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Uh... <clears throat> Well, it's like not easy to answer this without making some advertisement from a research center. So <laughs> I apologize, no, but uh, with, with, without kidding, I think universities, rightfully so, are breeding ground for amazing ideas, right? And, and it's the crazier those ideas, the better. And then there's something in between university and the company. And these are these kind of this industrial consortia where companies invest little money and universities bring in the brightest guys and then they do together some sort of um, some sort of advancement of technology, bring it from a TRL level, as we now all know what this is, uh, for three or four to TRL level eight or nine right so technically readiness level very far and um, several centers like this i just want to mention cmac at uh at strathclyde university they have this this conglomerate of university guys and industrial guys and they're defining together research topics for the future and then they're trying to show if this works or not and how to implement and how to get it ready. And then the last few miles, the company can do this uh, themselves, right? From TRL eight to 10, a company can usually do by themselves. But for this intermediate area, I think these research consortia are very important. Germany does invite, for example. We have this RCP, the American initiatives like NIPTE and so on. So I think there are like a lot of initiatives which can help you like this uh, and, and that's the role of those consortia. And when you talk about regulators, there is a lot of interest from FDA and EMA side to work with companies to invest in new technology. There's the ETT, the emergency technology team at FDA, super open people. They 
uh, you just send them an application to work with them and to do, and they are really open to implement new technology. So I think uh, I know it better from FDA side because we're working closely with them, but that those are very open. So there's no hesitancy from their side to work with companies to get new technology to make drugs for patients faster and with higher quality. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we, we do have the option to take questions from the chat platform, so we, we do have the tablet here. So if anybody wants to ask the question, please type it into the system. We will see it immediately and we can ask uh, the question to you. Are there further questions? Here? And I apologize today. I was really so not just talking about philosophy and, and background <laughs> mainly. Well, but, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, but it's uh, the question is really important how to to manage this transit. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you already mentioned this manufacturing continuous manufacturing could be still uh, something like a, a challenge for the industry. But it, I think it's not the main challenge. The challenge comes before mm -hmm. it goes to the manufacturing Absolutely. step. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much for a really excellent um, uh, lecture and uh, we regret that we don't have time for another lecture from you. Uh, <laughs> well, so uh, be glad, you should be glad, my not... question is more detailed because I've heard that uh, nowadays the silica, colloidal silica uh, is, is starting to be, uh, you know, uh, unwanted excipient. Yes. And then we have this uh, flowability uh, requirements. So do you have any idea what will be the direction for uh, uh, to replace uh, colloidal silica to make continuous production? Uh, actually, I don't have a good answer to this. Particle engineering is certainly one way of uh, getting excipients and APIs which are flowing in a better way. So I think this is one way to take, but of course you need this guidance. Without those guidance, it's very hard to do. And I think there will be, I mean, I haven't thought about this. It's a good thing that you bring this up because I really am curious about the answer myself. Uh, but uh, as I'm saying, like, you need, need to have grades of materials which are flowing well by themselves, right? And uh, or you do your API in a nano structured form, and then the API is the guidance at the same time. I mean, just to say, to, to say something, okay? <laughs> or maybe the opposite. Or maybe the opposite, right? <laughs> Nano does not help at any time, so it's uh, probably well, I mean, this, this, it, it, it could be. Nano it, it could be, yeah, but it could be worse. Yeah. Could be worse yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there any further questions? Yeah, I think Stane, just maybe you can just forward the microphone to him. Thank you very much for this picture lecture. My question would be, you have experiences. What do you say about the approach, difference approach between EMA on one side and FDA with regard to this continuous manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Because uh, as okay. far as I know, uh, in Europe, uh, a little bit more conservative comparing yeah. to the... I mean, the, and please, I'm not an expert on this. When it comes to EMA, I have to really, uh, really emphasize this. But the big difference is that EMA is mainly composed of local agencies. So every agency sends somebody to EMA. Yeah. EMA is not, by them, I mean, they have, of course, some staff now, but EMA uh, always consisted of local authorities and no local authority was ever um, at a level that they could themselves um, advance to, to levels that the FDA is. The FDA has staff, they have dedicated scientists that give money to research organizations. So they're very, very different animal, right? And But what I've seen is that EMA is always there with FDA. So they are very closely interacting on continuous manufacturing. Uh, and there are few experts in Europe, but uh, certainly Europe hasn't been leading on this. That's That's something I can tell you, okay? So, and we have been supporting a few continuous manufacturing applications in Europe uh, with EMA, with our, with our expertise. 
and from what I've seen, this was never a major problem. Okay, so I've not seen a problem, but they're certainly not drivers. They're not in the driver's seat. Thank you. Okay. I think we have to continue with the next uh, speaker. So thanks again uh, Thank for the talk. Much. Yeah, we will now continue with the second presentation today in the morning. The presentation comes from Julian Bortbach. He is from the Institute of Pharmaceutics and Biopharmaceutics at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. I think currently he's going to, to move to Utrecht University. So as I learned yesterday, so we wish you all the best for the new and next position. And Julian is giving now a uh, talk about a uh, very interesting uh, technology when it comes to the printing. And I think the 3D printing technology, the title of the presentation is Additive Manufacturing in Pharmaceutics, a new jack of all trades. Uh, we are really looking forward to have your presentation. So please go ahead. Thank you for the kind words and the nice introduction. First, I want to thank the organizers of this wonderful meeting for inviting me and really organizing such a very great and entertaining meeting. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the well, one and a half days that we are still here. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's uh, very good to, to start after or to be after Johannes with his talk, because he's talking about the disruptive potential of high speed technologies. And I'm working on the others uh, on the other end of the spectrum. So low, very low speed technologies, but also with the potential to be disruptive. And I'm here to talk about whether, well, 3D printing is a new jack of all trades. And I can, but the answer is actually quite simple. I can just say yes, and I could leave the stage, but this would of course only be half of the truth. There are many more things to, con uh, to consider. And this is always a, diff a little difficult if you look at literature because literature, if you look at, especially in the literature up until 2019, 2018, there were the words revolutionized drug manufacturing, reinventing, reigning in a new era, and reshaping the future of pharmaceutical manufacturing. And I'm always a little hesitant when I read such kind of headlines, to be honest. And why is that? Because of, well, graphs like this. So here you see the publications per year when you put in the search, uh, search terms 3D print and drug into Scopus. And you see that, well, basically until 2013, we had hardly any publications in pharmaceutical 3D printing. And then all of a the sudden, there was an immense interest in this field. And this reminds me of yeah, the, the Gartner hype cycle, which is a graph I think all of you are familiar with. So you have a technology trigger, everyone is uh, jumping on the bandwagon, everyone is hyping the technology, and then this is followed by the trough of disillusionment. And I'm giving this presentation to hopefully ease the transition from the peak of inflated expectations directly to a peak of productivity without going through the, through the trough of disillusionment. And for this, I need to generalize a lot. So I will not talk about the different technologies individually. I could talk about those for hours and it wouldn't do any good in this, uh, this topic. So I will generalize. I will not talk about the specific technologies, but give you an overall idea of what the status of pharmaceutical 3D printing is. And for that, I picked out the, well, the most mentioned or some of the most mentioned promises of pharmaceutical 3D printing. And I will go through them in the next well, 20, 25 minutes, maybe. And here you see individualization, clinical supply, decentralized manufacturing. And I will break it down to the more, probably more process related parts down here. And then the general expectations for the technologies for the translation into clinical practice. But you have to keep in mind that all of those points are heavily interconnected. So you cannot have individualization or clinical supply without a process and product development, of course. But to start off with individualization, I think it's not a question to, to discuss here that, of course, um, additive manufacturing through deep printing offers fascinating opportunities for individualization. So here I just uh, show a few examples of changing the dose easily, creating um, 
fix those combinations or also flex those combinations to improve adherence using completely different technologies here for transdermal needles with two photon polymerization. So there is there are hundreds of thousands of publications highlighting the potential for individualization. So this is not an issue that needs to be discussed. This is definitely one of the key benefits that 3D printing offers due to its inherent nature of the layer by layer manufacturing principle. So we have the complete design freedom for pharmaceutical manufacturing for the first time ever. And this enables us to manufacture wonderful dosage forms with wonderful properties that were unheard of before. Somewhat different is the discussion about the clinical supply and the point of care manufacturing. So Merck, the company is heavily investing into the manufacturing of clinical supply um, in a GMP environment. And this is a very smart way to implement 3D printing and additive manufacturing into real life applications. Um, William Sheng from Johnson & Johnson said that, well, in a GMP setting, additive manufacturing, if you're doing a larger batch process, it's just another manufacturing technology. You, you will get different questions from the regulatory authorities, definitely. But if you do not do individualization, it's a different manufacturing technique. In this case, you can have batch release testing, you have um, the quality assurance in the end, you have in-process controls. So there are few differences to traditional manufacturing technologies. However, if you start with individualization on an industrial level, there will be countless of questions from the regulatory authorities. And I cannot answer them. Where this is much easier, of course, is in a decentralized setting, point of care manufacturing of dosage forms. Where, well, if you fill out a prescription, this is done in pharmacies every day, all around the world, millions of times. And there you can use technical approaches to improve the manufacturing process of those rock substances. And this is very easy to implement. On the other hand, you don't have a quality control implemented in, pharmaceutics, uh, in pharmacies usually. So you have a visual assessment of your cream has bubbles or not, if it has the same, uh, the, the correct color. So for an individualization to take place on a large scale, um, it will be necessary to implement and to develop in the first step um, process analytical technologies, implement them and create control systems, just as Johannes talked about uh, for the continuous manufacturing. Also in hospital, in, in hospital pharmacies, pharmacies, small compounding centers, you will not be able to use all pharmaceutical 3D printing technologies. So here you have to have a look at the protection of the operator in a different degree compared to a GMP environment. So you will be stuck most likely with fused deposition modeling, semi-solid microextrusion, all of those techniques that are not relying on powders. If you have powders, you're operating with selective laser sintering, binder jetting, different 3D printing technologies. You always have the issue of deposition in the room and cross-contamination and contaminating the operator, which is a risk that I'm quite certain most pharmacists, especially local pharmacies and hospitals, will not readily take. Since Johannes was talking about continuous manufacturing before, I thought I'd make a, a small excursus on the potential of continuous additive manufacturing, where there are two companies on the market that could realize this with their proprietary technology. So with the non-proprietary technology, I think it's very difficult to achieve right now. So you need your own developments to really achieve this. And Aprecia, they have this racetrack approach of binder jetting, the powder-based technology with trays um, going around what they call a racetrack. And there they just you know, add new material, print on it, solidify the dosage forms, and then they remove the, race, the, the trace from the racetrack. And this is a process that can be easily made continuous by adding the trace in the same process as to remove it. Very fascinating technology, but I think for me as a, as a person who works lots, uh, uh, most of the time with hot melt extrusion, the trias tech approach is even more interesting. So what trias tech is doing, this is a, a Chinese uh, US company, they are 3D printing directly from the hot melt extruder. And they have a, the, the line with four hot melt extruders standing there and they are feeding 
per extruder into eight different nozzles by now. They can prepare several thousands of dosage forms per hour. And since they print on individual, uh, let's call them trays here, they are also easily um, capable to, to scale it up in a continuous way. It's hot melt extrusion is inherently a continuous process. And then it will be easy to just keep feeding the powder and removing the tablets from the trays and just keep printing. So also a very, very nice approach, feasible. It has been demonstrated already. And there we have uh, the technical uh, readiness level, the TRL of 10. So this is something that is in the market. They have the in approval from the FDA and they are planning to market this drug substance next year or latest, the year, uh, the year after. With a little bit of tinkering, it would also be possible to realize that for FDM, so there are in the hobbyist market, but also in the um, industrial 3D printers, there are systems that can feed different filaments into the same print head. So you could print continuously. You can combine this with a belt approach. There are printers where you print onto a conveyor belt, and then you could also manufacture continuously, which is a very slow process in this case, and you will only get a certain throughput by parallelization. But the opportunity exists, at least I wanted to mention, but here a lot of research would be necessary to make that pharma ready. So to well, basically summarize the first three points, I would say, yeah, the potential for individualization is magnificent for clinical supply. It's definitely a welcome reality, whereas for decentralized point of care manufacturing, there is still much more work necessary to bring it into a decentralized setting, which is necessary for well, widespread individualization. I don't think that a, um, a centralized setting is capable of manufacturing dosage forms for tens of thousands of people every day uh, on an individualized manner. This will be much harder. So decentralization is a prerequisite, in my opinion, for the individualization, especially if you go into a larger scale. Yeah, this is a graph uh, from 2015 from uh, a publication in Nature called Time for One Person Trials. And this is the number needed to treat for the 10 highest grossing drugs in uh, 2010. Looks quite different now, the, the constitution of this list, but you see that the number needed to treat ranges from four to 25, which means that we have to treat four or 25 person to have one clinically relevant improvement during the therapy. And why is that? Of course, because we have a limited knowledge of what is going on in the body. So uh, Duve Brimer was talking about systems biology yesterday, systems pharmacology, and our understanding is still very poor in this regard. And we don't always take into account the age, gender, metabolome, proteome, comorbidity. So we are breaking down the complexity of the human body to simple conditions and they just don't reflect reality. And the problem with this year is that those 24 people that do not have the clinical outcome, they can have adverse drug reactions that are unwanted without having any benefit of the drug substance. There was a nice meta-analysis performed in 2018 in the US and the EU, and they found that well, around 40% of all reported adverse drug reactions were preventable. And this is a massive cost point. So of course it's a healthcare issue. So this is our adverse drug reactions that are unnecessary and harming the people. But then it's also an economic point that could be remedied. So you see the differences in the outpatient and inpatient settings. So people having those adverse drug reactions at home or in the hospital. In the cheapest case on average, it was just 170 euros for the visit of an emergency doctor up to 8,500 euros for the average hospitalization duration in another study. And if you're inpatient, well, you prolong the stay in the hospital and the costs ranges from around 3,000 to 9,000 euros. And I couldn't find more recent numbers, unfortunately, but in the US, the cost of adverse drug reactions was estimated to be around 30 billion US dollars. And in 2012 in Germany, it was fortunately much less, but also 1 billion US dollars. So we're talking about a massive economic burden on the healthcare system that we could prevent. And this is something where additive manufacturing could help tremendously. Well, 
the most important improvement would not be additive manufacturing, to be honest. It would be to improve the therapeutic understanding, to understand systems pharmacology, to get better diagnostics and improve the pharmacological knowledge. So this would be the, the, the prerequisite for the implementation of individualization. But once this is established, we have the technologies to really implement individualization on a widespread field. Additive manufacturing can pick up this demand and we are able to supply with this if the technology becomes ready within this time. A big point that was also mentioned yesterday is that it's necessary to improve the compliance. So all of you know the statistics that especially for chronic diseases, the um, rate of compliance ranges from between 45 to 70 percent. This is a large driver for adverse drug reactions and poor therapeutic outcome. And how can 3D printing improve that? Well, we can have a targeted drug release. We can modify the drug release to the demand of the individual patient. We can implement flex dose combinations to reduce the pill burden and thereby increase adherence. And we, in a different way, can increase the appeal of the dosage forms. Of course, we can change the size, the shape, or the color to a certain degree. Not everything that you can print can be swallowed. But there is the opportunity to do that and further improve um, the acceptance of drug substances. The big point from uh, Catherine Tulo yesterday, the palatability is a different issue. So this is something where research is going on, but where it hasn't been proven too much or that additive manufacturing will have a benefit over traditional manufacturing techniques. So I think that for the reduction of advanced, uh, of a reduction of adverse drug reactions, um, the individualization approach will have a great benefit for the um, healthcare economics. So to start more with the process related points. Well, it's always said that you have a simplified process and product development. And what is meant by that? Well, it's, it's very easy and also very true. You have one formulation, you develop one formulation, you develop one process, and then the rest of the complete dosage form is designed digitally, and this can be uh, modified easily. So you can have uh, one nice working filament with the robust uh, properties, a good working 3D printing process. You change the size, you change the shape, and by that you change the drugs, uh, the drug dissolution rate, you change the dose, and this is something that was unheard of before. So we have a complete design freedom. And this is just what Apresha Pharmaceuticals is doing with their Spritram, the only FDA approved drug substance. It's always the same powder mixture. It's always the same uh, liquid binder that they inkjet. It's just the digital file that is changed from, for the dose variations. And this is a benefit that well, wasn't possible before. If you want to have uh, larger tablets, you needed to make uh, a different development process. You needed to develop the process again. And this is something that can be uh, significantly reduced, similar to what is possible with continuous manufacturing, where you use the same equipment for the large scale, for the small scale and the large scale manufacturing. So yes, definitely a big bonus point. And then there is one point that I will spend most of my time of, it's the ease of use, because this is what everyone is imagining when you talk about pharmaceutical 2D printing, especially in a decentralized setting. So what we are imagining is a push button approach. You will get a prescription, which defines the, the API, defines the dose, it defines the release properties, and you put that into a computer system, you have a smart algorithm behind there, then you push the button, you leave the room, and an hour or two hours later, the dosage forms are printed. And this is a very nice dream. And unfortunately, from my experience, I've worked with three of the large of the main four 3D printing technologies. We are very far away from this because for this to implement a push button approach, we need a very high process reliability. And I don't know who in the auditorium or online is working with fused deposition modeling or binder jetting or any other technology. But I'm very certain that you are, your experiences are that the printing processes are not easy to run. So they are not really robust with the um, off-the-shelf printers that we use, the pharmaceutical materials, the properties of the polymers, the flowability of the, the powder, the spreadability, an issue that 
is not what that, that hasn't existed before coming to powder based 3D printing technologies. All of this impedes robust processing. And to realize an ease of use manufacturing, we need to develop uh, different materials, new materials that are more suitable for pharmaceutical 3D printing. We need to implement quality control mechanisms. So for fused deposition modeling or semi-solid micro extrusion, we need inbuilt or in balances that are incorporated directly into the machines. We need a, a graphical observation of the dimensional accuracy. And what we need most is the control of the of content, like the amount of drug that you really printed. So we can modify the print job on the fly to make sure that the patient gets the dose that he or she requires. And what we have instead of those, they are not really in development right now, but what we have are um, algorithms with a 100 detection rate for failures, which is also very nice. But if you have a very slow running process, this just means you produce waste, you throw it away, and this is uh, very far from economic for such a slow process. Another point to discuss is the dose adaption. So I've uh, on the slide on individualization, I showed you that it's very easy to scale the dosage from dimensions and change the dose. Fascinating approach, very simple, very powerful, unless you have a controlled release or a sustained release dosage form. So then if you change or scale the dosage form, you change the release profile significantly. So in this case, we tripled the, the dose, which is clinically relevant. And we doubled the time when 75% of the API are released. Try to implement that in a hospital setting. This will be impossible. So it's not it, the, the hospitals are understaffed. They cannot walk around and tell every individual patient, okay, you need to uh, take your dosage from the next dose in three hours, you in five hours, you in six, and I will check up on you. So this is impossible. So this is a very nice promise, but it's not the reality. It's possible, so we developed an approach in uh, my lab and my working group, we were able to um, increase the dose by the factor of more than six, and the release profiles are very much similar. So according to the similarity factor, they are the same. All of us know that the similarity factor is not the best measure, but even though there is still some variation left, there is much less clinical relevance in those release profiles. And this is something where you have to think the promises through to the end, until it's possible to really adapt them in real life applications. Then I briefly mentioned other issues that we have that prevent easy, uh, the ease of use of 3D printing technologies. Of course, here I mentioned the properties of polymers for fused deposition modeling. They can be very soft, um, as is shown here on the left side, or very brittle, as is shown here on the right side. And this is true for most of pharmaceutical polymers. There are a few combinations that work well and more reliable, but none of them work as reliable as the commercially available filaments that you can buy. And the same is true for binder jetting processes. So flowability is a key issue for many pharmaceutical products, but here we have an issue of spreadability. So here we need tailored particle size distributions. So we don't need a narrow particle size distribution. We need likely bimodal particle size distribution to achieve a good spreadability and a high packing density. So a completely different approach to particle engineering is necessary in this case. Another problem that is well, well researched or it's beginning to get researched more and more is like the manufacturing of the intermediates. So fused deposition modeling has the, the, the appeal for a decentralized manufacturing that you require intermediates and those intermediates need to be required industrially because I don't think that any hospital pharmacy will buy a, a hot melt extruder and start to operate that. So this is very, very unlikely. But then you need to be able to operate a, a pharmaceutical twin screw extruder in a way that the diameter homogeneity is very good. Because what we see here is if you change the process setting, so here we only change the, the screw speed with the same um, powder flow rate, and we see that the di uh, deviations of the part of the diameter homogeneity of the diameter increase a lot. 
And here we see a commercial filament manufactured on a single screw extruder, hardly any pressure va um, variations, so a very stable process. Pharmaceutically, we require the twin screw extruders in most cases. And then we run into completely different issues. And the problem is that if you see those kind of deviations in the diameter, they are directly reflected in the mass homogeneity of dosage forms. So this is the coefficient of variation of the mass. And you see that in the best case, those very homogeneous filaments from a lab, or at least the most homogeneous ones we were able to manufacture, we have um, a coefficient of variation of the mass of 3.5%. And then you add on that the variation of the content distribution, and then you really get into some problems if you want to get well, um, pharmacopoeal dosage forms. And another issue where significant work is unfortunately also necessary is the combination of software and hardware. So what we see here is our, our fused deposition modeling uh, objects and they were sliced with a commercial slicer. So those, this is the software that is generating the machine code. So the, the, the program for the machine of on how to move. And they always do that in the same way, independent of the capabilities of the machine. And what you see here is that the, the tool path was not optimized for the machine. So the machine was supposed to follow a tool path that it just could not realize because of issues with the motors and drivers. So here we need a much better interplay and more focused development of the interface between software and printer to prevent this kind of defects. We rarely do print those fine details. That is true, but still, this is an issue that we will run in in the future. So the technology readiness level, a measure that was briefly mentioned before, is, well, there is still significant development necessary. I think I've showed you that. But I've also showed you that the potential of additive manufacturing in a pharmaceutical setting is also tremendous. So if I needed, or if I had to, to place it on this list, I would say, depending on the technology, we are on a TRL of five and six, which is saying that we have the technology demonstrated in relevant environments, but not in real life applications, at least for what is mostly published. Of course, there are the companies, Prisha, Triastec, Merck, that they are running on a much higher uh, TRL. So they did their own developments, have their proprietary technologies. But to get from here to here, we need to improve our hardware and software. We need to develop PAT tools that enable in a, process, a state of control for the 3D printing processes. And we definitely need better materials that reflect the necessity of the processes. So my conclusion is very simple. So I think pharmaceutical 3D printing is a jack of new, uh, a new jack of all trades. So it can do everything, but the question is if it will do everything in the future. Not all technologies will become relevant. It is currently very difficult to, to define what technologies will be relevant in the future. And there is still lots of work to do, but I'm very hopeful um, for this set of technologies. And I am a, a very optimistic person in general, and I don't want to have wasted my past six years working on a technology that uh, will not be implemented, to be honest. So I'm, I'm rooting for fused deposition modeling. And with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention, the PhD students um, of whom I showed some results, and the funding bodies who funded their work. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. It's uh, open for any questions. And uh, if you have any question uh, online, please uh, use our chat function and we will see it immediately and we can ask you and transfer the question to you. Uh, okay, but there was one question here in the yes. audience. Julian, please. thank you very much. We could feel you're passionate in this field. And I trust you will be successful at the end. I have two questions, one general one and then one specific, which has some relation to the general question. I am aware that there is a product in the, in the US approved by the FDA. I am curious to, to know, I don't know if you have this information about the regulatory affairs, pathway would they have used during submission 
regarding the submission batches, process validation, and so on. Do you know this? I talked to J.U., um, the CTO of Apresha, about this issue. That was three or four years ago, and I have to admit that I don't really remember. So they, they spoke very highly of their cooperation with the FDA. They were very open to discuss any issues, and they were um, very open to, towards the presented solutions and accepted them in the end, but I don't remember the pathway, but this information is publicly available. Okay, no issue, thank you. So the other question is, in your presentation, you were able to um, get the same dissolution profile for the different doses. I'm curious to know what you have changed. Is the composition different for the, each individual dose or do you have the same composition? So I, I was uh, very brief in the whole presentation for many points. I could have mentioned many more, and I would have explained that in uh, greater detail. So no, it doesn't make sense to just change the formulation. So it's necessary, if you want to implement it at any time in the future, just changing the formulation, uh, develop a new process, develop a new formulation, it just doesn't make any sense to get it anywhere. So what we did is that we um, modified this uh, surface area to volume ratio of the dosage forms. So you can use the Pepper-Salin equation to model the solution profiles very accurately uh, based on the surface area to volume ratio. So you create a dosage form with a somewhat different shape and this results in the same dissolution profile. And this is a very straightforward, very simple, but very powerful approach to, to realize something like this. Okay, thank you. I think there's one question. From it's here. not really a question, it's just a remark. When I saw the program um, before, I thought this will be difficult to put continuous manufacturing and uh, personalized uh, medicines and 3D printing into one session. But I see the link now because, and now I'm becoming philosophical, as <laughs> as Johanna said before, uh, I think the link between these two different approaches is actually the point of care manufacturing. So actually we all should work um, on approaches, how to bring the manufacturing to the patient, point of care manufacturing, as you said, maybe manufacturing on a van. So I can imagine that in a container, as Johannes said, um, you could have both. You could have the continuous manufacturing in a container of a van, and you could do the individualized medicine approach by 3D printing too. Yeah. And I think this is the way we have to move. Well, actually, that's something what we do in oncology. Yeah. Yes, because exactly. Individualizing cell, dosing cell for therapies. each of the patients. And if this can be reached in oncology, why not to do this in yes. cardiovascular diseases and other diseases? It's just a question where you can add this capability for manufacturing in the hospital. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and to be that's flexible. It. And uh, the disruption will be probably that you drive the manufacturing unit to the patient and not vice versa. So, But the question is, this is a, a business case for huge pharma companies? It should. It, it sure. should be, yeah. It could, or it could be, yeah. <laughs> I had the same worry about not being certain how to fit into continuous manufacturing and then listening to Johannes' talk. It, was, it became very clear and that there were so many talking points that I could have picked up just continued on talking just from a completely different perspective. So it's, they are more connected than I expected before. Okay. Opening. I think one question more, then we will go on with the coffee. Hey, Julian, break. super cool talk. Uh, a question from my side, uh, implants, long acting implants, is this something for your application? Yes. So one of my PhD students who's working in industry now and just writing her thesis uh, was working on long acting implants of release profiles ranging up to three months. Mm -hmm. And they're with individualized release profiles at this time point. So this is something that can be done and their fused deposition modeling is in my opinion, the way to go because they have the polymer matrix that you can fine tune and you have the geometry that you can fine tune to really get the release profile that you want. So yes, definitely. A, very good opportunity. Okay, are there further questions? Do we have any questions online? Not yet, okay. So thanks again for this very nice talk. <laughs>
Hello, dear colleagues, uh, those who are those who are online, uh, we start uh, now uh, the SIPU session uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, those who are online to be really uh, a little bit more active with the questions. You must, you can uh, write a question or you may also pose the question uh, in oral form, uh, but we are really missing you. And uh, so uh, please uh, ask also questions. Uh, in the CIPUS uh, session, we'll have questions afterwards. And I'm, I have a great pleasure uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Professor Stana Sertic, who will be a chair of this session. Thank you, Stane. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to this CIPU session. Firstly, to explain what does it mean? CIPU session means Central European Exchange Program for University Studies. It is uh, an international uh, program that includes 16 uh, countries from Central, Eastern, and South Europe. And the first speaker is actually Professor Jelena Paracic. She is coming from Belgrade University, from the Faculty of Pharmacy, and she is a coordinator of one pharmaceutical network with the name CECA. It means uh, CECA Network Farm Tech, and she will present what is actually CIPUS and what is the aim and goal of such a network? Uh, not only in the, in the pharmacy, but all disciplines that are on different universities in this uh, 16 countries. So please, I'm asking the first. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all at the beginning of this session, which is dedicated to present latest research, including the results of a number of collaborative projects, which are generated within the network of university departments, entitled European Knowledge Alliance for Teaching, Learning and Research in Pharmaceutical Technology. Our network operates within Central European Exchange Program for University Studies, which provides the framework and also funding for the research and study mobilities of students and teaching staff from the participating institutions. The network was established in the academic year 2017-2018 and has steadily grown up to include at present 13 partner institutions from 10 CIPUS countries. On this slide, you can see the list of our participating universities and respective contact persons. CIPUS program involves a large academic community with 1,600 participating institutions and 86 networks approved for funding this year. So we are proud to acknowledge that our network has been ranked as 15th among them. The objectives of our network are threefold and focused firstly on the enhancement of teaching and learning in pharmaceutical technology through increased inter-university interaction, students and teachers' mobility, exchange of good practices, review and innovation of educational contents, as well as teaching, learning and assessment methodologies, and also development of the joint study program objective is related to enhanced research activities through increased availability of research facilities, joint student supervision, joint MFAM and PhD thesis committees, joint scientific publications and organization of joint scientific meetings. The third objective is related to the enhancement 
of university industry collaboration through networking, through contribution of experts from pharmaceutical industry to our educational events, and also through site visits to pharmaceutical industry. So far, main network outcomes include a total of 79 student and teachers mobilities completed, seven joint PhD or MFAM thesis committees appointed, and also a number of collaborative scientific papers published. Also organized five joint educational events of which three intensive PhD seminars, which were hosted by the University of Graz, Medical University of Dansk, and University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Karol Davila in Bucharest, and also two summer schools, which were hosted by the University of Ljubljana in 2018 and University of Belgrade in 2019. These events provided excellent opportunity for learning with each other and from each other, sharing our expertise and experience in different formal and also less formal environments. And these are some of the experiences as expressed by students who took part in network mobilities. annual symposium of young researchers which is traditionally hosted by the institute of pharmaceutical technology and regulatory affairs of the university of Szeged, represents also the arena for academic staff and phd students from our network and beyond to present and discuss the ongoing projects and results of data. and for many years Network activities have been in many ways closely related to the Central European Symposium on Pharmaceutical Technology, and I would like to use this opportunity to sincerely thank Professor Schnitowska, President of the current Symposium, for the idea, initiative, and this great opportunity to present the results of research work performed within the network in a dedicated conference session. I would also like to use this opportunity to remind you that the deadline for CEPUS mobility applications is October 31st and invite you to use this opportunity. There are 27 student mobilities and 12 teacher mobilities available within the network and we should really get proper use of it. If interested, you can find more information on the CEPUS program website as well as from the national CEPUS offices. Please also timely contact the respective contact person in your department and the department you are interested to visit. We are all at your disposal and will provide additional information and support necessary for your application. Finally, as I'm looking forward to giving the floor to our young colleagues who will be presenting their research work in this session, I wish you all successful conference, many new ideas, many inspiration for your future work. I send many, many greetings from Belgrade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Paracic, for this presentation of CEPUS Network. And as she announced, now we will start with the lectures. We will have three lectures, firstly, and then also four video posters. For lectures, we have 15 minutes. The first lecture is in person. And I will suggest that we will put the colleagues immediately after the presentation, the question, but all other questions are welcome to this uh, question answer session after this uh, whole session. It is between 11.30 and 11.45. So now I would like to announce the 
next speaker, next presenter. This is the presentation of the research work coming from Hungary, from two faculties, Faculty of Pharmacy in uh, Seget and Faculty of Pharmacy in Debrecen. The authors are Christian Pamlini, Katalin Christo, Daniel Nemes, Ildiko Bacca, and Geza Regdon. And the title of this presentation is Investigation of Stability and Permeability of Buckle Films Based on the Sodium Alginate. Please, colleague. Thank you for the introduction. I am Christian Pamlini. I come from University of Seget, Hungary. In my presentation, I will talk about investigation, stability and permeability of buccal films based on sodium alginate. Uh, nowadays, classic uh, drug discovery uh, is in general. It has a uh, lower priority in the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, alternative drug administration route and innovative uh, opportunities uh, are coming to the fore. So uh, the buccal uh, mucosa is an innovative and alternative administration route uh, we can apply. Uh, in this figure, we can see uh, the anatomical structure of the mouse. Uh, in this area of the mouse, uh, we can find uh, the buccal mucosa. Uh, during the application, uh, the chain of the polymer films uh, can evolve bind to the uh, mucin of buccal mucosa. After the binding, uh, the API can absorption to the systemic circulation. Uh, the buccal drug delivery system has many advantages, uh, such as uh, it has no first pass effect of liver. Uh, we are able to apply less doses of API. Systemic and local effect is also available. We can protect the stromac from the API uh, and the API from the gastric acid. It can be applied uh, in case of swallowing problems. Uh, it, it is uh, painless. It can be used in pediatrics and geriatrics, and uh, it is easy to applicate. Uh, on this figure, we can see original uh, buccal uh, polymer film product. Uh, aim of our work is formulating buccal mucosa films uh, with sodium alginate, investigating the different amount of uh, sodium alginate in the polymer films, evaluating the stability of the prepared films, uh, examining the permeability of the films on artificial membrane and on TR146 uh, buccal cell line, and finally, we would like to find the optimal composition to apply on buccal mucosa. Uh, to prepare the polymer film, sodium alginate and HPMC uh, was used as fill forming agent. Glycerol was added as plasticizer, citric acid uh, as the permeation enhancer. Uh, Cetirizine dehydrochloride was uh, the API, and distilled water was used as a solvent. The polymer films were prepared at room temperature by solvent casting methods. In this table, uh, we can see uh, the different composition of the prepared films. Uh, we prepared 3% uh, uh, polymer concentration films uh, because uh, in our uh, earlier research uh, work, uh, we can find uh, this, uh, the three uh, uh, concentration films uh, has uh, appropriate uh, properties. So uh, we uh, prepared films uh, without uh, HPMC, just uh, sodium alginate, equal amount of the two polymer and two uh, and one uh, ratio of the uh, two polymer. The glycerol uh, was used uh, in uh, one percent uh, and uh, three percent concentration. Uh, every films contained cetirizine dehydrochloride, and uh, every second films contained uh, citric acid. Uh, we investigate the stability of the prepared films. Uh, we measure the tensile strength and in vitro mucosity of test uh, as uh, the uh, physical uh, properties of the films. FTIR and thermological measurements uh, was investigated uh, as the uh, chemical uh, interaction uh, measurement. And uh, we uh, check uh, the uh, amount of API. Uh, during the stability test with this solution test. Uh, we also uh, measure uh, the permeability of the API on the artificial uh, membrane and uh, on buccal cell line. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to show the results of the stability test. Uh, first of all, uh, I will show uh, the uh, results of the tensile strength. Uh, 
uh, it can be seen that uh, all uh, composition uh, in all composition uh, the tensile strength uh, was uh, decreased during the uh, measurement. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the polymer films which contained uh, citric acid, uh, the radius of the tensile strength was uh, higher than without uh, than without uh, citric acid. Uh, in the beginning of the investigation, uh, the changes are uh, higher. Later, between the three and six months, uh, the uh, changes are uh, very very uh, low. Uh, in this figure, we can see the mucoatasivity of the prepared films. Uh, it can be seen that uh, the uh, mucoatasivity of, of the prepared films can uh, increase uh, during the uh, stability test. Uh, the citric acid and glycerol uh, isn't influence uh, the, uh, the mucoatasivity uh, of the films. Uh, but uh, the films which uh, not containing uh, citric uh, uh, HPMC, uh, the uh, increase uh, of the mucoatasivity uh, was uh, higher than uh, without uh, HPMC. Uh, it is a positive fact because uh, uh, because uh, during the application, uh, the uh, chain of the polymer films uh, can uh, evolve bind to the mucinal bacama cosa. Uh, stronger. Uh, in this uh, slide, we can see the dissolution uh, test uh, of the prepared films. Uh, I have marked uh, with different color uh, the different time of the investigation. Uh, uh, it is normal uh, that uh, the uh, API concentration is decreased uh, during the uh, six months period. Uh, the films uh, which contained uh, citric acid, uh, the decrease of the uh, API concentration is higher uh, than without uh, than without uh, citric acid, and uh, in case of the uh, lower uh, glycerol uh, concentration films, uh, the uh, uh, the change of the uh, API concentration is uh, lower, uh, so the high uh, glycerol concentration can uh, cause uh, the composition uh, of the uh, API. Uh, I have marked uh, the uh, composition uh, which can uh, which can preserve uh, more than 85% uh, of uh, API during the investigation. Uh, the first uh, and the fifth sample uh, can preserve uh, the uh, needed API after uh, six months. The fifth, uh, the sixth, uh, and the ninth, and the tenth uh, sample. Uh, can preserve uh, the needed API after uh, three months. Uh, I would like to uh, show uh, the higher uh, API concentration films uh, of uh, the solution curves. Uh, this is the uh, best formulation uh, uh, in, ca uh, in case of uh, the dissolution test. Uh, in this figure, uh, we can see uh, the results of the FTIR spectra. Uh, we uh, also investigated uh, the chemical uh, properties of the uh, films. On the overall picture, we can see uh, the first uh, polymer sample. Uh, this uh, uh, composition uh, has uh, the highest uh, API concentration. On the bottom picture, we can see the uh, ACE uh, polymer concentration, ACE uh, polymer samples. Uh, this composition uh, has the lowest uh, API uh, concentration. Uh, as we can see, uh, the uh, carboxylic group of cetirizine, it can be found uh, in this point. Uh, in the polymer films, uh, in the first cases, uh, this uh, peak uh, can uh, shift it to the higher wave number. Uh, in, in case of the uh, bottom picture, uh, sorry. Uh, this peak uh, can dis uh, totally disappear after uh, six months. So uh, it means uh, the uh, concentration of API can uh, decrease. Uh, in this picture, we can see uh, the results of the uh, permeation test. Mm. It can be said uh, most of the composition, uh, more than 40% of API can uh, permeate to the uh, acceptor uh, compartment. Uh, 
if uh, in first checking uh, this is uh, uh, low uh, result but uh, if uh, we have to calculate uh, with the fact that uh, the, uh, in case of the buccal drug delivery system all amount of api uh, can uh, affect uh, uh, can affect uh, in the uh, systemic circulation so uh, our uh, results uh, is uh, our results is uh, good uh, in this figure, we can see uh, the uh, permeability uh, study on uh, the buccal cell line. Uh, in the first figure, uh, we can see in vitro pairs of the, the uh, prepared film without HPMC. On the second uh, picture, we can see uh, the permeation curves of uh, equal amount of uh, sodium arginate and HPMC. And on the uh, third figure, we can see uh, in vitro uh, permeation curves of uh, two and one ratio sodium arginate and HPMC. As we can see, uh, the uh, polymer uh, films which, which contain uh, citric acid, uh, it has the uh, highest uh, permeation rate uh, uh, in, the, uh, two in the two cases. But uh, the polymer films uh, which contain uh, lower uh, glycerol concentration, uh, it has uh, also high permeation rate. And uh, uh, if we summarize the, our results, uh, these films uh, has uh, appropriate and uh, uh, promising formulation. So, uh, as a conclusion, uh, one person glycerol containing films had adequate stability. Uh, higher glycerol concentration decreases the stability of the films. Uh, citric acid uh, can also reduce the stability of the films, especially the sensor strength and the dissolve rate of uh, the API. Uh, citric acid uh, can enhance uh, the permeation on the uh, TR-136 uh, cell line, but the lower concentration, uh, literal concentration of films has also high permeation rate. And the sample one and the sample five uh, has optimal uh, stability and per permeation properties. Uh, this is the first, uh, this is the uh, two uh, polymer, uh, polymer uh, composition. And... Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, for the help to my supervisors, uh, to the assistance of our research group, to the Extractum Pharma ZRT uh, to provide me uh, the cetris in dehydrochloride, to the Richter Gedon Talentum Foundation to uh, support me in participating in PhD program. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, thank you uh, for you. Thank you very much for this presentation and as I said you have opportunity to put a question to the colleague. Oh Professor Lok. Right. Right. So what is the effect or the benefit of the sodium alginate in your formulation? Because obviously there's an decreased stability when applying pH modifiers like citric acid and so on. Alginate is also an acid. And the HPMC would also give a film, a buccal film, right? Yes, yes. So why why to add sodium alginate? Sodium alginate uh, can uh, can increase uh, the mucoatesivity uh, of the films, uh, and uh, mm, uh, it can it can uh, a little bit uh, enhance uh, the uh, dissolution uh, dissolution speed uh, of the API in in our formulations. next yes the question coming from yes chat. we do have Session. four questions from yes, the only please. online audience uh, may i start with the first one uh, uh, um, what was the hpmc type used in terms of viscosity and what was the production process applied to produce buckle films uh repeat Did please you? Uh, what was the HPMC type that you used in your research? What was its viscosity? Viscosity was uh, uh, 8,000 uh, Pascal. Right, and the second part was, uh, what was the production process? How did you obtain your, uh, or your buckle films? How did you form them? Yes, uh, firstly, uh, uh, we make uh, the uh, polymer uh, solution uh, with sodium alginate. Uh, 
and uh, after that uh, we uh, added uh, the um, API, and after that uh, we uh, added uh, to the Polymer solution uh, the HPMC, and after that uh, in the second day uh, we added uh, the plasticizer, the glycerol, and after that uh, we uh, we uh, blowing uh, in uh, petri dishes, and after that uh, the um, solvent uh, can evaporate. It was like a casting and evaporating method. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, the question is about the swelling properties uh, in buccal cavity. Have you uh, managed to explore that? Repeat, please. I don't uh, understand. The swelling properties of the films that you yes. tested. Have you evaluated it? No, no. Uh, we, we haven't investigated it. Uh, okay, the next question is uh, also very easy. Uh, what kind of artificial membrane that was used for the permeation studies that uh, you presented? That was a tape membrane. All right. And um, yeah, the next one is also about the permeation, about the membrane. And the last question uh, is what was the thickness of the films that you've obtained? Uh, it was uh, uh, different. Uh, it was uh, 150 uh, micrometer to uh, 340 micrometer. Thank you very much. Everyone says thank you for your answers on the chat as well. Thank you, thank you. very much. The one question. Now I will announce the next speaker. It is the recorded presentation and it is coming from from Graz University, Department for Pharmaceutical Technology and Biopharmacy, Institute for, of Pharmaceutical Sciences. The authors are Ivana Ruseska, Katja Freksacher, Fabio Falsone, and Andreas Zimmer. And the title of this presentation is Tracing the Cellular Uptake of Proticals as Delivery System for MERNA. Please. Hello everyone. I would first like to start by introducing myself. My name is Ivana and I'm currently working on my PhD at the University of Graz as part of the working group of Professor Andreas Zima. Here we are focused on the development of peptide systems, so-called protocols, that can be used as delivery systems for microRNA. My specific field of interest is the cellular uptake of these particles, as well as their cellular trafficking. Today, I am very happy to be a part of the test conference where I can share and present my recent findings to all of you. So with no further ado, I would like to start with my introduction. Nowadays, nucleic acids are becoming more and more popular as drug molecules, as we can all witness with the development of messenger RNA vaccines for immunization against COVID. However, messenger RNAs are just one part of the plethora of RNA molecules that can be used in therapy. Non-coding RNA molecules, such as microRNAs, are a part of this group as well. MicroRNAs are small, negatively charged molecules that can efficiently post post transcriptionally target and silence messenger RNAs in the cytoplasmatic risk complex. They are known to be involved in the regulation of processes such as proliferation and differentiation, thus their dysregulation can be the reason for a variety of diseases. Therefore, microRNA inhibition or replacement therapy is a promising approach. The microRNA of our interest is microRNA27A, which is known to inhibit adipogenesis by downregulating the expression of the PPR gamma gene. However, a great limitation of microRNAs is their low stability since they can be easily degraded by RNases and poor intracellular uptake since they have a negative charge and the cell membranes are also negatively charged, which means that they will repulse the RNA. Thus, the design of a suitable system is of a great need. One up and coming um, approach for the delivery of microRNA is the application of cell penetrating peptides. These peptides are small cationic peptides consisting of less than 30 amino acids. A peptide of this group is protamine, which is a highly basic uh, peptide 
and it is known as the DNA binding protein in the sperm of salmon. Due to its cationic nature, it can easily form stable complexes with the negatively charged, charged microRNA and deliver them inside the cell. However, it is not all smooth sailing from here on. We still have some problems to face. Despite the info we have about the effectiveness of cell penetrating peptides as delivery systems, we have little or no information about their interactions with the cellular membrane, the main path they take for internalization inside the cells and their cellular trafficking, meaning we have um, a small amount of information where they are located when they go inside the cell. How, um, however, another problem that we need to face is the intracellular release of microRNA because these molecules are sometimes very tightly bound to the uh, peptide itself. And this is what um, and it disables them to exert the effect inside the cells. Having this background in mind, the focus of our study was to first and foremost prepare the samples, then investigate their cellular uptake and trafficking using fluorescence imaging. This was followed by quantification of the uptake using a fluorescent plate reader, and last but not least, evaluation of their anti-adipogenic effect in 3T3L1 cells. Using the self-assembly method, complexes between the positively charged protamine and the microRNA are formed by simply mixing aqueous solutions of both compounds in well-defined ratios. Uh, if we would like to decorate our uh, complexes with albumin, we have to pre-mix the protamine and the albumin together and then mix them with the RNA or mix the protamine and the surf protein together and then mix them with the RNA. The resulting protocols have a positive charge and they have a size range from 130 nanometers to 200 nanometers. When it comes to the fluorescent imaging, uh, we tried to take images of living 3T3L1 cells in order to track the first steps of their uptake and see how they traffic inside the cells. For this purpose, we used fluorescently labeled microRNA in three different concentrations, which means that all the concentrations about the protocols are expressed as final concentration of microRNA. After preparation of our protocols, the cells were transfected, incubated for certain amounts of time, and then they were uh, observed under the fluorescence microscope. When it comes to cellular trafficking, um, and its tracking, the nanoparticles were first combined with a lysosomal marker called lysotracker green. This marker is supposed to uh, mark all the lysosomes inside the cells and help us um, see if the particles co-localize with the lysosomes or not. In the first slide with fluorescent images, we can see pictures taken of 3 to 3 uh, L1 cells transfected with protocols. The first image was taken 30 minutes after transfection. Here we can see that the protocols are more or less um, localized around the nucleus of the cells, as this is where we get the highest fluorescent signal from. And we can see that they are moving inside the nucleus. This is not surprising, having in mind that protamine is a protein that binds DNA. So logically, it would like to go in the nucleus. Plus, in the structure of protamine, we have a lot of arginine molecules, which work as nuclear localization signals, and they basically force the protamine to go inside the nuclear region. Two hours after transfection, we can see that most of the fluorescent signal is now diffusely spread inside the cell cytoplasm, but it is also localized in the cell nucleoli. This is explained well, with the fact that nucleoli are also centers for trafficking of RNA. So maybe the RNA we have inside our particles is also giving some signals that take the particles inside the nucleoli. And last but not least, at the image taken 24 hours after transfection, we can see that there is almost no signal coming from the nucleus, but most of it is localized around the nucleus and in the cytosol as small dots and not as the few signal which we see here in the cells uh, taken at two hours after transfection. On the second slide, we can see fluorescent images taken of cells treated with albumin protocols. 30 
um, in a after transfection, we can see that we don't have that strong signal coming from the nucleus, but most of the particles are distributed around the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. This situation is not changing much two hours after transfection, because here we can also see a signal coming from around the nucleus and spread across the cell cytosol, but not inside the nucleus. 24 hours after transfection, we can clearly see the same picture which we uh, saw with the protocols. All the particles show dot-like signals coming from around the nucleus and spread across the cell cytosol. The third slide shows us images of cells treated with SERF protocols. In this case, we can see that 30 minutes after transfection, um, the protocols are distributed inside the cells and in the cytoplasm as well, but the cells look really distressed. Two hours after transfection, we see distribution in the cell cytoplasm as well as in the nucleus. And 24 hours after transfection, we still have the same distribution, although in this case, the cells look more healthy and they look um, the signal looks more diffusely spread across the cell. Um, this is also not surprising, having in mind that SERF is an unstructured protein. It has um, an amphiphatic structure, and it is known to organize DNA inside the nucleus. However, due to its amphiphatic uh, structure and the presence of lysine in its structure, it can cause some stress to the cell membrane. This is why we have the stressed cells here. However, this is in no way toxic, as we can see that 24 hours after transfection, the cells are looking good again. In this uh, slide, we have images of cells being treated with the lysotracker green, which is supposed to mark all the lysosomes in the cells, and treated with protocols, albumin protocols, and surf protocols accordingly. What we can observe is that we have our dot-like signals coming from the particles, but they do not really correlate or co-localize with the um, lysosomes which are around them. This also happens with the albumin particles. We have signal, tiny dots coming from our particles, and then we have a huge signal coming from the lysosomes, but the particles are not overlapping with them. And when it comes to the surf particles, we can see already agglomerates forming of the particles. This is also happening because of hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions from the surf protein itself. It can interact with itself and form small agglomerates. Um, but even the smaller dots, they do not localize or co-localize with the um, lysosomes inside the cells. Next, we did our cellular uptake studies where we tried to quantify the uptake and see what is the effect of concentration on the uptake and how the temperature influences it. So you can see that we have tested three different concentrations of protocols, albumin protocols, and surf protocols. And we can see that as the concentration is increasing, the uptake of the particles is also increasing. Furthermore, we can also um, see um, an influence from the temperature change in the uptake. So all the bars, which are monochromatic, are coming from particles uh, in cells which were exposed to 37 degrees Celsius. So we have the protocols, the gray ones are the albumin protocols, and the white ones are the surf protocols. And then the patterned bars are showing us the uptake of particles and cells which were exposed at four degrees Celsius. So we have protocols again, albumin protocols and surf protocols at three different concentrations. What we can observe is that exposing the cells at four degrees Celsius is decreasing the uptake in um, a high manner, which might tell us that the uptake is temperature dependent. At four degrees Celsius, we basically stop all cell movement, so the membrane is rigid, which means that some fluorescence from the particles might be coming from particles stuck in the cell membrane. The second thing we tried to investigate by doing our cellular uptake studies is the effect of energy. We again used two different concentrations of protocols, albumin protocols, and surf protocols, and uh, added them to cells which were previously treated with sodium azide and 2-deoxide glucose, or cells which were not treated with these inhibitors. Sodium azide and 2-deoxide glucose 
are agents which are known to deplete the cell from its ATP pool, which means that cells who were treated with these agents will not be able to perform any active uptake. Again, the bars, which are monochromatic, are uh, showing us the results from cells that were treated with sodium azide and 2 d glucose, and the bars which have patterns on them show us uh, the results from cells that were not treated with the inhibitors. As we can see at both concentrations, the treatment with the inhibitors results in the lower uptake. This might suggest that part of the uptake of our particles is uh, due to active endocytosis. And last but not least, we can focus a little bit on the efficacy of our three types of protocols. We evaluate the efficacy by measuring the absorbance of the orostain in mature adipocytes uh, that is accumulated in lipid droplets. Um, the more lipid droplets we have in our cells, the more orostain will be accumulated there and the higher the absorbance will be. This will basically show us that our particles were not able to release the microRNA, or if the absorbance is lower, then we can see that these particles were able to release the microRNA. So what we can see from our graphs is that um, with the concentration increase, the effect is also increasing. So the absorbance is getting um, smaller as we have a higher concentration of protocols. And when it comes to comparing the three different formulations, we can see that the surf protocols are at any concentration, more or less the best ones in decreasing the um, lipid droplet formation. From the results obtained regarding the cellular trafficking, we can conclude that the uptake of our protocols occurs very fast, maybe in the first 15 minutes after the transfection. We have seen that the protocols themselves tend to localize mainly in the nucleus, and this is due to the structure of the protamine itself. However, when it comes to the albumin protocols and surf protocols, they show a more even distribution, even in the cytoplasm which is favorable for the effect of microRNA, since microRNA shows its effect in the cytoplasm. This might be one of the reasons why the albumin protocols and surf protocols are better at um, lowering the production of lipid dropl droplets in 3T3L1 cells. When it comes to the uptake, we have seen that the concentration and the temperature do have effect on the uptake. As we increase the concentration, the uptake is getting higher, and the uptake is also higher at the temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. When we decrease the temperature, the uptake is decreasing as well. The ATP pool in the cell also is an influencing factor on the uptake of the particles, and both the energy effect and the temperature effect might suggest that part of the uptake of our particles is done by active endocytosis. However, we cannot exclude direct translocation as well. And when it comes to our efficacy studies, we have seen that there is a difference between the surf protocols, albumin protocols, and the regular protocols. This might be due to the strength with which the microRNA is being held in the protocol itself. So since the protamine is highly positively charged when it is not coupled with a third agent in the particles, it might not be able to release the microRNA as easily. However, when we add a third component to the particles like albumin or surf, they might um, lower these interactions between the protamine and the uh, RNA and help with the release of the RNA inside the cytoplasm. I would like to uh, say a big, big thanks to my group for pharmaceutical nanotechnology and drug targeting at the Department of Pharmaceutical Technology and Biopharmacy especially my supervisor, Professor um, Andreas Sima, for all of his help for this project, and my colleagues, Kati, Fabio, and Hendrik, for all their help. Of course, and everyone else who has ever improved and helped my project. And now I would really like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague from Graz. As I said at the beginning, we will have a question-answer session after this. Uh, 
all presentations. Uh, before going to this poster short presentation, we still have one 15 minutes presentation that is coming from Ljubljana University with the title self -em micro emulsifying drug delivery system high share of adrenulation based on mesoporous carriers for improved carvedilol solubility the authors are Mila Kovacevic she will present it the the the, the, the lecture then Katarina Bolko Selya Kalinka Pubirk and Ilya German Ilic please colleague from Ljubljana dear colleague Greetings from Ljubljana, from Slovenia. My name is Mila Kovacevic, and on behalf of my research group, I will present the results of our recent study with the title SMES High Shear Bed Granulation Based on Metaphorous Carriers for Improved Carverdial Solubility. The research was conducted within our research team at the Department on Pharmaceutical Technology at the Faculty of Pharmacy in the University of Ljubljana. Firstly, um, let me introduce you to the topic that our self micro emulsifying drug delivery systems, or simply SMET, uh, that are lipid based formulations designed to improve the solubility of poorly water soluble drugs. Um, due to high surfactant concentration, they spontaneously self emulsify in the contact um, with water. That means that upon ingestion, the drug is solubilized and incorporated in the micelle, inside the micelle that uh, is formed. Um, as SMET is presented in liquid form, it requires transformation to solid to improve processability and stability of final uh, product. So in this study, we use wet granulation um, technology based on metaphorous carriers and metaphorous carriers are important here due to their high liquid low capacity. That means that they are able to absorb and absorb high um, amount of smith while keeping the characteristic of dry free flowing granules. So here we wanted to incorporate um, as much sweat smith as we can uh, while maintaining uh, these good flow properties um, at the same time. Mm, what we did is that we prepared the granulation dispersion containing a uh, SMET, water, and PVPK25 uh, used as binder. We used uh, six porous carriers, five of them uh, were mesoporous, nilzilin, fujicalin, and the, the three silica based metaphors carriers and the sixth carrier uh, at the sale actually the microcrystalline cellulose was macroporous. The binder concentration was optimized to each uh, carrier to obtain um, granules that are suitable in size to obtain good flow properties and uh, high um, smets content. So we added the granulation dispersion in droplets to, um, until the granules were formed, then we uh, sifted uh, wet granules, we sifted the mass uh, through the seal, and then uh, dry it, dry it in the tray dryer. And further, we characterized the dry granules in terms of particle size and size distribution, flow properties and dissolution properties, as we wanted to see if there's any difference depending on um, carrier type. New granules with nozeline and silane 244 um, were chosen as the most suitable for further uh, wet granulation using high shear granulator. And such uh, granules were, were evaluated in the same, man same manner with the addition of same analysis and self macro emulsifying ability um, as we wanted to see whether the micro. Um, emulsion is formed um, upon dispersion even uh, in uh, solid smets. Finally, from uh, New Zealand and Siloid high shear uh, granules, we made our dispersible tablets um, and analyzed it in, in 
terms of common tablet quality attributes like mechanical characteristics, meaning uh, hardness, friability, disintegration time, um, self the self micro emulsifying ability of SMET tablets, and in vitro uh, release of carvedilol. Carvedilol uh, was used as a fully water soluble model drug belonging to BTS2 group um, and in tablets, the, uh, content, its content in tablets was appropriate to single dose of carvedilol, which is 12.5 milligrams. So what we um, got as a result is that our granules were uh, different in size, uh, D50 value being from 488 to around um, 800 nanometers. Um, all produced granules had high SMET content, which represented 34 to 66 uh, percent of granules mass was actually SMET. Um, Neuzeline and uh, Siloid 244 have the highest oil absorption capacity, and therefore uh, we were able to incorporate the most of SMET uh, into these carriers. Two thirds of granules mass uh, represented uh, SMET. Mm. In comparison to handmade granules, the ones produced uh, in high shear um, granules turn to be more homogeneous in shape, which we will see um, also in um, SEM images. Also, the particles, the granules from high shear granulator were smaller, which is more desirable from an industrial perspective. And the SMET load was something lower as the addition of granulation dispersion was faster. And when the addition of the liquid is faster, there is less time for liquid to penetrate inside the pores. Um, but yeah, what I would also like to point out as an advantage is that uh, for the same time, we were able to process six times more material than in hand granulation with that minimal losses uh, with SMET content. Regarding flow properties, according to the angle of repose and pharmacopoeia criteria, all granules were uh, showed excellent flow properties. Um, according to flow time and car index, we were uh, able to distinguish between um, carrier uh, types. In granules, so um, siloid and pudicaline were in fair grade, while neuzeline and isle of pearl were in passable uh, grade according to uh, pharmacopoeia criteria for car index. Overall, we are satisfied with fair and passable flow properties as we managed to keep high SMET content while having the free flowing granules that are um, suitable for further compaction. So we considered the studies uh, with two mesoporous carriers, siloid and uh, 244 and neuzeline, and um, with high shear uh, granulation, we were able to improve flow properties as now neuzeline is in fair grade, while siloid 244 is still in fair grade, but on the upper limit, the limit with good um, flow properties according to um, pharmacopoeia criteria for CAR index. Um, the improved flow properties um, are, do, are we improved the flow properties due to hard shear forces um, obtained in the granulator, which uh, conse uh, consequently the pore filling of carriers uh, was more even. So um, it resulted in particles that are more homogeneous in shape. Um, also, um, high shear um, granules have smoother surface and uh, more spherical shape than handmade granules, so there is no any sharp edges that would potentially obstruct the flow. Um, additionally, I would like to mention uh, here that um, we can call our granules self-microemulsifying granules, 
as upon dispersion um, in medium, the micro emulsion uh, is formed with the droplet size below 40 nanometers. Mm, with the solution properties, we improve the release and uh, extent of carvedilol. Mm, carvedilol is a fully water soluble drug and uh, in discriminant uh, dissolution media with pH 6.8, uh, its release is very slow and uh, incomplete. So by formulating it as mass, we aim for um, or granules, we uh, were able to fully release carvedilol um, from uh, SMET granules. Also, uh, the release was fast as from silicate 244 granules, 93% uh, of carvedilol was released in first five minutes, while the uh, other 7% was released in the next five minutes. And for neuzeline, this was and for uh, neuzeline, the release was um, something slower as it, um, in the first five minutes, it was 85% uh, of released carvedilol. Um, the rate and extent of carvedilol release were not affected by production of um, granules in high shear granulator with neuzeline. Yes, the profile is comparable to manually produced granules and in case of um, siloids, we believe that due to high shear forces applied, um, that the liquid was pushed deeper into pores, resulting in a slower release from um, high shear made granules. Finally, uh, we produced um, oral or dispersable tablets weighing 845 milligrams. We um, with single dose of carvedilol, and we agree that this mass is overweight. But to achieve adequate tablet mass, the hardness um, around uh, 100 newtons, we were forced to um, reduce share of granules to 25% um, of granules in tablet mass. Within which the solution testing, we showed that. Uh, our tablets follow fast release kinetics. And though uh, the release is something slower um, in comparison to granules, as compression force pushed the liquid deeper into the pores, the, um, at the end of testing period, the um, carvedilol release for tablets is uh, complete. Uh, also, all tablets. Um, Neuzeline and uh, Silly 244 tablet met pharmacopoeia criteria for disintegration time and um, friability, and also preserved self micro emulsifying properties. So, to conclude with this presentation, um, what we did in this research study is that we uh, were able to produce self micro emulsifying granules using that granulation based on metaphors carriers. And we were able to incorporate high amount of SMET into the granules, around 60%. And at the same time, uh, but not to impair uh, flowability as, um, uh, yeah, and, and that enabled um, further compaction in the tablet with adequate mechanical characteristics um, and also we had fast release kinetics with preserved self micro emulsifying properties. Mm, so, thank you very much for your attention. And please, uh, if you have any um, additional questions regarding the topic, please free, um, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague from Ljubljana. As I said, uh, you will stay, you will wait in this question answer session after the poster presentation. Yes, now we have three video posters presentations inside of 15 minutes. It means they have a very short time for presenting, presenting the results. And I will announce the first poster. 
this is uh, Oster with the title Electrospun Nanofibers Production Using Ciprofloxacin as a Model Drug. The presentation is coming from Seget University together with the University in Edinburgh. The authors are Eva Luca Uliar, Norbert Radasci, and Rita Ambrose. Please. Dear audience, my name is Luca Eva Uliar. I come from University of Saget, Hungary. The topic I'd like to introduce is optimization of electrospan nanofiber production using cyprofloxacin as a model drug. Polymer based nanofibers are innovative drug delivery systems mainly produced by electrospinning. The easiest way to form nanofibers is by single needle electrospinning, where fibers are formed through a nozzle. However, it has a low productivity. The solution can be nozzle free equipment where multiple jets are formed simultaneously. Our aim was to produce rapid release nanofibers by single needle electrospinning and then to increase productivity by transporting the method into another free equipment. The fiber size and morphology were optimized. More dispersed, continuous, smooth surface samples were chosen. Structural characterization confirmed the amorphous state of the AVI in the case of both equipment. During the release studies in single medium, rapid API release was achieved from the nanofibers. However, in simulated gastric fluid, this solution followed zero order kinetic. It was also observed that the recrystallization of the cyprofloxacin caused by the pH shift can be avoided by nanofibrosis formulations. The drug distribution within the nanofiber mats was investigated by Raman mapping. By nozzle free method, more homogeneous samples could be made, which is another advantage next to the higher productivity. In summary, by single needle electrospinning, cyprofloxacin loaded nanofibers were successfully prepared. The drug content was increased up to 10%. The drug release was pH dependent. Moreover, by nozzle free method, not only the productivity, but the homogeneity was increased. So it can facilitate industrial production. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, colleague. The next poster is coming from Belgrade with the title Behavior of Paracetamol Loaded Filaments in FDM 3D process using two different types of polyethylene oxide. The authors are Maria Djuranovic, Samicha Obeit. Presented will be by Mariana Majarevic and the uh, author, additional one is Svetlana Ibrich. Please. Behavior, a paracetamol loaded filaments in FDM 3D process using two different types of polyethylene oxide. Infused deposition modeling technology. The filament of the thermoplastic material is melted or softened, then extrude from the printer's jet and a layer by layer deposited to form the 3D object. The aim of this work was to evaluate the behavior of paracetamol loaded filaments using FDM 3D process, variating two polymers with different molecular weights. Compositions of all formulations are shown in table. Paracetamol as an active substance was added gradually until the maximum drug content possible for extrusion was obtained. Mechanical properties of filaments were evaluated using three-point band tests, while obtained parameters were modeled using decision tree as a data mining method. Printlets were printed using Ultimator 3 at the end printer and modified settings of the software that are shown in table. After integrating obtained data for three-point band test in a data mining environment, correlation between maximum displacement, maximum force, and printability was found. It was observed that filaments with a maximum displacement greater than 1.09 millimeters had a tendency to be printable, while filaments with a maximum displacement below this value were not printable. X-ray results reveal that active substance in this formulation exists in amorphous form. Variating PO200 and PO100 as a backbone polymer in FDM 3D printing technology did not make differences in dissolution rates. From 3D paracetamol tablets, more than 90% of drug was released with four to six hours by combination of diffusion and erosion process. 
comparing formulations with Arabic gum and formulations with yellow seer. Differences in this solution were noticed. The fastest paracetamol release was from Quintlet's POC2, POD2, and POC3, where pathophase was reached after four hours, possibly attributed to the presence of Gaussier. LDM technology is suitable for printing paracetamol tablets with drug content up to 60% and with release 90% of drug after four to six hours. Mechanical characteristics have influence on printability with the observation that PO200 in combination with calcium is more suitable for printing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. The next poster with the title Factorial Design Based Liposome Optimizing Applying Physical Modifying Membrane Additives coming from the uh, University Seget, Faculty of Pharmacy, with the authors, Zofia Nemet, Reza Yazani, Dobrina Dopo, and Ildi Kochoka. It will be presented by Sofia Nemet, please. Welcome everybody. We are pleased to present a part of our research work at the University of Seget, Hungary regarding liposomes. Liposomes are described as artificially prepared vesicles composed of concentric phospholipid layers and aqueous compartments. These nanosized spherical blisters are one of the core points of pharmaceutical research. However, some topics still need to be specified in the field. An adequate surface charge is necessary to maintain the stability of vesicles. Samples with minimum plus minus 30 millivolts at a potential are considered stable. The charge of the phospholipid membrane can be modified with different additives. The present study was designed to optimize, investigate, and characterize liposome formulations made with charge imparting agent such as indicetyl phosphate or starylamine. Liposomes were made via Bentham study on a lipid film hydration technique following the settings of a three factor, three level functional factorial experimental design setup. The investigated formulations differed in the phosphatidylcholine cholesterol and membrane additives ratio. The morphology and the zeta potential values of the surface charge optimized formulations were evaluated. For Dermot, the structure of liposomes interactions between the membrane elements and the thermal stability of the samples were investigated. The characterization of the optimized DCP or assay containing milk particles demonstrated that the potential is higher than 30 millivolt in absolute value, indicating stable formulations, vesicles under 150 nanometer and nanopolensity dispersity indexes. The end of the physics of water content desorption was detected at around 100 Celsius degree on the TG curves. The thermal treatment caused a 4 to 6 percent mass loss in two steps at the 300 Celsius degree. The FTR spectra differed based on the type of the used membrane additives. The AFM images of the sample showed homogeneous size distribution and mean vesicle size consistent with the DLS results. We can conclude that the factory are designed with study plans provided experimentally proves that the potential optimized stable liposomal formulations and practical knowledge about the impact of the DCP and the assay ratios on the quality of the liposomes. Thank you for your kind attention. We are open to answer to your question. Thank you very much, colleague from Hungary. The, it was not so clear to, to listen, but nevertheless, I hope that in spite of that, some question will be raised later during the question answer session. And the last poster with the title Applicability of Software Assisted Porosity Evaluation in Liquid Solid Pellets Characterization. This is the joint research coming from Belgrade and Ljubljana and Graz, uh, prepared by the authors Ivana Vasiljevic, Emma Turkovic, Ilya German Ilic, Andreas Zimmer, Jelena Paricic, and Ivana Aleksic. I'm asking on the presentation. Good morning. My name is Ivana Vasiljevic, and I will present part of my research regarding applicability of software-assisted porosity evaluation in liquid solid pellets characterization. Software-assisted image analysis is an emerging approach, but its application in the pharmaceutical field is scarce. The aim of this study was to investigate the applicability of software-assisted porosity evaluation in liquid solid pellets characterization. Liquid solid pellets were prepared based on liquid solid system approach and characterized. 
Samples with highest cross polydome concentration exhibited less structure, while pellets with silicon dioxide were more porous. All pellets exhibited aspect ratio lower than 1.2, which is suitable for processing. Samples with highest cross polydome concentration exhibited highest single pellet crushing force values. Generally, increase in liquid load led to lower single pellet crushing force and wider particle size distribution. The obtained scanning electron micrographies were used for porosity evaluation using license-free software ImageJ. Pellet porosity was calculated automatically by the software based on color contrast and represented as relative pore area on the micrography. High correlation between software-determined pellet porosity and single pellet crushing force values was observed with correlation coefficient of 0.9047. It may be concluded that software-assisted porosity evaluation represents useful screening tool in pharmaceutical research. It provides good correlation with pellet crushing force and it may be used as an indicator of pellets' mechanical properties important for their further processing. Thank you for your kind attention and please do not hesitate to contact me for further information. Thank you to colleague from Belgrade. And as I said at the beginning, now we have this session, questions and answers. And I will firstly ask if there are any questions in the chat. No? Yes, of course. Now we will. Thank you for. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so my, my question is with regard to the last talk. So my question is whether the surface porosity really uh, reflects the internal structure of liquid solids pellets and then hence also the mechanical properties. So you were able, of course, to determine the surface porosity. Thank you. Can we get the comment from the colleague from Belgrade? Yes, hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Thank you. So for this joining was, us. Okay, so this was the pilot study. So we focused on surface porosity, but uh, in the future, yes, uh, we discussed that uh, it would be better to, to investigate the cross sectional porosity of the prepared pellets. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah. It means it is surface porosity or surface roughness. Yes. Appropriate to say surface roughness of the pellets, not porosity. Next question. Can I put the, the question to colleague uh, in Seget with regard to this factorial design based liposome optimization? Somewhere I found with TG and DSC analysis showed no mass change about 250 degrees. What does it mean? Uh, colleagues from Saget. Okay, yes. Can you? Just a moment, please. Thank you. So we investigated the thermal activities until 300 degree, and uh, we haven't find any other structural change or water loss after 200 Celsius degrees. So we uh, the all the changes happened before. It means that uh, they are stable, or there is no. Uh, any loss or change in structure later on for higher temperature. It means the liposome was stable up to 250 degrees? And no, but there's no uh, change later on. Okay. If we... okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, hi, my name is Tomasz Pajczak. I'm representing um, Pol Pharma company. Uh, I do have two questions uh, regarding uh, microRNA and their uptake. Uh, first is, uh, was the microRNA modified somehow um, 
in a backbone. And the second referred um, was this microanalysis research uh, uh, analyzers. They are there st st stable in Eliza? Um, thank you very much. Uh, hello. <laughs> thank you very much for the question. Uh, so if I understood it correctly, the first uh, question was if the RNA was somehow modified. Um, our RNA in this case was not modified at all. Um, and for the second question, can you please repeat it once again? Uh, are these um, RNA stable in analyzers? In lysids, we have not yeah, uh, investigated this. You investigated uh, the fluorescence, yes. and uh, the question is uh, whether you observed the fluorescence from the uh, native mRNA, or uh, you observe some 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 metabolites which um, were fluorescent as well. This is just uh, the RNA itself. It was fluorescently tagged. So we have um, a special tag added to the structure of the RNA. So in best conditions, the tag should still be intact and uh, connected to the microRNA inside the cells. Hopefully there is no leak, uh, leakage happening. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Any other question? Okay, uh, I have actually for three presenters uh, my questions, but maybe I will choose one. Um, maybe uh, the question uh, for Mila Kovacevic, uh, because um, uh, we, for many years, we already observe uh, these attempts uh, to introduce self emulsifying systems to the solid dosage forms. Uh, so could you comment, um, are there any products on the market with uh, intro uh, introducing this technology? And then what in your opinion is the most challenging on industrial scale to produce such uh, delivery systems? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, yes, this uh, technology um, has been applied and there are some uh, products on the market, but not using high shear bed granulation. Um, in our case, the greatest challenge was to obtain granules that have um, good flow properties to obtain further complexion. Uh, um, uh, compaction into final dosage form into tablets. So we managed to do that. And um, so it's definitely a step forward for a final dosage form um, um, as the, mo the tablet as the most common one. Mm -hmm. Is it, um, I, I, is it, did you hear me? The Maybe. Do you know such product? Could you uh, just uh, tell us? Uh, yes, uh, yes. With cyclo cyclosporin, uh, for example, yeah. um, with cyclosporin A as an immunosuppressant was uh, formulated as SMETS. And on and the it is market. As a tablet? Uh, is, it's uh, manufactured as a tablet? No, no, as a, as a tablet, and it's, uh, and we, don't, we still don't have. Yes, yes, that was uh, my guess, but I wanted just to mm -hmm. uh, know more mm -hmm. about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have, mm -hmm. we have one question in chat. Yes, okay. yes, we did have one question uh, in chat, once again regarding the software used for the calculation of the uh, surface uh, of the um, tablet. And uh, uh, the question was whether it can be used to actually calculate the volume. And the author uh, answered on chat that yes, it can be used because for this particular experiment, it was used only on two dimensional images, but the software that were, they were using, uh, it also provides the third dimension that potentially can lead to uh, calculating the, uh, the surface volume as well. And that was all from the chat. But I do have a question from myself. 
uh, for uh, for Luca, uh, the one who optimized the electrospin nanofibers uh, with cyclosporin. Do we have Luca? Oh, you're here, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, so my question is uh, that you've presented a uh, Raman maps of those nanofibers. And uh, what I wondered about, the same images, uh, they shown quite pronounced structure. And on Raman, it seems like the structure is lost. You just had like a pure uh, map of uh, indicating that the substance is everywhere. How could you explain that? Um, thank you for your question. Yes, because the cyperfoxacin is everywhere inside the fibers. So the um, Rama map um, showed only the cyperfoxacin concentration inside the nanofibers um, met. And uh, some images was uh, much um, bigger, uh, I don't know, magnification. So, okay, so, so the map regarded only the fiber itself. No, not one fiber, a mat. Uh, a lot of fibers, not just one fiber. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your question. Uh, so I believe there is one poster without any question yet. So, and I actually even uh, wrote uh, this question before on the, um, uh, on the internet. But uh, regarding this uh, poster uh, by Marianna Madarevich, uh, regarding paracetamol as a model drug substance, um, you introduced uh, this in a concentration up to 60 percent and uh, I can imagine that you treat this as a model substance if we choose a model substance and we have some conclusions we would like very much uh, to then uh, to continue our con conclusions in regard of other API, other drug forms. Uh, so your conclusion may cover some range of the API. What, in your opinion, uh, must be the property uh, of the drug that you can predict that it will behave in the same way as paracetamol that you used uh, in your experiments? Thank you. Colleague from are you still with us or no more? I am afraid there are no more online. So anyway, thank you for this question. But I will have one additional question for a colleague from Seged University for colleague Luca. Uh, I was very surprised when I was reading this paper because nozzle-free equipment for producing of nanofibers. Can you explain what does it mean? It is some kind of spray drying or what? Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, our collaborators in Edinburgh um, made this um, nozzle-free equipment for the electrospinning. And um, yes, it without needle or without nozzle, it uh, contains the polymer and the API solution. And uh, then um, to the electric force, it um, starts to move toward the collector simultaneously in multiple jets. And uh, through the, the, uh, this um, way, the solvent evaporates and on the collector collects the nanofiber. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional questions? No more than I will firstly express our deep thanks to all the presenters. I would especially these colleagues from the online uh, position, I would say. I'm thanking you for being here to audience. And I'm thanking also all colleagues for putting the questions to our presenters or lectures or posters. Thank you very much once again. Now I'm 
we, you are invited actually to the coffee break until 11, 11 o'clock. Good af afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I opened the next uh, section named uh, plenary section uh, third. Uh, the name of this section is uh, from Compendial to bio and dissolution testing. And uh, welcome to everybody, everybody who is uh, in this room or uh, online is. Uh, I would like to ask the first presenter, uh, the named uh, Jagos Karbac, uh, the title of uh, his presentation, Stress After Ingest uh, Biopredictive Simulation of the Human Gastrointestinal Tract. He coming from Physiolution uh, Company Polska. Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction. So in the next 45 minutes, I would like to give you some ideas, also some insights into the bioproductive testing of oral medicines, especially in the preclinical phase. So I just divided this talk in two parts. The first part will be dealing with the basics of the physiology of the human gastrointestinal tract. It will be have a very informative character. And we would like to Sorry, technical error, how to change the slides. We would like to introduce you the problem of the bioproductive testing of oral medicines. And if you think of the dosage form as it comes from the manufacturing, you need to also consider that it will be ingested with foods or with a glass of water, and it will have to dissolve or work under the physiology of the human gastrointestinal tract. And this, are, this is very complex, very dynamic, the human gastrointestinal tract represents a very complex and very dynamic system in which essential physical chemical parameters might change with a very high um, rate in time. And those parameters which are most crucial from my point of view, from my perspective, most crucial for the drug delivery processes of the solid oral dosage forms, are the pH, pressure, and temperature. And you can see here them, in the, so let's say in this, in this picture, in this graph, uh, you can see all those three values that were recorded by a dosage form like telemetric capsule, which was given under post conditions. You can see nicely the fluctuations of temperature, which is not constant along the human gastrointestinal tract. You can see the fluctuations of the pH, which are indicated by the black line. And you can see also very, high, a very dynamic motoric activity with peaks of very high fortitude. All those factors can affect the dissolution process and by the end of the day also the drug delivery process of the sold oral formulations. And if you think of being bio-relevant and of being um, of test of bioproductive testing of oral dosage form, you necessarily need to depict the dynamic of the physiological situation. And let's start with the presentation like factor by factor. So years ago as I started my PhD in Germany, We've been dealing with the movement performance of the dosage form in the human gastrointestinal tract. So this was work which was, which was done together with Werner Weitschis, and we investigated the movement or motility patterns which, to which the dosage form is subjected. So the movement, we started with just simply observations. with just simply observations that were done by the, gastros by the gastroscopy. So what you are looking at is the lumen of the human stomach under fasting conditions. So you can see here nicely the antral contractions, which propagate towards the pylorus. The pylorus open for a short time. You can see it down there as a black hole here. And the contractions move this study the content of the stomach so this is the real-time picture so this is the real-time dynamics of the movement of the of the gastric mucosa and you need to realize that your dosage form will disintegrate under such conditions or if you aim to develop dosage forms of prolonged drug delivery characteristics you need to survive this environment if you think of movement of the dosage form you can try to quantify it. This is something that Werner did in his, in his research work. He located, he traced the dosage forms that were magnetically labeled and he gave them to the healthy volunteers. In this particular case, it was conventional 
um, um, entry coated tablet, which was given in, with a glass of water. This clay shape that you can see here in the picture is the duodenum. Then the dosage form was ingested by the subject. It stays in the stomach. You can see the time frame here. Now it will be moved towards the pylorus and then the gastric emptying will occur. Please have a look at the dynamics. Bam. It took less than six seconds and the dosage form passed approximately one meter of the proximal gastrointestinal tract. So the enteric coat tablet was not able to dissolve under fasting conditions in the duodenum, as it is believed uh, based on the pharmacopoeial research. It stays somewhere in the loop of the small intestine and it's moved randomly uh, in form of propulsive movements toward the, in the distal, distal direction. So, and the time which is required for the dissolution is also significantly longer as in the pharmacopoeial tester. So definitely there's something down there that we do not understand, but we need to simulate in order to provide medicines of better quality. So this velocity you can, can try to quantify. You can calculate the velocity profiles of the dosage form and you will notice that you have very long phases of rest that are interrupted by very short but very dynamic phenomena of transport. During this events of transport, like for example gastric emptying or iliocecal passage, the tablet is propelled or the dosage form is propelled to velocities of up to 50 centimeters per second for a very short time, only just for two, three seconds maybe. And after that, a long rest phase occurs. So we have extremely discontinuous conditions that need to be considered in the test in order to be biopredictive or biorelevant. So if you look at the movement of the dosage form, you, you have to bring two factors in association. One of them is the movement of the, of the dosage form itself, but this movement is provoked by the contractions by the motility of the human gastrointestinal tract. And here I've shown you, I prepared a picture of a movie, acid contractions that were recorded using the fluoroscopic camera. So you can see here real-time pictures, stomach, which was filled with a semi-solid meal, and dosage forms were administered together with the meal. You can see them here in antrum, how they are stressed and retropulsed by the stomach. So we are looking at the gastric sealing. So the stomach is classifying the contents with respect to the size. As long as you have calories in the stomach, it will, the dosage form will be recognized as a part of the, of the meal it will, and will be retained in the stomach. And here in this region of the stomach, we have a very dynamic movement, but also very dynamic, contraction, uh, very dynamic contractions and very high motility forces, very high shear forces. And those forces can be quantified. So in the literature, there were several attempts of doing this. One of them was to use catheters, like manometer catheters, which are extremely powerful. And this work has uh, continued by Pat Patrick Augustine and the colleagues in the, at the University of Leuven with very good results. They were dosage form-like measurement devices, and they were also telemetric capsules. And in Greifswald, we've been using the telemetric capsules for the quantification of temperature, pH, and pressure profiles that were sub to which the dosage form was, was subjected after the ingestion. And here, one of the first literature reports on the use of smart pill. The dosage form was given with a small snack, 400 kilocalories. You can see here nicely the acidification phase of the stomach. Then the pH rises and the gastric empty occurs. Interestingly, at the same time, the dosage form has noticed very high events of the mechanical agitation, like pressure of 300 millibars fortitude, or even more were reported. The same high motoric activity has been observed at the iliocecal junction, so at the region of the gastrointestinal tract, which separates the small intestine from the proximal colon, and then during the colonic transit. Interestingly, if you look at the pH, it also does not remain constant over the entire experiment. It rises in the small intestine and it fluctuates strongly in the colon. So it means that our test, if it has to be bioproductive or if the aim is to have the biopredictivity of the test method, uh, needs to consider such dynamic fluctuations as well. So if you look more in detail, more closely at the smart pill data, and this is work that has been done by Mirko Kociolek and colleagues in Greifswald, 
um, you can also notice that the temperature is not constant after after the administration the temperature rises from is, is mostly determined by the in, uh, by the temperature of the water which is co-ingested with the dosage form and it hits the stomach heats up within approximately 15 to 20 minutes and then every time you take liquid and the dosage form is somewhere in the proximal gastrointestinal tract you can observe a drop in the temperature and interestingly our stomach or our duodenum is not a good heater so it's not a good heat exchanger and the temperature gradients can last even for half an hour for retard formulation it's most not a problem but please think of an immediate release dosage form also, looking in more detail, you can see how complex the pattern of the gastric ink is and how high the forces can be. It's like 300 millibars or even more. So certainly they are tools or factors that can be quantified. We did such attempts to quantify the intensity of the pressure events and also the number of pressure events. And interestingly, uh, Gas, the pressure of the, of the gastric emptying ranges from approximately 100 to even 450 millibars under fasting and fed conditions. And uh, the pressure to which the uh, at the Leotica junction is, excuse me, a little bit lower and is on the level of approximately 75 to 200 millibars with a certain variability. So it's a substantial force that can be applied, that can stress our dosage form. So there is also a variability, um, not, not only in terms of the value of the pressure, but also the number of the pressure events to which the dosage form is subjected after the intake. Here, uh, uh, I prepared a slide uh, in which the number of pressure events above 100 millibar are indicated. The dosage form here in this particular study was given with a with a, with, a, with a standard American breakfast. So you can see nicely here that you have subjects with only very few pressure events of mechanical pressure, but also subjects in which case a very high motoric activity was, or was recorded. This high variability of the pressure of, the, of this measurement is uh, related to the intragastric position of the dosage form. So if that capsule, if the tablet is somewhere in the proximal stomach, in this full fundus area of the stomach, of the pressure events is very low. If you are somewhere in the antrum or in the distal or in the corpus of the stomach, uh, the number of the pressure events that are recorded is extremely high, and the passages uh, are also very, very, very intense. So again, huge variability in terms of number and values. Uh, you can also compare the different states like fasted and fed intake conditions. Under the fasted intake conditions, if you notice the pressure events, this is always or nearly always <coughs> related to the gas to the event of the gastric emptying. So under fasted conditions, this motoric activity comes always along uh, comes always along with the housekeeping wave. So with the event of the gastric emptying under fed conditions, this Motoric activity is related with the process, uh, to the processing of chai to the digestion process. So there is a substantial difference. However, if you look at the ranges, uh, despite the let's say total number of the pressure events, the range, the variability ranges are pretty, pretty similar. Um, now. Um, we thought a little bit regarding fast conditions, fat conditions. Here, one more slide to the fat conditions. Here, you can see at the whole gut transit of the dosage form, which was taken with the standard American breakfast, a standard FDA breakfast. So high fat, high caloric meal. So at time zero, there's an ingestion of the dosage form. You can see here nice the acidification phase of the stomach. Then a second meal is given, which is the, the lunch. The, capsule is pressed distally towards the pylorus, as you can see here nicely, very high fluctuations of the, of the pressure value. However, the capsule is not digested, it's too big to be emptied from the stomach. That's why it stays in the stomach longer until the snack and dinner are given. Every time when the new portion of foods enters the stomach, the pH rises and the acidification phase starts again. After approximately 16 hours, our subject goes asleep, falls asleep, and during the night hours, the stomach has the chance to be empty. Over the day, there is no fasted mode in the stomach, so it means the dosage forms that you take 
early in the morning. And if they are very big and do not dis disintegrate in the stomach, the very likely gastric emptying time is with the intake of foods or during the night hours. And in this particular case, the gastric emptying occurred, occurred up after approximately 20 hours. So it means at four o'clock on the next day, four o'clock a.m. On, on the next day. Here you have high motoric activity of the stomach at the gastric emptying. This short period of time here is the small intestine. So if you relate this to the duration of the total passage of the uh, total, total duration of the gastrointestinal passage, you see how short the window for the drugs to be absorbed is. So this is the realistic time here in which some drugs can be also absorbed if you have, for, for instance, no, no colonic absorption. Later on, we are entering the colon with extremely high fluctuations in the motoric activity and also pH. So now having such tools and now regardless of the technique, if it will be scintigraphy, telemetry or other tools, you can quantify the transit times through the gastrointestinal tract. And what we will notice is that the gastric emptying times, especially under fasted conditions, is very short. So the typical duration of the gastric emptying time is ranges, ranges somewhere between three minutes and two hours. This is the typical duration of the MMC cycle under fasted conditions. Under fed conditions, the duration of the gastric emptying times is significantly longer. So in our particular study, it was somewhere between 12 to 24 hours. However, um, please keep in mind that under fed conditions, the first time point at which the dosage form can be emptied from the stomach is the intake of the next portion of foods. So this is the first probable time point in the, in the study. In, under real life conditions, these gastric camping times tend to be significantly longer. So what's also quite cool, these are the small bowel transit times because the duration of the small bowel transit time doesn't differ much between fast and unfed conditions. It is due to the fact that the small bowel has been designed or has been developed by the mother nature as a bioreactor, which is used for the processing of calories. So uh, under fast and fed conditions, the transit times are very similar. There is no accumulation in the material in the small bowel. And the small bowel transit times can be nicely influenced by the eating frequency of the subjects. So if you administer the next portion of foods, the small bowel will clean itself and prepare for the uptake of the new calories. So that's why this variability here of those transit times, through the, especially through the proximal small bowel, is very, very low. Uh, what is very hard to predict and for what is extremely variable are colon transit times. And this is something that we do not understand. We are trying to approach this, especially with respect uh, to the proximal colon, which is the, from the biopharmaceutical point of view, most relevant uh, region of the colon. Uh, however, it's extremely hard to predict and the time span ranges from a couple of hours up to even two or three days. And this is something which is related more to the habits of the subjects and to its individual physiology and emotional circumstances than uh, any form of predictions that you can make in, form, uh, in course of the, of the clinical trial. So I think the variability uh, that you are facing and what's also quite important with respect of the testing of dosage forms are fluctuations of the pH. And I prepared a couple of slides for that. However, at this time point of the presentation, I would like to show you only the conditions, pH conditions. And, uh, pH conditions during the typical intake of the dosage form after the administration of high fat American breakfast. So these are conditions to which most of the pharmacokinetic data relate. Um, if you look at the pH gradients, you, had, you can see here nicely very high fluctuations of the values and the initial value of the pH amounts to approximately 4 to 4.5 at the intake. Later on, the pH drops to the level of approximately 2 within 2 to 3 hours. And then every portion of foods which enters the stomach shifts the pH value. So it's also very crucial for 
proper testing for proper setup of test profiles for solid oral dosage farms. So now a few insights in the physiology, we did a few insights in the physiology. So we could, uh, I introduced the movement of the dosage form, spoken a little bit regarding the pressure, the mechanical force, and regarding the pH to which the dosage form can be exposed. The big question is, how can we simulate it or how do we test our dosage forms in order to survive or to perform well under such complex conditions? And the first question is, what about the compendial dissolution test? Regardless if it will be the apparatus one, two, or four, the story is always the same. We have, we have well-defined, however, very mild and continuous test conditions in which the dosage form is exposed to a dissolution medium for a very long time and under those gentle conditions we are capturing kinetic profiles of the dissolution process so it doesn't hold true in most of the cases in most of the cases the predictions are wrong or misleading or need or require or end up in very complicated clinical trials and <laughs> started to investigate the conditions in the compendial apparatuses. So the movement performance of the dosage form was not so very well. So most of the tablets just simply stayed in one location, so boring. Regarding the mixing conditions, there was also not much that can be investigated, could be investigated. Hydrodynamics was also very well understood and tested by other groups. However, the Reynolds numbers or the complex flow patterns, they are let's say, not so very predictive and not so very useful uh, from the perspective of preclinical testing of dosage forms. What we did was the quantification of the mechanical conditions in the compendial apparatuses. And we compared disintegration tester, we compared USP apparatus 3, and uh, USP apparatus 3 at different uh, uh, rates, dips per minute. And as you can see here, the forces generated by the devices, regardless of the distribution pattern of the pressure, are very low. They are on the level of 5 to, let's say, 10, 12 millibar only. Whereas the average pressure at the gastric emptying amounts to approximately 350 millibars. So it's 25, a factor 25 difference. So those apparatuses, they do not offer uh, the possibility from the con construction, they do not offer the possibility to simulate the physiologically relevant pressure at all. So now there is a need, okay, so we need to do something else, something new. And we asked ourselves, uh, ourselves in the year 2007, 2000, 2005, 2006, we asked ourselves, okay, how can we simulate all the factors simultaneously? How, how can we have one simple tool and be able to, to mimic the pH, the physical chemistry of the gastrointestinal tract, but also the movement and the pressure? And uh, together with Werner Weichis, we came up uh, to such construction of the stress test device. This was the topic of, of, of my PhD work that I, I did in, in his group. We generated or we developed a device which was, give, which was based on a very simple scheme. So the central element of the device which, which was a basket in which the dosage form was hosted for the entire experiment. So we knew exactly the location of the tablet and we could design the conditions around because the dissolution of the drug delivery performance of the dosage form is always straightforward related to the conditions outside. So if you know the location, if you can design the conditions, you can control the experiment. That's the biggest difference to other systems that coexist on the market. Inside of this prop chamber, we hosted a balloon, which was tightly attached to a nozzle, and the nozzle was attached to pipe, to the central axis, axis of the apparatus, and to our well system. By switching the wells, we are able to inflate and deflate the balloon, which was which could expand in the crop chamber. By doing so, we are we were able to stress the dosage form with a mechanical pressure. So, the force generated on the dosage form was straightforward proportional to the pressure of the spare air fitted into the balloon. 
on the other side of this apparatus of this axis we coupled a stepping motor which gave us the opportunity to propel the dosage form to physiological velocities so for a very short time we were able to propel the tablet 50 70 centimeters per second and position and uh, uh, and uh, uh, simulate the intermittent contact with the dissolution medium uh, here you can find also a steerer which was used north not for assuring the hydrodynamic conditions of the test but for homogenizing the dissolution media in the standard dissolution vessel in order to get a sample of a very good quality so this device was developed years ago and since then we are using it with modifications in many modifications for testing of oral medicines meanwhile we tested more than 1600 uh, um, modified release formulations and we supported uh, the documentation or selection of products for more than 400 clinical trials and the success rate of the predictions that we made is on the level of approximately 85 to 90 percent depending on the bcs class of the api so straightforward but, but powerful and if you can use it properly you can really generate good data so this is the finished product that we did in cooperation with one of the German companies that, who helped us to develop the, the, the high-end high -end solution out of that. So you can see here the scheme of the prototype. Here is the prop chamber with the dosage form. You can recognize here the elastic balloon, the pH probe, which is used for the simulation of the variable, variable pH conditions along the gastrointestinal tract, filter, magnet, uh, and uh, steerer blade. So for many years, we've been using this device for characterization of the dosage forms under fast conditions. This was, these were the initial, initial jobs or initial products that we took. And uh, in parallel, we've been developing test protocols or test scenarios that were intended for mimicking the complex, uh, uh, condition, uh, complex intake conditions with foods. And I would like to introduce an example that we've been working on very recently. We've been involved really from the very first tablet to, uh, in the, into the development of Trazadon uh, um, generic products. So we had dosage forms with different compositions. Uh, different prototypes were manufactured and those prototypes were characterized using compendial dissolution methods. So you can see here nicely the dissolution profiles um, um, obtained under a method which is recommended by the manufacturer manufacturer or by the uh, by the patent documentation. The treaty cause our comparator and the generic product that we selected for the clinical trials, the formulation F, which is somewhere here in the top. So clearly no F2 values have been considered, uh, could be calculated. The products are clearly clearly different with respect to drug delivery performance under, under simulated FET conditions. So we started to develop a test protocol, which assumed the simulation of the intragastric conditions for the five, first five hours. This timing was aligned with the setup of the clinical protocol. We have here the event of the gastric emptying, which was simulated, the intestinal passage and the colonic passage. During the gas simulated gastric residence time, we had pH gradient, but we also applied different patterns of mechanical agitation, covering the medium range of the, for, of the, uh, of the fortitude of, of, of gastric conditions. At five hours, gastric emptying was simulated. Later on, the small intestinal passage came along with small events of mechanical stresses and in the colonic conditions in, under the simulated colonic conditions the um, fortitude of the stress was elevated here the outcome of the clinical trial uh, of the of, of the um, dissolution studies we can nicely see here that the products differ from each other so tritico is a clear dose damper so it's prone to the mechanical agitation starting from the fifth hour of the experiment so it's prone to prone to the event of the gastric emptying and provides the solution profiles of a very high variability. Other generic formulations, they are better in terms of the drug delivery performance and the formulation F, which was selected for the clinical trial, uh, provides the solution profiles which are very closely to the original product under the FET, simulated FET conditions.
So this is the outcome of clinical trial. So in this trial, we also designed the setup of the clinical trial that has sampling points, eating and drinking pattern. And you can see here nicely that there is a good match. So that the product in terms of the variability ranges, um, 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 they, uh, they fit very well. Uh, so that the essential parameters like Cmax, AUC, and Tmax could be uh, were were compliant, were exactly this, were, were were within the um, bioequivalence criteria. So this part of the study was was successful. So there's. As mentioned, a lot of examples. So uh, most of the data that we have is uh, related to, let's say, commercial studies. So we can, unfortunately, we cannot share. However, after this 11 years, we can say that over we tested more than 1,600 formulations and we supported more than 300 clinical trials. And in every trial or in every project, we learned that the passage through the stress zones of the gastrointestinal tract especially through the pylorus and the iliocecal wealth, is very critical for modified release products. The dissolution media has an influence on the mechanical robustness of the dosage form. So once you have media with the presence of digestion products, surfactants in a very high concentration, it clearly impacts the mechanical stability of certain formulations. So for this, we have good examples for the time reasons I'm not able to, to share them with you. The, and what, what we've proven over the years is that the use of our biorelevant dissolution methods is useful for the identification of the undesired release performance of the formulations. So using our methods, which are more close to the physiology of the gastrointestinal tract, we can select robust formulations, we can reject dose numbers, and we can estimate the in vivo drug delivery performance of this model, this dissolution uh, uh, device, underlies continuous mod modifications. A couple of years ago, we have started to work on this, uh, on further development of the device, which is the universal modular modular pl platform, which includes the functionality of the standard tool for the quality control. But we have also the stress tester with the possibility to implement the mechanical pressure and the biopredictive test scenarios. And we also implemented our dynamic pH titrators in order to be able to depict the variability of the physical chemical conditions along with the human gastrointestinal tract. And this is, let's say, all, all in one machine, which was developed. The pandemic situation in the year 2020 didn't help us much on that. However, we reactivate the project. These are the prototypes that are currently under manufacturing in our laboratory in Wrocław. So the devices operate six to eight vessels simultaneously. They use liquid gaseous titer for the simulation of the intestinal conditions. This is the picture of the functional prototype that was designed in the year 2019. You can see here different elements. So we'll start maybe with here. Uh, this is the elastic balloon, the sieve that you already know from, from the previous part. You have here the sensor elements, standard paddle that you know from the USP, and also wells and pumps for gasos and liquid titers for the simulation of the human, of the pH conditions along the gastrointestinal tract. So now the question is, we have the mechanics, so pressure and movement I introduced. Now, uh, the third factor that we, we've been dealing with is to simulate the pH conditions. And we focused mainly on the simulation of the intestines. Why, Why intestines? Because stomach was quite easy because it's a, like, mostly the solution of the hydrochloric acid. And from that time point, also the information on the exact pH profiles in the stomach didn't exist, at least in a very high, uh, high uh, resolution. The intestinal pHs have also one interesting feature. The intestinal pH comes along from the hydrogen carbonates, which are, which are the main buffering system of the human body, especially under fasted conditions. Under fat, you have a lot of buffer capacity coming out from foods or from the digestion products. However, the pH shift of those chimie or this digestion products is always um, provoked or comes always along with the translocation of the carbon dioxide. And if you look more closely to the physical chemistry of those hydrogen carbonates, you will notice that the dissociation or that the generation of proton 
or neutralization of proton comes along with the translocation of the carbon dioxide from the gas phase and the solution. So if you dissolve carbon dioxide, you acidify the dissolution media. If you evacuate the carbon dioxide here in the gas form, you evacuate also the proton. So the media can be neutralized. And the beauty of the process is, and this is something which is really a feature given by the mother nature, because the process is perfectly reversible. You can fluctuate the pH without changing the volume, without using of liquid titers, and without changing the ionic strength of the solution, and so so and so on. And it's perfectly reversible. And it can be very nicely used for the simulation of the intestinal conditions. And th for this, there is really a need because if you look at the pH and buffer capacity of the intestinal uh, liquids of these intestinal aspirates, you can notice that the buffer capacity is extremely low. It's on the level of one, maybe to 20 millimole per delta pH per liter. If you compare the pharmacopoeial buffers to that, like acetate or phosphate buffer, you will notice that the environment in which you are dissolving your ionizable compounds like polymers or drugs is significantly stronger. So in most of the cases, based on our experience, you are just simply overestimating uh, the the solution power of the physiological liquids. And where does it matter? It matters much for the solubility and the solution kinetics of the APIs, the, for the permeability of the polymer layers, like polymembranes or coatings for solid or dosage forms, to the dissolution performance of the coatings. And it's very useful in the digestion and tests of lipolysis. And in order to be able to run such complex some such complex simulations, we developed a device which is called Physiograd, which is an automated dynamic pH controller for the simulation of high resolution physiological gradients. And this device doesn't use liquid titers. We are simulating the intestinal conditions, the intestinal conditions by dosing only two gases like carbon dioxide, compressed air, or every neutral gas that you can take. So consequently, if you uh, have no liquid titers, you have no pH spots, you have constant volume, constant ionic strength, and uh, the processes are very re reversible, very useful. It has been developed furthermore to its new modular construction, in which you have different, let's say, functional elements, but it's like working, working well, dosing classes, and enables you to simulate very complex intestine, small intestinal or even colonic pH profiles with the physiological dynamics. What you're looking at here is mean pH profiles representing the variability range of the pH under small intestinal conditions. So those profiles can be generated, can be repeated, and you have a tool for the rational characterization of your dosage form. One example on the pH, Years ago, we started to formulate the oral sites uh, which are in, intended for oral use. So we started with enzymes and monoclonal antibodies. Antibodies were even cooler. And here we formulated dosage forms, mini tablets, which were enteric coated. They uh, had they were given under fasting conditions to rhesus monkeys now, also to human. They needed to dissolve in the certain region of the gastrointestinal tract and release the material there so that uh, the dissolution should be um, um, uh, the, the, the target the target place in the human gastrointestinal tract was somewhere in the prox uh, in the distal small intestine proximal colon uh, the intention was to assure very high concentration of the analyte in this section of the gastrointestinal tract here uh, just one result of this study, we have simulated such a pH profile, which assumed gastric residence time for up to two hours, and later on intestinal and colonic passage. And in parallel, we've been quantifying the amount of the drug dissolved. And after approximately four to five hours, after approximately four to five hours, at entering the colon, the dosage forms dissolved. This was confirmed in the clinical trial in which the stool samples or aspirates from the distal part of the, um, of the gastrointestinal tract of the monkeys were collected. So uh, in the very early samples, no activity of the antibodies were noticed. 
However, after 16 to 20 hours, in Fetzias, we found a very high concentration of the antibodies. And this comes along with the passage times under the, under, of, of the monkeys, uh, in, in, in the monkeys under those, those conditions. So we did also attempts to simulate the whole gut transit uh, using our device, using our dynamic titrators. For this, we've been using liquid and gaseous titers simultaneously, simultaneously. And the attempt was to, to have a system which is able to work in the flow through mode and deliver very complex pH scenarios. For this, we've been using the smart build data or data from the telemetric capsules that were transferred that were transferred to a numeric input function for our simulations, which is indicated by the red line. And later on, these profiles were executed. So you have here three lines, the blue line as the original data from the clinical trial, the green line is uh, the input function, and the red profile is the profile that we generated using, using our tools. So, so like, uh, this is something that we did or that it's possible in the dissolution test in terms of pH. I think I'm running out of time, so there is, I could talk for, 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 for hours. Uh, okay, so three minutes. Okay, good. Okay, good. So maybe just shortly without introducing very detailed examples. Uh, there are also physiological factors in the human gastrointestinal tract, which are much more dynamic. And uh, to me, the biggest challenge was not the testing of modified release formulations, because in terms of the modified release formulations, you have time. You have just simply the factor of time. The processes are running for hours. In terms of the modified immediate release products, you have three minutes and you have to coordinate motility forces, pH, temperature gradients, and gastric emptying of water. And for the time reasons, I will just only introduce shortly the physiology, the problematic of the physiology of the intake conditions under in the fasting state, because that's to me the most challenging process to synchronize this and to deliver data with a good reproducibility. Uh, under conditions which are trying to depict this very simple situation. So class of water, a dosage form, fast in stomach, and let's go. So what you are starting with, what you have to understand in the beginning is that the gastric emptying of water is a very fast process. So within approximately 15 minutes, most of the water, let's say 160 to 200 milliliters of the water that you ingested is emptied from the stomach. So it's a very, very short time in which the dosage form needs to disintegrate and dissolve the material under the gastric conditions. Interestingly, this water is emptied under fasting state, very fast, but also in the fed state. If you have foods in your stomach and you give water to the subject, it is emptied with the same kinetics. So you can use this phenomena phenomenon, which is called Magenstrasse, which was also investigated by my colleagues in Greifswald, uh, to transport the material out of the stomach. These are the movement patterns or of chai mi, which is given in this red uh, as a gray color and water in the stomach. So along the small curvature, the water can be, can be emptied. The other point that you have to simulate that you have to simulate your, your experiment is the temperature. So the water that you are ingesting with the dosage form has a, is on the level of approximately 20 to 25 Celsius degrees. So it determines the initial temperature at which the dissolution of the material takes place. The water can heat up within 10 to 15 minutes to body temperature. And interestingly, in this time frame, most of the liquid will be emptied from the stomach. So this can be seen here nicely. The blue line indicates the, temp the intragastric temperature profiles recorded using, using an IntelliCup telemetric capsule. Also, the pH in the stomach is not constant. Okay? It can be nicely aff easily affected by the duodenal reflux, and it can lead to the precipitation of the poorly soluble APIs, even under gastric conditions. Here, 
Again, the temperature profiles that we recorded in the clinical trial, you can see here that it takes approximately 25 minutes to heat up the water to the body temperature. So this needs to be considered in the dissolution test as well. Uh, yeah, it can be done, of course, uh, by reducing the volume of the dissolution and by transferring our dissolution tester to a flow through flow through device can be reliably simulated on the dosage forms. Now, I prepared only example for the time reasons. We'll skip a couple of slides in order to show you what's the impact of the temperature itself. So one, isolated physiological factors. If you run the dissolution process, we are comparing in one trial, we are comparing the dissolution profiles of hard gelatin capsules and HPMC capsules. Gelatin capsules, they are dissolving regardless of the conditions very fast. We have after 10 to after let's say up to eight minutes, we are triggering the dissolution of the material. Uh, if we add simulation of the mechanical agitation like gastric emptying or intragastric stresses, we can nivelate the differences between small hard gelatin capsules and HPMC AS capsules. However, sorry. Still, we need to do something in order to trigger the truck delivery. However, if you simulate the temperature, only the temperature changes, uh, only the physiological pH gradients, you will notice that the gelatin, which is very commonly used in the pharmaceutics, is extremely temperature dependent uh, with respect to the dissolution and swelling, swelling performance. So consequently, the dissolution profiles of hard gelatin capsules drops whereas the HPMC AS is not affected. So regardless what you do and when you apply the mechanical agitation, the dosage forms remain comparable. And this comparability was proven in many clinical trials, also like PK profiles or, or uh, scintigraphic studies. And this comparability of those materials could not been established, could not have been established using compendial methods. So, Concluding for the immediate release products, uh, we have learned, we have tested more than 400 formulations meanwhile, and we learned that there is no one medium or one method uh, that can enable the biopredictive characterization of immediate release products. Uh, in order to be realistic with respect to the simulation of the intestinal, uh, gastrointestinal conditions, you have to assure proper simulation of the gastric emptying, mechanical stresses and temp temperature changes that cover the variability of the physiological conditions. And we focus on the edge parameters, because if the products are comparable under edge parameters, they are comparable in the entire space. And We've proven on many examples that the bio-relevant solution test devices developed by us um, and set of test programs can be very useful for the identification of the unwanted release performance of the formulations in the preclinical stage. Okay, now I think I'm nearly done. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, we have to take the time, therefore, is uh, only a few questions is possible. Who has question or remarks? Professor Berg, right? Thank you, Gregor, for sharing the story of success, I must say. From the principal idea to the realization, it's really impressive. Um, my question is, um, you have changed so many factors um, if you compare this to conventional um, dissolution mm -hmm. settings. Why did you not consider to change the volumes? We did, in fact. You did? Uh, we did. We did also attempts in small volumes. However, like dissolution tests in even 20, 50 mils were performed. Uh, the point is, it's not always easy and the data is not always easy to interpret because you are just simply missing the sink uh, volume. So when you are considering small volume, you need an absorption compartment. Otherwise, you will be also always able to depict the dissolution performance only of a dose fraction, only of a fraction of the dose. But so that's this the, is reality, <laughs> that uh, you are not under sink conditions in your Yeah, this is reality your with respect. Yeah, mm, but uh, now separate the problems. The point is, mm, 
the reality is the realistic concentration of surfactants. The reality is the realistic buffer capacity, pH levels, and so on. This is the reality. And to my opinion, the biggest problem that we face now when developing processes or when developing test equipment is the simulation of the systemic uptake. Because uh, usually if you are missing the solubility, you are missing the sink conditions, you are applying a lot of surfactant. When you are applying a lot of surfactant, you are losing the discriminatory power of the method. Okay, it brings you back to the question, okay, we test only, uh, let's say, a fraction of those in order to be bioproductive. Uh, and from this perspective, from this perspective, I think when we have no interesting, and for now we do not have it, to be honest. We tried different things and uh, it was always questionable. As long as you have no reliable way of mimicking the absorption performance without the fear that you dissolve particles in octanol or whatever, then the volume is extremely hard to consider. And it's mis very often misleading. Okay, this is my estimation. There is no easy answer on this question, I'm afraid. What we did is, is for example, we started the solution in a small volume and we diluted in the experiment with substituted volume just in order to be under sink conditions. And this is much better, but still it's a general, very general approximation. We tried ultrafiltration dialysis, we tried octanol layers and uh, always difficult. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. And, and the next and the next presentation uh, is uh, uh, from Slovenian University of Ljubljana. Uh, the presenter is Maria Bogotai. Uh, the title of uh, her presentation is Bioproductive Dissolution Testing of Multiparticulate Delivery Systems. Uh, dear participants of 13th Central European Symposium of Pharmaceutical Technology, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all that attend the symposium in Gdansk and uh, also to all that follow this meeting online. Let me thank you in the beginning to the organizers for this invitation as it gives me the opportunity to present you part of our work on bioproductive or biorelevant dissolution testing. We are all familiar with dissolution testing and we know well different systems used for this purpose. We know well pharmacopoeial systems, basket, pedal, cylinders, flow through cells. Uh, however, uh, in the uh, last period, there are many alternative apparatuses that have been developed. Uh, most, in most cases, cases with one purpose, to simulate better the selected physiological parameters. Here you can see one flow-through system, but it not they are not necessary all flow-through systems. Uh, let's look which physiological parameters are the most important to be simulated. Of course, first of all, this is, these are the media. Media in GI tract, their composition, their physical chemical properties. Uh, media in a GI tract differs in different parts of GI tract, and this is an important issue that has to be considered. Uh, another parameter is connected with this, and this is transit of the dosage, dosage forum along the GI tract. During the travel of the dosage forum along the GI tract, the dosage form is exposed to different conditions in different parts of GI tract. And uh, this is the fact that has to be considered also in dissolution testing. However, uh, the fact is that uh, today we do most of the solution tests by using only one single medium. There is another fact that these experiments, uh, the results of these experiments are quite useful and give us many information about the dosage form and its performance, performance after administration. But already in pharmacopoeia, 
we have a prescription uh, for the procedure with media change. This is prescription for testing delayed release solid on which forms. According to this procedure, uh, dosage form is kept in the acidic medium for two hours, and then acidic medium is changed with medium with pH of 6.8. These two hours simulates the gastric residence of the dosage form, which can of course influence also the dissolution in the small intestine, not only in the stomach. Uh, if we search scientific literature, uh, we can find uh, many other approaches uh, which uh, simulate different times in different uh, parts of GI tract, especially a lot of them focus on the uh, gastric residence time and transfer from stomach to small intestine, which is one of the most important uh, residences or parameters uh, after administration of dosage forms. According to these different residents in the stomach, uh, we have uh, to consider different time in acidic media in dissolution, as already said. But for which dosage forms this is important? Uh, if we focus now on the gastric residence and transfer of the dosage form from the stomach to the small intestine, uh, then uh, we can identify a few types of dosage forms that are susceptible to this change, to this transfer. And of course, first of all, there are enteric coated dosage forms. Uh, then there are dosage forms which contain the drugs with pH dependent solubility. We know that most of the drugs are weak acids or weak bases with low solubility. And of course, uh, the results of uh, the dissolution of such drugs are different profiles in the acidic medium, in the medium of empty stomach and intestinal medium. Additionally, if dosage form contains pH dependent excipient, uh, then it may also result in different uh, dissolution profiles in stomach, in empty stomach, and in small intestine. Let me show you a few examples of such dissolution testing. Here uh, you can see the dissolution profiles of enterocoated pellets, uh, which were kept in acidic medium for different time periods. Uh, on the profiles, and then this uh, Acidic medium was, of course, uh, changed with the medium of higher pH. Uh, we can see uh, lag times in the solution profiles. Lag times are in, are in accordance with the time during which these pellets were kept in acidic medium. And then we can see sharp increase in concentrations, that means fast release after the transfer to pH 6.5. Uh, we can see that after this lag time, the old profiles are very similar. This was the case in uh, these experiments for this dosage form. However, it's not necessary that when the uh, enteric coated dosage form is exposed to acidic medium for different time, that it does not influence uh, the release in intestinal medium. There might be influence of gastric residence time on the release in, uh, at higher pH. Uh, the second uh, example is the drug uh, with low solubility in acidic media and higher solubility in intestinal media. Uh, again, uh, this uh, dosage form, multi-particulate dosage form, was kept in acidic medium for the times written here, different times. And uh, we can see that very low dissolution could be observed in acidic media, but really uh, dissolution begins in a larger extent after exposure to pH 6.8, which is of course in accordance with the solubility of the drug. 
And here we have another example. This is dosed forum, which releases the drug fast in acidic medium. Uh, but uh, the drug release slows down after the transfer to pH 6.5. And of course, by exposure of, of different times to acidic medium, uh, we can get different dissolution profiles, as we can see here. And now, of course, we have a question. Which of these profiles reflects best the in vivo situation? Or if I ask differently, how long the dosage form has to be kept in acidic medium to reliably simulate its gastric residence? And of course, the answer to this question lies in the physiological performance of the dosage form on, uh, and their gastric empty. If you look in general, the uh, Gastric emptying of pellets and tablets differs. Pellets are emptied from the stomach in long time interval, up to two or three hours. However, tablet will leave the stomach at one single moment. Now, if we go back to these profiles, Uh, we can say that one of these profiles, that means if we keep uh, the dosage for only for one single time in acidic medium and then change it to higher pH, one of these profiles will describe well the situation for certain fraction of pellets, for selected fraction of pellets. While in the case of tablets, one of these profiles will describe well the situation for one tablet, but which is kept in the stomach for the same time. Uh, what means uh, that this prof profile is obtained at only one time in acidic medium does not describe the whole dose of pellets. And for tablets, we still don't know where we are because the tablet may leave the stomach at any time between few minutes up to two hours. And we really don't know when the tablet left the stomach after certain administration. So even for tablet, we do not know which uh, profile is representative. Okay, uh, I opened another problem, but from here on, I will focus my talk on the multiparticulate systems. So, uh, we started uh, to search the literature about the data on the data on gastric emptying of pellets, and we found these individual gastric emptying profiles. Here we have the percentage of the pellets which are still in the stomach in dependence on the time after administration. First thing that we can all see is huge, really huge variability of these profiles. Uh, some pellets empty from the stomach in 10, 20 minutes, the whole dose, while the others stay in the stomach for up to three hours or even longer. Uh, here I would like to point out another feature. And this is the profile marked with red color here. We can see that uh, in this individual, pellets empty the stomach in two boluses. The first bolus was emptied after one hour, one hour after administration, while the second bolus was emptied approximately three hours after administration. We can see the time between two boluses is, is approximately two hours. And two hours, as you know, is also the time of one MMC cycle. That means, we can expect that this happens, that uh, pellets, a part of the pellets, first balls of the pellets, will leave the stomach in the third phase of the first MMC cycle and the second in the third phase of the next MMC cycle. 
Uh, empty hymbolus is a typical uh, process which is very frequently described, but it is not expressed in all profiles. Just some of them are typical. So, uh, we uh, wanted to use this data that we found in literature in our dissolution testing, but it's not very easy because these data, as you can see, are very complex with very high variability. We decided to uh, use mathematical approach and uh, we uh, described these individual uh, profiles by using three different models, a leg time exponential model, WIPOL and double WIPOL model. Here you can see uh, two individual profiles, points are the experimental data, uh, lines are uh, the responses of the model, uh, and uh, uh, these two uh, parameters of the models are written here also in the table. Uh, we found out that uh, individual empty data are best described by double viable model. Uh, in fact, this was uh, expected because uh, the shapes of these profiles are very different and pretty complex and uh, double viable model is uh, able to describe such different and com more complex shapes of these profiles. Here you can see also the equation, the general equation of double viable model. Now uh, we had, uh, uh, we described all individual uh, profiles with the models, we had the equations, and now we had to use this information in the solution testing. Here is the first uh, example. First, uh, this is one of these profiles that I have already shown you. Uh, profile with uh, emptying uh, in the form of boluses. And this is an easy one. Uh, because uh, this first bolus was emptied after one hour, the second bolus after three hours, we determined the dissolution uh, by keeping the pellets one hour in acidic medium and the negative solution by keeping the pellets three hours in the solution medium. And then the medium was changed with artificial intestinal uh, juice. Uh, we calculated fractions of pellets emptied in one hour and in three hours and multiply obtained dissolution profiles with corresponding fractions. We calculated some of these two weighted profiles and we expect that this obtained weighted average dissolution profiles describes the real situation in uh, GI tract and stomach and small intestine much better than uh, considering the solution uh, at only one time in acidic medium. Of course, uh, we calculated exactly, it was not exactly one hour and three hours and 30%, but we calculated the exact numbers, uh, times and percentages uh, from the obtained model. Uh, we went on and uh, we come to this profile. Uh, which is much more complex. No boluses can be seen, it's not so easy to simulate it. So we decided to uh, take the following approach. We divided the whole empty interval in smaller intervals. And uh, by the aid of model, the fractions of pellets emptied of each of these intervals was were calculated. These were the results that, results that were obtained. In first column, you can see the time intervals. In the last column, you can see the percentages of the pellets emptied in each fraction. Now, what we wanted to do next was to determine the solution for each fraction. And we did it like that that we kept the pellets for the mean times of smaller interval, intervals in acidic medium, and then change it with uh, page 6.8. And here the times 
uh, these are the mean times of the second column, the mean times of smaller intervals, and these are the times when the simulated gastric fluid was changed with simulated intestinal fluid. So, we obtained different dissolution profiles for each fraction. We multiply each of these profiles with percentage of pellets in corresponding fraction and calculated the sum of so of weighted dissolution profiles. Uh, we obtained so-called weighted average dissolution profile, uh, and as we called it also, this was predicted in vivo dissolution profile, as we expect that this profile describes real in vivo situations much better than uh, considering only one gastric residence time. Uh, here you can see by, by red line, red profile, uh, the weighted average resolution profile. Of course, the shape of this uh, weighted average resolution profile is much different than the shape of individual profiles. Uh, so, in the next phase, we calculated weighted average resolution profile for each individual gastric empty profile that we found in literature. And here we can see the uh, predicted in view of dissolution profiles for all 11 gastric empty profiles based uh, on the literature data. Uh, we compare them predicted in vivo dissolution profiles with absorption profiles of the same dosage form. It was performed in uh, another study uh, in a group of, uh, from Greifswald. And uh, this comparison, we cannot compare it directly, and if, but I will show you condensed graph where the scales on the right two graphs are very similar. And these two graphs, the right two graphs can be compared and we can see some similarity between these two graphs. But of course, it's not uh, enough only to see similarity between the solution and absorption profiles. We have to confirm this similarity. But how to compare now in this particular case Dissolution weighted uh, predicted in view dissolution profiles with absorption profiles. What we did, we compared each dissolution with each absorption profile. Uh, because there are many profiles, uh, many absorption, many dissolution profiles, we uh, compared fast, medium, and slow absorption separately with dissolution profiles. It's, it can be better seen, this comparison can be better seen if we did it like that. And we can see that practically all of absorption profiles are well covered with dissolution profiles. But here we can only see, we want the next step, we wanted to quantify this comparison. So what we did, we calculated similarity factors F2 for comparison between the solution and uh, predicted in view dissolution profiles and absorption profiles. And uh, we got the following results. Here we have data for absorption profiles, slow, medium, and fast, which were compared with all individual weighted average dissolution profiles. These are or predicted in vivo dissolution profiles. Uh, these are uh, these two F2 predicted. Here we, you have another data, F2 in vitro. These uh, numbers here means the comparison of absorption data with uh, in vitro dissolution tests, uh, profiles of in vitro dissolution tests, when we considered only one time in acidic medium. 
It means comparison with only one time or a series of time and compare in calculation of weighted dissolution profile. That means our new approach with old approach. In last three columns, you can see which approach uh, better describes uh, absorption profiles or where the similarity between absorption and dissolution profiles is better. And you can see here it's in vitro, that means only one time and predicted our approach. And we can see that in most cases, uh, weighted average dissolution profiles describe much better absorption profiles. Uh, that means uh, that uh, we determined much better, we obtained much better in vitro and new correlation if we used uh, our approach by calculation of weighted average dissolution profiles than when we used only one time in acidic medium. So uh, we confirmed uh, uh, our approach uh, by good in vitro and new correlation in this study. But the fact is, this study was very complex, complex. This approach is very complex and uh, there is a lot of calculation. So uh, we decided to develop also another more, more simple approach, uh, which has its limitations, but in some cases it may be used uh, quite successfully. Uh, we calculated average profile of gastric emptying of pellets. And uh, you can see from, uh, from this profile what are the drawbacks of this approach. Uh, we calculated average profile uh, from the profiles, individual profiles, which has have, have very huge variability. And in fact, uh, this uh, profile does not reflect this variability. That's the problem. That's one problem. Another problem is that this is not, uh, that this profile additionally does not reflect the mechanism of gastric empty. But anyway, uh, we calculated this and we use it, used it only for one purpose, for comparison with mean absorption profiles. No individual comparisons, but only comparisons with mean absorption profile. I will show you an example, but first let's go to the procedure. So we calculated the average profile. Uh, here you can see the equation. This is a viable model, which in this case was quite appropriate and described this profile well. Uh, further procedure was very similar to previous one. So uh, we divided the complete, the whole uh, empty interval in smaller time intervals and calculated the fractions of pellets in each of these smaller smaller interval. Then we perform the solution testing for each calculated fraction of pellets by keeping the pellets for the mean time of this of each uh, smaller interval in gastric medium and of course then change it with intestinal medium. So uh, we obtained uh, different dissolution profiles by keeping the pellets for different times in acidic medium and calculated predicted mean, in this case, in vivo dissolution profile. Again, uh, the shape of this profile differs from the shape of uh, profiles uh, determined at one time in acidic medium. I'm sorry for that. So uh, we compared predicted mean in vivo dissolution profile with mean absorption profile to determine in vitro in vivo correlation. Uh, I will show you one example how we did it and how we confirmed this um, correlation. Uh, here uh, we had uh, enteric coated pellets to formulations uh, with black marks. Uh, there are absorption profiles shown on both graphs. With empty marks, there are dissolution profiles. On the left graph, you can see dissolution profiles which are determined considering only one time in a CDK video. You can easily see that it was not possible to describe absorption profiles uh, by uh, these profiles at only 
at one time in acidic media. Uh, the differences were quite uh, great. Uh, on the other side, when uh, calculated, determined uh, the solution for a different types of acidic media and calculated the weighted average the solution profile, we got very good similarity between uh, weighted average solution profiles and absorption profiles. And in this way, we confirmed very good in vitro in vivo correlation using the described procedure. Uh, to conclude, uh, when studying multiparticulate dosage forms with pH-dependent release, we must have in mind that, ga that gastric retention influences the release of drug, it influences the release in, in the acidic medium and also in the intestinal medium. It's possible. Uh, so we have to consider the gastric retention in the solution testing. And how do we do this? We determine the dissolution for each fraction emptied. Then uh, we weight each dissolution with the percentage of pellets in this fraction and calculate the sum of all these weighted profiles. So we obtain weighted average dissolution profile, or also we can call it predicted in vivo dissolution profile because it describes the real in vivo situation much better than in the case if we use only one time in the acidic medium. And by the described approach, we can get very good in vitro and vivo correlation in cases when gastric empty is a critical process uh, after administration of the dosage form. So that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be very glad to answer your questions. Dear uh, Maria Bogatai, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, only one question is possible. Who has question or remarks? Please. Thank you, Maria. Very interesting uh, result. Uh, in one of your first slides, you showed us that uh, there's a huge variability in terms of gastric emptying. Uh, but they also showed us that the pellets were between uh, 0.5 millimeters and 4.5 millimeters, almost half a centimeter. So how, isn't it an important factor in the model? Or must, shouldn't this be considered as an input? Thank you for your question and good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you hear me. You do? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, in, yes, in this graph, uh, the particle size was up to 4.5 4, 4 millimeters, but uh, later uh, for the developed model, also for calculation of uh, average model, uh, we used only the uh, smaller particles up to, I think, 1.8 millimeters. Because, uh, yes, the mechanism uh, changes uh, with the size and uh, theoretically, at least the explanation is such that up to two millimeters, uh, the gastric emptying uh, really follows this uh, regime that uh, I, I just showed you. Um, in every case, MMC cycle, we are, of course, we are talking about empty stomach. MMC cycle influences strongly the gastric emptying, but uh, uh, the size is important. And so for the developed model, we used only smaller sizes. But on this first figure, I showed you the whole profiles that we found in lit literature. There are not many profiles in literature, so we showed in the beginning all of them, but later we used only for smaller particles. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, thank you again for your presentation.
and uh, uh, the last uh, uh, presentation in this section uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, Philips University at Marburg. Uh, the title of the presentation, Their Drug Delivery, Novel Insights and New Perspectives. And the presenter is uh, uh, Cornelia Keck. Please uh, uh, add your presentation. I would like to welcome everyone to my presentation. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to present our newest results from Marburg. Before I start, I would like to shortly show you where I am located. So I'm from Germany and um, in Germany, I'm in the middle of Germany in Marburg, which is nearby Frankfurt. It's about one hour drive. So it's really worth coming to Marburg, I think. It's a very beautiful city. It's a very old city with a very nice scenery. And not only the city is old, also the university is very old. So we are heading towards the 500 years anniversary. And here you see our department. And in the next slide, you can see my little work group. And what you can see is that typically we are not only interested in German application and testing. Typically, we are doing nano carriers for improved drug delivery, so to increase the bioavailability of polysortable compounds. We have different platforms for this, and we started not being only interested in physical chemical properties. We also wanted to have very effective ex vivo models to test the biopharmaceutical efficacy. And in this way, we developed um, a model, especially a model for dermal penetration testing. And in my presentation today, I would like to show you first results, which are not related to nanocarriers, which are related to something sort of not really expected results. So the agenda for today is to give you first an overview of test methods being available for determination of the penetration efficacy. And then I would like to introduce you to the ex vivo porcine ear model. And after this, I will give you new insights into dermal penetration and new mechanisms we recently found. The test methods which can be used today are the Franz diffusion cells, tape stripping, and Raman spectroscopy. Each method has advantages but also disadvantages. So for the Franz diffusion cells, they are in vitro methods, and so they can be used with skin, but also with um, artificial membranes. The disadvantage is that there's very often a missing link between the in vitro data acquired and the real data you would get in an in vivo situation. The tape stripping, has many advantages. However, it's only the upper stratum corneum, so there will be no information on transdermal penetration. And Raman spectroscopy gives you a spectra, and if there is a compound penetrating, the shape of the spectra changes, and by this you can see how much and how deep a compound is penetrating. However, this is tedious work and is not working with every compound. In addition, this is the disadvantage of all those methods is that there's no skin response measurement or analysis, which means you don't have any idea of what is the response of the skin up in the treatment with your formulation. Of course, there are many methods being available today to assess skin properties. So method or examples are the TVL, corneometry, sapometry, fixture meter, mixer meter, so to assess the water content in skin, transepidermal water loss, the lipid content in skin, color, et cetera, et cetera. However, all those techniques are mainly used in vivo. So also here, there's a missing link between the in vitro, ex vivo, or in vivo data. So in contrast to this, this is the ex vivo porcine ear response model. So it's a very simple model. We use fresh porcine ears and we can acquire the skin properties by the skin probes we just um, saw before. And then we can apply formulations on that ear and we can see the penetration efficacy. But this is what I'm going to explain a little bit more in detail in the next slide. First, we measure the skin properties, then we apply 
the formulations on suitable skin areas. We treat the ear, for example, just using 32 degrees to simulate skin temperature. We can also use UV light, climate blocks, or other things. And after the treatment, we punch the skin at the treated areas. And those punches are then further processed um, by doing skin sections. And the skin sections are then um, observed by fluorescence microscopy, and what we get is images of the skin sections. Here's the stratum corneum, that would be the lower epidermis, and underneath here, that is the dermis. And then the very special thing of the technology is that we can do a digital image processing of those images, where we subtract the autofluorescence of the skin. So what is left behind after the threshold is actually the penetrated active compound and then can see in which direction it was penetrating, how much was penetrating can also be assessed in a semi-quantitative way by comparing blank formulations and formulations with other um, formulation principles. So at the end, we get numbers which give us information on the stratum corneum thickness, on the autofluorescence of the image and on the amount of penetrated active and the penetration depth. We can see um, the analysis a little bit closer in the next slide. So that's the image section. And we see here the dye is mainly localized in the stratum corneum and only a very vague penetration occurs through the stratum corneum. This is how the image looks like after the image processing. So only the penetrated active is visible, anything else is black. And from here we can acquire the so-called art value, which is the amount of penetrated molecules given as a mean gray value per pixel. And we can localize where the active compound was penetrating. So here, is mainly located in the stratum corneum and there's only a very poor penetration through deeper skin layers. To show you a little bit how we assess the data, here is um, one example, we call it is the wellness ear. So if you go to a beauty spa, cucumber is very well known to do positive things on skin. Curd, which is quark in German, is also famous to do something. And so we also used milk, sour cream, and medium chain triglycerides, which is often used in dermal formulations. And we looked what it does with skin. Here is the first example to see the differences. That's a non-treated skin section with a certain number or thickness of stratum corneum. And if you compare this this thickness to the skin section that has been treated with cucumber, you nicely see how much the cucumber is increasing stratum corneum thickness, meaning it hydrates the stratum corneum. So if you now compare all the different sections, then you see, okay, cucumber and there's differences to, for example, migliol. So we can measure all those thicknesses and we get concrete numbers out of this. And now we can transfer and compare to non-treated skin. So here, the cucumber increases stratum corneum thickness by almost 50%. And also you see that the migliol is increasing the stratum corneum thickness. However, we know there is no water, what we bring on the skin. So this effect can only be due to an indirect hydration, such as occlusion. In contrast, we have here the cucumber, which is directly hydrating the stratum corneum because there is no occlusive effect from the cucumber. At least we don't expect that to see. And what you now can see here is that there is a less pronounced increase in stratum corneum thickness from curd and milk. It still increases with an increase in lipid content. And here it decreases again. So the maximum can be obtained by sour cream, which means that's the mix between indirect hydration and direct hydration. So giving first information on what would be a nice lipid content to have skin hydration by a direct and indirect way. That is one thing, but the second one is the penetration. So here one sees the autofluorescence of the blank, put to or set to 100% and then can see that all the different treatments cause a lower um, fluorescence, which means there is a lower density in the or optical density in the sample, which can be explained by water, meaning the 
the optical density is diluted. And there is one exception, and that's milk. And the only difference between milk and all the other milk products is that milk is the only product which contains soluble milk protein, which are lost due to processing in all the other uh, milk products. So that is already published. So milk protein has a, the soluble milk protein has a certain um, out of fluorescence and we can directly measure it. So saying that if you apply milk on your skin, the soluble proteins will penetrate, which probably, and this is already known in cosmetics, have beneficial, pro, uh, pro, uh, beneficial um, properties on or in the skin, so to say. And now we use this um, model and we want to investigate what is the effect of different formulation principles and also different skin treatments on penetration efficacy and skin um, properties. So our first experiment was a very simple one. We used um, Vaselin, so petroleum jelly. We incorporated a lipophilic active and we wanted to show and prove that massage can improve the penetration. And then we wanted to do a special trick. So we thought, okay, we know that skin hydration is thought to increase the hydration of skin and hydrated skin is believed to further improve the dermal penetration efficacy. So what we did is we prehydrated skin on the porcine ear. And so we had moist skin and then we applied the formulation with massage. And we expected, of course, that both effects would super, superimpose each other, leading to the highest penetration efficacy. So that was our expectation without massage and increase with massage and the further increase with massage if the formulation would have been applied on prehydrated skin. However, the outcome was the opposite. So yes, we could improve the penetration of the active compound with massage, but if we applied the formulation with massage on hydrated skin, we obtained the opposite, so we reduced the penetration. So that was really unexpected, and we were searching for what would be the reason for this one. First, we looked at the skin images, and one can see, okay, that's without massage. The dye mainly localizes in the stratum corneum some transdermal penetration. If you apply with massage, then stratum corneum becomes a little bit rougher, probably due to the massage, and you see nicely that the dye is penetrating like in waves, and it goes mainly until the basal layer of the epidermis. And then, similar to here, there is some vague further penetration into deeper layers of the viable dermis. And in contrast, this is the skin section for the skin which has been pre hydrated before applying the formulation. And one can see, and that was really odd, the stratum corneal thickness is less. So prehydration caused the skin to dry out. And then here, the penetration is less. It comes or becomes a little bit more clear if one looks at the thresholded images. So it really looks different. And this is why we were wondering if there would be really a different penetration mechanism. So first we started to characterize the Vaseline and um, we did it with our fluorescence microscope, microscope. And here we have the possibility to look from the frog's perspective, which means from underneath the sample. So here would be the frog. And if the frog looks up to the sky, this is how we look at our sample. So we look in a position being similar to skin. And what one can see if you apply Vaseline on skin or the objective slide is that you see little liquid dots occurring. And that was not described in literature before. One only knows that um, Vaseline, if you have it in a shelf, can undergo cinerases, which means that the liquid paraffin bleeds out of the solid paraffins. And so what we can say is that those cinerases is not only occurring during storage, it also occurs on skin directly after application and it further processes the longer you wait. So our next question was now, what happens to the paraffin that was bleeding out from the Vaseline? And we thought maybe the paraffin penetrates into the skin. And of course we wanted to know that. And for this we did um, 
skin hydration measurements from lower parts in the stratum corneum. For this, we remove the upper layers of the stratum corneum by tape stripping and then used um, a corneometer to assess the skin hydration. And the skin hydration is measured by conductivity measurements, means if you have high water content, you have a high conductivity. And if you have a low water content, then you have a lower conductivity. And here one can nicely see that um, that would be the 100% the skin hydration. And if you apply the paraffin, then really you have a decrease in conductivity, which at least suggests that paraffin penetrates into the skin because paraffin is an insulator, which means there is no conductivity. And the Vaseline is in between. So that would fully confirm the theory because there's only little paraffin bleeding out. And this is why there's less penetration or at least one can expect that less paraffin is penetrating into the skin. And this is why it's just in between the non-treated skin and the paraffin treated skin. So in contrast, we also use prehydrated skin. So one could see that if you have paraffin, then you increase the skin hydration. And that can be explained by a occlusive effect. And by Vaseline, there was not really an effect, which means in the deeper skin layers, not in the upper layers, in the deeper, there was no effect. Again, suggesting that the paraffin penetrates into the skin a little bit and then holds more water in the um, lower layers of the dermis. So how would that affect skin penetration? There's more data I don't want to show you. I just want to show you the theory. So if this would be the stratum corneum, so it's composed of corneocytes and in between the corneocytes, we have the stratum corneum lipids. If we now hydrate the skin, then we can expect that there is a swelling of the stratum corneum and the distance between the corneocytes increases. Then, if we massage skin, we expect that the stratum corneum thickness, and we also measure the decreases. And then if you think of the stratum corneum like a sponge, then one can expect that the water can be squeezed out from the massage. So meaning the more water you have in the skin, the more you can squeeze out during massage. So what does mean to paraffin treated skin can be seen below. So if you apply paraffin on the skin and it penetrates the skin, then you will have the penetrated paraffin. It's here in green. And underneath the paraffin, you have water which cannot evaporate. So what we can expect is actually a water barrier. And if you massage in the paraffin, we can expect this paraffin penetrates deeper. So the water barrier occurs deeper. However, if you would have a hydrated stratum corneum, such as what we have on the prehydrated skin, one might expect that the fully soaked or water soaked skin squeezes out water, which means that the water barrier is now maybe on top of the skin. And now question is, how does that translate into dermal penetration? So think of that um, the NIRET is a lipophilic compound. So it dissolves nicely in paraffin and has not really a tendency to dissolve in hydrophilic compounds such as in water. So if, and this is what we expect, if the NIRET is dissolved in paraffin, and we could see that by light microscopy. And we have now proven that the paraffin penetrates the skin. So it's very obvious that one can expect that the NIRET penetrates with the paraffin into the skin. So that mechanism is described for oral administration and it's called solvent drag mechanism. So solvent drags in the active compound, which is dissolved in that solvent. So now, if we have a massage, then we can expect that the paraffin gets, goes deeper into the skin, which of course means that also the active which is dissolved in that paraffin goes deeper into the skin. If we have hydrated skin and we can assume that the water barrier is on top of the skin, then of course the paraffin does not penetrate because of the barrier. And with that also the NIRET would not penetrate. And so this theory would fully be supported by the data we have so far. But of course, 
we wanted to prove our theory, and this is why we conducted a proof of concept study. Um, so first experiment was to put the lipophilic active into the Vaselin, and now we used a hydrophilic active and we put it into the Vaselin and we did exactly the same experiment. And here are the results. So these are the results you saw before. It's the amount of penetrated active and that's the penetration depth. So NIRED lipophilic active ingredient increased with massage and decreased with um, application on wet skin. And just the opposite you can see for the hydrophilic compounds so with massage, you get a decrease because the active compound is not dissolved in the paraffin. This is localized as a suspended active in the vaselin, which does not penetrate. However, if you put it on, hydro, on, on um, moist skin, you have a lot of water. And if you have a hydrophilic active compound, then of course it can nicely dissolve. And this is why you increase the penetration. So meaning this little experiment proved our theory and we can now say, that active compounds enter the skin via a solvent track mechanism. And that, of course, what not, was not really known before our experiment. So meaning that if we look at the different um, pathways which are known today for dermal penetration, so we know we have passive diffusion through the stratum corneum and the epidermis into the viable layers, which is believed to occur due to passive diffusion. We have, of course, penetration via the hair follicles or other glands such as the sweat glands. And if we now look for the passive diffusion through the stratum corneum, we have two different mechanisms that are proposed today. So one is the intercellular route and the other one is the transcellular route. And if you look into the literature, many people say that the intercellular route is the more likely one to occur. And now if we look a little bit closer on the intercellular route, then we can follow um, Professor Neubert from Halle, who proposed that our intercellular lipid layer, you can see it here enlarged, is composed of um, it's um, of composed of ceramides and free fatty acids and cholesterol, cholesterol sulfate mainly. And so those compounds arrange each other in the way that we have hydrophobic and hydrophilic, so to say, channels, or we call it street. So we can say we have a oil street and a water street. And depending, that's at least the theory, on the molecular properties of the active compound, they penetrate either via the apolar route, which is the oil street, or they cross the, the bilayer via the aqueous route, which is the water street. And so that's sort of old knowledge, but we, we think that's true, and we would like to add um, some new ideas to it. So we have now simplified the this, um, B layer concept. So that's the corneocyte. And between the corneocytes, we have our lipid bilayers. And so we have that oil streets and we have water streets. So now thinking what can we do by putting something on top of the skin? And of course, you can hydrate the stratum corneum. We have seen it, so it swells. And we now think also that we can improve the, or the thickness of the water channel. So we increase the route for hydrophilic actives. And in contrast, one can also think if we have something oily, what we put on the skin, it probably opens the oil streets, so to say. And here's our first experiment. So we added glycerol, which is a hygroscopic compound. And we assume if you apply it in water, so we use 10%, then it should enter the water street and it should moisturize the stratum corneum. And with this, it should open the water channels, increasing the penetration of hydrophilic compounds. And yes, we could see it, it's a significant increase by 5%. So that's an increase, but it's not really tremendous. We also speculated that we have um, a change in the penetration route if we add a surfactant. 
surfactant is a micelle or is um, an amphiphytic compound and forms micelles if you add the surfactant above the critical micelle concentration. And we did so, and we did it either. So what we used is micelles or surfactants that form oil in water micelles so that the hydrophilic um, part of the surfactant is outside and the lipophilic one is inside. And what is also known that micelles can encapsulate lipophilic compounds. And what we could found is what you see here. So if you add lipophilic compounds to micelles, you can increase the penetration. That's always two thirds. So that's a very strong impact. And what we think is that a lipophilic compound typically would go via the old street into the skin. But if you add surfactants, then you add a second route of administration or penetration by micellization of the lipophilic active. And then the micelles, because outside they are hydrophilic, would go via the water street into the skin. And in contrast, one see it here, so it's minus 30%. If you add micelles to a hydrophilic active, which is dissolved in the water phase, you decrease the penetration. And we explain this one by a solvent replacement, which means that if you replace the solvent in which an active compound is dissolved, so the volume which penetrates into the skin is smaller. And this is why, because you know the, the micelles penetrate instead of the solvent, and this is why you decrease the amount of penetrated active. And also here, the effect is tremendous. And what we also have seen, it seems to be that the penetration of active compounds is competitive, which means if you have many different molecules dissolved in one solvent, then of course, it's like, you know, 10 molecules compete for the penetration. If you have only one molecule, you can have 10 molecules of that chemical compound. So therefore, if you want to have an effect or effective penetration of one specific active compound, the formulation should not contain many other compounds that are dissolved in the same phase. In addition to solvent track mechanisms and solvent replacement by micelles and other compounds, we could also found or show that um, a formulation, of course, of the topical application will change. So what at least happens is that water evaporates, meaning that the formulation dries out. And so what we could show is that remember or thinking of a particle which is suspended in a liquid, in aqueous liquid, is applied on skin. So over time, the liquid, the water will evaporate. And then what we could show is that between the particle and the skin, an aqueous meniscus is forming. And that meniscus really forces a very local penetration phenomenon. So think the first um, way what happens is that the stratoconium due to a longer contact with water, the swell locally. And a swollen stratum corneum typically increases passive diffusion of active molecules. In addition, think of that um, the water phase can or might contain active dissolved molecules. So by having that aqueous meniscus, you have a high local concentration gradient, which of course forces the active compound to penetrate into the skin. And we could now prove that this is really a tremendous influence. So without any humectant, you have an increase by 60% due to the addition of particles. And if you have water and glycerol as aqueous phase, then you can further increase the penetration efficacy of a hydrophilic compound just by adding particles. So in conclusion, it means that if you apply formulations on skin, the dermal penetration is composed of at least three different steps. The first step is the solvent track mechanism and solvent replacement or competitive penetration of different molecules that are all dissolved in one phase. And also the penetration of liquids from the formulation can modify the skin properties, which then influence the second step. 
The second step is passive diffusion. So that's the classical textbook knowledge. The active compound penetrates from the dermal formulation into the skin, depending on the concentration gradient. So, and then finally, we have that third step, and that's the local penetration phenomenon. We think there is more. One example we could already discover, and this is, we call it the particle-assisted penetration enhancement. So, of course, we think that's new findings, and they might be very important. However, it's only a starting point and so much more research needs now to be done in this regard. Despite the different penetration mechanisms, we could also show that mechanical skin treatment can have a tremendous influence on the penetration efficacy. And I want to shortly present those data as well. So what we could show is that massage and sonication can tremendously decrease penetration. Demapression and tape stripping with remove um, parts of the stratum corneum are very efficient in increasing penetration efficacy and also micro needling such as with a derma roller can nicely increase the penetration efficacy. And um, what is the cause of a reduced penetration upon massage and sonication? And this is what we can see here. It's a decrease in the stratum corneum thickness because one squeezes the, the stratum corneum together and by having the corneal seeds closer to each other would mean, of course, that the, the streets in between, if you consider transcellular penetration, are smaller. And that, of course, decreases the flux of the active compounds through the stratum corneum. What was also very interesting in our study, so tape stripping has been reported by the Lademann group to be reduced by about 33% after tape stripping and we could exactly prove um, this value by our technique. So nicely showing that there is a correlation between the different techniques. So finally, it is important to, to note that of course skin treatment, different vehicles and also different skin conditions are superimposing each other, finally leading to strongly different um, skin penetration results. So here is one um, example of our first results. So we use different active ingredients, hydrophilic ones, lipophilic ones. We use different vehicles different emulsifiers and we use different skin conditions such as hydration and lipid content and um, we use different mechanical treatment in this case massage and here is um, one part of the result so if we have an lipophilic active compound one can see that um, the type of vehicle we used is not really of course it is this is at least um, twofold here but um, it's not too tremendous, but the, um, the, the type of skin condition seems to be very important for penetration efficacy. And that was especially the case for um, compounds or formulations that contained surfactants. So the micelle theory is highly important for lipophilic compounds. In contrast, we found that um, the type of vehicle, so either hydrogel or creams with different um, lipid content, strongly influence the penetration efficacy of a hydrophilic compound. So we could prove the theory or the knowledge that lipophilic compounds penetrate better than hydrogel hydrophilic ones, but here we see that um, Vaseline was very poor for the penetration of a hydrophilic compound, whereas the hydrophilic hydrogel was very efficient for the penetration. And that is in contrast to current knowledge, which says if you want to have a perfect penetration, one should suspend an active compound in the vehicle that would actually foster dermal penetration. So it might be true for the lipophilic compound, but definitely it is not true for hydrophilic compounds. So that is really adding new knowledge to the current knowledge in our field. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. So I could hopefully convince you that the ex vivo porcelain ear model, which also responds to treatment in regard to skin properties, is highly sensitive and a very suitable model to determine the penetration efficacy. It has a physiological setup. It can deliver time and space resolved penetration data, and it can give you response measurements in regard to skin um, properties. Then. Um, answering the question of the title, so 
active ingredients progress from the cream into the skin via a three-step process. The first step is a solvent track mechanism and a competitive penetration with other compounds or and micelles. Then the second step is passive diffusion as described in the textbook. And the third part is a particle assisted penetration or other phenomena that occur upon evaporation and changes of your formulation that has been applied on the skin. So with that new knowledge, even though there's a lot of things that need to be investigated in the future, there is hope that um, for the future, we can develop tailor-made topical formulation with really penetration profiles we really want to have. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And what you see here is a porcelain ear after a long working day. On, on the right hand side, you see my work group and I would like to thank each member for its contribution to this new data and I would like to thank you again for your um, attention and I'm now happy to take the questions. Thank you very much, dear Cornelia Keck. Uh, it was a very nice and interesting presentation. Uh, we have to take the time. Only one question is possible. If there is any question remarks, please, Professor Schnitowska. So well, thank you very much, uh, Cornelia, for the news from the uh, battlefield uh, of the percutaneous absorption. And uh, my question is like, every, uh, every, any time on this, uh, on this occasion, uh, what about the correlation in vitro in vivo and the correlation animal and uh, human skin? Uh, did you ever try this first experiment that you presented with uh, in vitro human skin, or what is your opinion about this um, condition, skin condition? Yes, uh, because even if you take this uh, pig's uh, uh, ear, um, then you have some problems with the condition uh, of the stratum corneum, and then you don't equilibrate as I understand, yes. Thank you very much for the nice question. So um, you, you nailed it. It's um, when we started with our experiment, we were not we were not aware on how sensitive these are. So it is very important that we um, have the same condition, and um, the best what we can do is really have it in one run. So if we want to compare different samples, we have it on one week because the ears are highly changeable. So depending on season, they can be more hydrated, they can be stressed, which um, influences the autofluorescence and so forth and so forth. And also the, the, um, the hydration, which occurs during the incubation is highly important. We just found it. So um, the environment makes a lot for the skin hydration. And then if you have um, a formulation on top of that skin, then you can have hydration from the environment and you can have um, hydration from, from the skin. And that all influences the output. Um, still, I think that the model we have at the moment is the most sensitive and the most um, related one to real physiological conditions that would occur in vivo on humans. And why is this so? If you look for Franz diffusion cells, then um, we have to um, remove the skin. And depending on what sort of experiment you want to do, you have to, um, to use different thicknesses of the skin. And um, so when we use the skin for Franz diffusion experiments and we put it under the microscope with our technology, we can see how the skin has been modified and that is not in a good way. So you typically squeeze the skin and you move it in different direction. So it's more or less a membrane, which is not really representing skin conditions. And on top of what we found with the Franz diffusion cells is that um, the output you can get can be really misleading because um, especially if you have particles, the particles can settle. And of course they would settle on an in vivo setup as well. But in case of a Franz diffusion cell, what you have is that um, the membrane or the skin is soaked with your dispersion medium or your solvent or acceptor medium 
And typically you have sync conditions and the sync conditions would mean if you have a particle that gets in contact with the membrane, it gets in contact with the solvent as well. So it will actually create different results than you would have in an, you know, physiological setup because then the skin is not soaked with solvent. And we saw it, so we really got contrary or just opposite results to what we have from Franz diffusion cell to our ex vivo model. So this is what we can say. So we think our model is much better than the Franz diffusion cell. However, what we do not yet have is really a correlation between ex vivo and our um, in vivo model, so to say. And um, so we are trying to do so. And of course, we I'm not a doctor or so, and this is why we the ethical improvement in all those things to do really in vivo data is not so easy. But we want to start a cooperation with um, people from France, actually cosmetics industry, they do such experiments. And so there is hope for the future that we can provide such data. But of course, that will take time and it's a lot of work because of ethics and all those things. But yes, it's important, but at the moment, not yet. Does it answer the question? Thank you very much uh, again uh, for you and for all presenter uh, this section. Uh, I close this section and uh, 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 the next section will be start five minutes later uh, ha uh, after uh, three o'clock, five minutes after three o'clock. So it is my great pleasure to chair this afternoon's session. And I thank Professor Smitowska and especially for this opportunity and especially for this perfect organization of the, of the first actually uh, Central European Symposium on Pharmaceutical Technology in a hybrid uh, format. So this afternoon we have uh, three oral presentations I know that this is a difficult session because of, uh, I mean, postprandial situation that is not affecting only the solution experiments, but also our attention. But I'm sure the, the presenters will enjoy us. So um, the first speaker is Elenia D'Abruzzo, freshly starting her PhD in chemistry in the joint school uh, between University of Trieste and uh, Ca' Foscari, the University of Venice. Her research topic is mechanochemical activation of APIs. And now, as uh, Elenia, uh, the audience is yours. Good morning and thanks for this opportunity. Today, I would like to talk to you about my project thesis that was the role of curality on the formation of multi-component crystalline solids containing vimposetine. Vimposetine is a crystalline active ingredient with a strong neuroprotective effect. In fact, it increases the cerebral flow in the ischemic areas, and so it is used against brain ischemia in patients with cerebrovascular diseases. It has a weak basic character showing a pKa of 7.3 and limited aqueous solubility, highly dependent on pH. Moreover, it's a chiral compound that presents two chiral centers. So the aim of this project was to create a multi-component system in order to improve raw impositin dissolution profile. Multi-component systems are mainly divided in hydrate solvates containing both the active ingredient and water or other solvents in, in the same crystal lactic structure, salts, compounds with a definite stoichiometry consisting of an ionizable active ingredient and a molecular or atomic canterium, co-crystals, crystalline solids formed by two or more different molecular or and ionic compounds linked through non-covalent interactions where at least one molecule should be in the neutral form, and amorphous dispersion that presents random atomic structure and a short range order of molecules oriented in different directions. 
Malic acid was chosen as a suitable conformer due to its low toxicity and because of its weak acid character and its high aqueous solubility. Moreover, also this acid presents a chiral center. So it was also possible to investigate the role of chirality on the formation of the multi-component system since vimpocetin was crystallized in the presence of each enantioma in the racemic form of the acid. Multi-component systems were first obtained by solution-based crystallization, and it was chosen a classical method of crystallization, such as low evaporation of some solvents, which were ethyl acetate, acetone, acetonitrile, and ethanol, selected according to solubility values of raw materials and polarity in order to understand if an increase in polarity values may provide different outcomes. Subsequently, it was also performed a solid state crystallization technique, such as mechanochemistry, to understand if a change in the type of process or energies involved could lead to the same results obtained with solution based methods. There were mainly performed neat grinding, characterized by the complete absence of liquid and lower mechanochemical energy, and liquid assisted grinding where the solvents used were the same of solution crystallization plus exan. Then the solids obtained were analyzed through the main solid state characterization techniques, such as X-ray diffraction, differential scanning calorimetry, and optical and thermal microscopy. The solution tests were finally performed. Starting from slow evaporation methods, it was possible to observe that when vimpocetin crystallized in the presence of L enantiomer of malic acid, crystalline solids were obtained, while in the presence of both the enantiomer and the racemic form of malic acid, the formation of gels was observed, regardless the type of solvent used and the change in their polarity values. Moreover, with some solvents, it was possible to obtain single crystals suitable for single crystal X-ray diffraction analysis. The optical observation of the single crystal synthesized seemed to be in line with the BFDH morphology obtained with CCDC software mercury, which was used to understand the main crystallographic aspects of the new multi-component system. The new system was a monoclinic system showing a P21 space group. The new solid presents interactions between the vimpocetin nitrogen group in position four and one of the carboxylic group of malic acid. There are also secondary stabilizing interactions among malic acid molecules. Chemically, the system is probably a salt since the difference of pKa between base and acid is 3.79. And it is well known from literature that salts require a proton transfer that occurs when the difference of pKa is higher than 3. So the two molecules seem to form ionic interactions, but more advanced characterization techniques are required to confirm the protonation. Passing to solids obtained by neat grinding, the SC analysis didn't show endothermic peaks in the case of using the enantioma and the racemic form of malic acid for crystallization. On the contrary, it showed an exothermic event that is probably a recrystallization phenomenon, followed by a definite point of fusion that is typical of crystalline solids. So, it is possible to hypothesize that the administration of heat accelerates the reorganization and crystallization process of the molecules of the system in positive L malic acid. In fact, PXRD analysis confirmed the SC results. At room temperature, all three multi-component systems, both the ones with each enantioma and the one with the racemic form of the acid showed similar X-ray diffraction patterns that contain no crystalline diffraction peaks, 
showing only a few broader peaks that probably refers to traces of unreacted vimpocetin. So, in the case of nit brining, even the system consisting of vimpocetin and l malic acid that is known to form crystalline systems doesn't create crystalline products as, in all three cases, amorphous dispersions are obtained. Considering radar liquid assisted grinding, in particular in the presence of exon, through DSC characterization, I obtained the following results. When mimpocetin was grinded in the presence of l malic acid, it was possible to obtain the new multi-component system in the crystalline form, regardless the four quantities of liquid used. As we can see on the thermogram, four peaks overlapping each other that present a different point of fusion from raw materials. In the case of using the enantiomer of malic acid for grinding, no amount of liquid was able to promote crystallization, since the thermogram doesn't present any peak of fusion. In this case, the four multi-component systems seem to be amorphous dispersion. On the contrary, when using the racemic form of the acid, vimpocetin crystallization followed a strange behavior. With lower quantities of liquid, no peaks were observed. With higher quantities of liquid, a partially crystalline solid was obtained. This result confirmed the fact that in the case of racemic mixtures, vimpocetin preferentially crystallizes with the L enantiomer. However, the DSC analysis revealed a lower melting point due to the significantly lower quality of crystal and the dispersion in an amorphous matrix formed by vimpocetin and demelic acid. These results were also confirmed through powder X-ray diffraction. In this slide, I would like to show a summary of the results obtained by various lag liquids used. Lag reaction led to the formation of crystalline system in the case of vimpocetin and l enantiomer of the acid regardless the type and the quantity of liquid used, while amorphous products were obtained when the d enantiomer was used. In the case of using the racemic form, only partially crystalline solids were obtained. In some cases, it wasn't possible to characterize with solid state characterization techniques the obtained products because, especially with d enantiomer and the racemic mixture, the change of the liquid used and so an increase in polarity values led to a change in the aspect of the products obtained, passing from powder to pesty sticky materials. Finally, the solution tests of raw vimpocetin and of multi-component systems were performed in non-sync conditions due to the very low aqueous solubility of vimpocetin. As it is possible to see, Vimpocetin gave a dissolution profile that is typical of poorly soluble substances. After two hours of this solution, vimpocetin concentration is equal to 0.53 mg liter with a standard deviation of 0.20, corresponding to 1.5% of the maximum concentration reachable. In the second scheme, we can visualize the solution profiles of the four different systems obtained by the mixture of vimpocetin and l malic acid. The green profile is the physical mixture. The single crystal obtained through solution-based crystallization is the red profile. The crystalline powder obtained by lag is the black profile. And the amorphous dispersion obtained by nit grinding is the yellow profile. These four products showed all a significant improvement of the dissolution profile of raw vimpocetin, even if these profiles were very different when compared to each other. For example, the single crystal, that is the red profile, showed a very, very slow precipitation of the dissolved vimpocetin, probably due to the big dimensions of the crystal. But the most interesting thing 
was that the dissolution profile of the crystalline multi-component solid, that is the black profile, was superior compared to the amorphous product, that is the yellow profile, highlighting the importance of the physical status of the materials. In fact, there are several studies ongoing to understand this particular behavior. First of all, particle size measurement has to be considered since it could possibly affect the dissolution outcomes. However, all four products showed a similar plateau concentration that is about four or five times that of raw impositine. And so they all show an improvement of the dissolution profile of the raw material. In conclusion, the multi-component system seems to show an enantiospecific behavior, but through solution-based and mechanochemical crystallization, only the solid consisting of bimposetin and L-malic acid crystallizes, while the solid containing the malic acid gives amorphous dispersions. Using racemic mixture gives only partially crystalline solids. Different solid forms, either crystalline or amorphous, show a significant improvement of the dissolution profile when compared to each other and raw impositin. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Ilenia. And now uh, the lecture is open for this discussion from the we with uh, questions from from the audience here or from the online audience no <laughs> no questions okay maybe a little question for elenia is elenia all online yes online. can you hear me okay i'm not able to see you okay <laughs> okay what what kind of um, uh, characterization are you planning to to do for investigating the, the kind of, uh, of interaction among the impositing and malic acid. Uh, I mean, if it, whether it is a sort or, a, or maybe the uh, hydrogen bond. Sure. Uh, first, thanks for the question. And uh, we are planning to do probably solid state NMR because in this type of characterization techniques, we can uh, visualize eventually a protonation and so a chemical shift of the nitrogen group of vimpocetin and so a shift at uh, values, higher values of PPM if a protonation occurs. So if, uh, the, if is the uh, protonation, probably we can, uh, we can say that uh, a salt, uh, it is formed. Can you hear me? You. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think is enough. Oh, oh also another question from our president. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your work. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you about uh, bioavailability of uh, binpositin uh, from the tablets. What is actual uh, the level of bioabsorption? Uh, and because the dose is only five milligrams, yes, and uh, to which uh, BCS class it belongs? Uh, the bioavailability is very, very low. It is 6.7%. Uh, seven, uh, so uh, it is why we first choose to, to form a multi-component system. Ilenia, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we now move on to the second presentation. So, thank you all. Hi, hi, thank you. Now the second uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Barbara Mikolasik. 
Dr. Barbara Mikolashev uh, after a PhD in pharmacy with a dissertation about transdermal patches and some period abroad uh, as a visiting professor in Sweden, if, I, if I'm correct, at the Gothenburg Uni uh, Chalmers University of Technology. She currently holds the position of assistant professor at the Pharmaceutical Technology Department at the Medical University of Dansk. So uh, today she is presenting us uh, a lecture about the effect of a liquid phase on the diffusivity of polyacrylic adhesive dantermal patches, one of her research interests. So please. The audience is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I'll just check whether everything works. Yes, thank you very much for uh, your nice introduction. Yes, I'm a member of uh, Professor Shintoska uh, Research Group, and my uh, research interest is strictly related um, uh, to my PhD thesis, which was on the development of transdermal delivery systems. But for the, with the further research, we decided to focus a bit more uh, on the uh, diffusivity phenomena that is crucial for uh, the development of this kind of uh, dosage forms. Um, maybe I'll switch that. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to put everyone uh, in the perspective what we are uh, working on nowadays, because the project I'm going to present is still ongoing. Uh, so there are still a lot of questions. So I will provide you more with more questions rather than answers. Uh, anyhow, uh, today we and yesterday uh, from Professor Polak and from uh, Professor Keck, we've heard uh, a, a lot about the uh, importance of the sorry, of the uh, skin permeation stage uh, on the, um, for such a delivery systems. But what we are working on more, uh, we are interested uh, in the delivery system itself. And to be more precise, we are interested in the polymers that are being used to produce them. Uh, this class of polymers is called pressure sensitive adhesives. And the design that is right now being developed uh, by the manufacturer is called a drug in adhesive. So in general, it's a very simple system. So the drug is uh, in dissolved, either dispersed in the polymeric matrix, which is supposed to stay in a constant contact with the skin surface, because this is like a crucial parameter to achieve uh, a permeation. Uh, to assess the performance uh, of this particular uh, polymer, uh, the drug release is, uh, in, so in vitro testing, it's a main uh, experiment we can conduct to actually assess the diffusivity on this stage. Uh, there are two classes of polymers that are being uh, used nowadays for the development of uh, this um, uh, approach, uh, polyacrylates, which I will talk a bit uh, more today, and polydimethyloxiloxans, which we also investigate, but I'm not going to talk about them uh, today. Uh, anyhow, uh, what I'm going to show today is uh, how the question we had. Uh, we wanted to, uh, using a, a model drug, indometacine, we wanted to assess the diffusivity properties of three different uh, polymers, polyacrylate polymers. And um, later on, we were also interested how the liquid additives uh, can alter, change, help to us to control uh, this diffusion process. Uh, what we chose, we chose five um, excipients, which are sometimes commonly used uh, in this sort of uh, preparations, as uh, for instance, isopropyl meristate, uh, or uh, polyethylene glycol and uh, propylene glycol, which are considered as a permeation and chances. So what we are changing is the skin permeability, but not, not the, the physicity itself is not considered in this stage. And also we used uh, plasticizers, which are also uh, very commonly, might theoretically be commonly used to uh, change the diffusivity um, in the matter of uh, changing 
altering the, uh, the mobility of the polymer chain, which could result also in a modified release. Uh, as it goes for, of course, the compatibility between all of those uh, excipients, uh, it was done in the preliminary research, and some part of it is also presented uh, by my colleague in the poster presentation. Uh, so we've selected uh, three uh, polyacrylates, which were provided by the manufacturers. And uh, my colleague presented mostly the micron macroscopic evaluation of the structure, uh, some uh, in vitro adhesion tests, which are also crucial for the performance of those patches, and cohesion, which also is a first indicator whether we can create such a dosage for form or not. Um, as for the first state of the research, we checked the diff diffusivity of three selected polymers. What they differed mostly was the functional group within the main chain uh, of the um, main chain of the um, polymer. Uh, also, some additives such as uh, crosslinkers were also added by the manufacturer. Plus, of course, the solvent was uh, present in the mixture. Um, we've created our patches with uh, casting and evaporation technique. So basically the active substance was mixed with selected polymer, cast it, dried to create uh, reproducible patches of a thickness of 200 micrometers and comparable in the medicine uh, concentration, which was crucial for further assessment of uh, the solution test. Uh, the patches that we've obtained, they were evaluated with the, the digital microscopy, uh, which we confirmed that uh, no crystals or uh, recrystallization is uh, occurring on the surface or within the whole patch. And also uh, electron microscopy all, uh, allowed us to assess the surface of the patch, which is also uh, plays a crucial role uh, further on uh, in the performance of the material, which we've also explored in our publications before. Uh, for DT2 polymer, uh, we had a very smooth surface, whether for those two, uh, there were some cracks visible on the surface, but we will move back to that. Uh, as for the release rate uh, experiment, uh, we used uh, paddle over disk uh, methodology uh, with the uh, buffered acceptor fluid. And what we've noticed uh, that in the case of indomethacin, uh, the uh, slope the, 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 the shape of the curve uh, that we've obtained, uh, they are very similar, but uh, overall uh, amount of uh, uh, release in the medicine varies. And when we had a closer look, the most crucial part was at the beginning of the process. So the diffusion still couldn't have been that advanced. Uh, so there was something on the surface, probably we've presumed, that might have caused uh, such an issue. So, uh, but firstly, to assess whether we are dealing only with the diffusion process, or maybe there's something else gardening the whole process, uh, we've uh, made uh, some mathematical modeling uh, where we confirmed with the, uh, the, the whole process uh, undergoes the thick diffusion law, uh, and uh, the diffusivity parameters are recalculated here. As you can see, they differed for those two classes. Uh, but as I said, we were wondering about the beginning of the uh, dissolution curve, because the slope was much, much steeper. And that's why we did detailed Raman imaging uh, on the, of the first surface. So what we did, we examined the patches before the experiment and after it. Uh, what we are looking at, uh, those are the maps of the surface of the patch, but we have to consider it that it's like a depth of the analysis around one micrometer. Um, so we can clearly see that the uh, initial, uh, we can try to compare those two images. Uh, in DT2, we have presumably the highest uh, uh, concentration superficially located. But it's like what we are most interested in, that there is a huge change before and after the solution process. So clearly uh, the uh, drug is um, superficially um, removed uh, from the surface. 
Um, later on, we started to modify uh, our polymers with uh, some additives. And because of the shortage of the time, I'll just stick with first of the polymers, the one that had the nicest curve, um, DT2. Uh, as we can see, uh, we've, in all cases, we've improved the dissolution rate. But if we, when we started once again to compare uh, and analyze the slope, once again, we can see that the beginning has the most contribution to the overall um, process. Uh, once again, we've moved with the Raman analysis, which was quite a surprise what we've achieved. Well, first of all, uh, since uh, those two, uh, isopropyl meristate and polyethylene glycol, uh, we've expected there superficially, there has to be increase in the concentration of the active substance because of the original research that we did. And that fits nice the, uh, the theory. But if we start, when we started looking deeper, uh, as it goes for the DT2 polymer itself, the concentration of the active substance located superficially is much, much higher that uh, in case of PG, where uh, superficially there was almost nothing as it goes from the concentration, and also for the plasticizers, uh, also uh, the concentration was much, much lower. So we started to think, started to analyze, is there any pattern that we can actually spot what's going on? Because the, all of those excipients, they uh, differ quite dramatically uh, in the parameters such as um, um, the chemical character, uh, the molecular weight, and so on and so forth. So we were trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, later on, we've decided um, to have a, once again closer look to the surface of the patch itself. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we've made a very detailed uh, examination of the microstructure uh, of the polymer surface with scanning electron microscopy. Uh, we've examined the cross sections that you can see in the lower low row and the surface. Um, so we could compare it with Raman mapping of the active substance. And what we saw was that uh, each of the excipients um, um, altered the surface in a slightly different way. Uh, only in case of um, those typical plasticizers, uh, the, the surface is much, much smoother that's, uh, that in, in comparison to the pure polymer. But in case of uh, propylene glycol and uh, polyethylene glycol and isopropyl meristate, uh, the changes related superficially are much more pronounced. Uh, as I remind you, for propylene glycol, the increase in the solution rate was uh, the lowest, plus uh, in Raman mapping, we saw very, very little of the active substance located superficially. Uh, and in the Raman, uh, sorry, in uh, electron microscopy microgram, we can see there are like flakes overlaying each other. Uh, we presume that uh, this is like the cause, like the uh, actor of the substance is located superficially after uh, below this structure, which we are going to uh, analyze later on with the cross section. Uh, but uh, in the most interesting case was from polyethylene glycol and um, isopropyl meristate. Uh, as we can see on the surface, we do have like those waves. And we started to wonder whether it might explain why do we have such an increased concentration of the active substance? Uh, after all, the concentration of the active substance within the whole matrix should be uh, homogeneous. But uh, when we took uh, more detailed measurements, uh, it might be that this increased concentration that we are observing in Raman is actually uh, because of the increased uh, surface area of this uh, waved uh, surface in case of isopropylase uh, and um, polyethylene glycol. Uh, either way, uh, later on we are uh, planning to have a, a further examination of the cross-section with Raman to see how the profile goes uh, inside. Um, as to conclude, um, 
first of all, um, the diffusivity of the uh, polyacrylate for indomethacin. We've shown that it varies among, might vary, even among the pure polymer itself. Uh, also, the uh, imaging techniques can contribute with some additional data that might uh, give some clue how to explain the differences that we are observing in the dissolution profile uh, on the early stage of the development of the, of the formulation. And also uh, that uh, probably the mechanism of the promotion uh, of the drug uh, is actually um, uh, guarded by the interaction that we have between film forming polymer and the TFTIC additive because of the um, uh, because of the alteration of the structure. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that our research is funded partially by a national science center. And I also like to acknowledge the cooperation uh, with uh, Dr. Gustav Strankowska from the University of Gdańsk, who helps us with mathematical modeling, and our master's students. Uh, and the research was performed with the equipment that is available to us, uh, thanks to a farm microtech core facility that uh, runs within our department. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara, for this nice, very nice presentation. And now the session is open for, for uh, questions from the audience here or maybe online. They are shy. <laughs> Um, I don't know how to ask this question. It will be probably longer than 15 minutes, but uh, do you, do you I, know what? Sorry, could you take the mask because I can't understand what you're saying. Thank sure. you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, I'm allowed to take off my mask. That's, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, um, no, I'm not in a position no, to no, grant no, no. <laughs> permission. <laughs> No joking anymore. Um, Me too. <laughs> so my, my question will be probably like 15 minutes long, but I'll, I'll try to make it as, as short as possible. Do you know what is happening with those polymers uh, inside the polymer, if you know what I mean? So how the degradation occurs, for example, because yes. as every single polymer, when, when it is diffused by water or any other solvent, changes its structure. So it de uh, degrades into the oligomers and monomers. I would say this can be the most important parameter or element which influences the behavior of the indomethacin or any other API, which is inside this, you know, cross-linked polymer. Um, so did you did you try to understand what's going on inside this polymer? Yes. So uh, the answer to this question would take me like uh, two hours. I hope for the discussion <laughs> after the session. Yes, but I'm trying to take it short because otherwise my colleague will um, choke me later on that I've crossed the time. Uh, anyhow, yes, uh, the, what uh, you're thinking about is that the release mechanism is guarded by the process called erosion. So that some of some part of the active substance, uh, its, the, its um, the solution is promoted by the fact that parts of the polymer uh, are being released to the release medium itself. So, yeah, of course, it has to be considered. Uh, as it goes for the pure polyacrylate polymers, so we've examined their swelling abilities and the erosion when exposed to a different um, preparations. So, uh, I would say that the quantity of the polymer that is missing is so small that we even cannot detect it. Uh, even the spectroscopic analysis shows that uh, the basic polymer structure is not being altered that much. But the situation changes dramatically when we are starting to, to add additives such as low molecular um, compounds as I presented today. So all of the those um, um, permeation enhancers, the uh, plasticizers and so on and so forth because they are not chemically bonded to the main polymer that creates a film of a transdermal patch. Yes, so they are uh, bounded mostly by uh, um, physical uh, interactions. Uh, and uh, we've observed slight uh, increase in the swallowability in case of especially polyethylene glycol. But uh, it's not in the quantity that would explain such an increased uh, dissolution. Uh, and for instance, in, in the case of isopropyl myristate, there is no erosion at all. 
So uh, everything that we've put it, misoprobin myristate, is very nicely mixed and stays in the patch itself. So I would say that to answer to your question, it depends. It depends on the excipients. Uh, and of Science course- Science is relative, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So, um, and of course, it also uh, we are, depends on the uh, inactivity of the polymer. But I would say that even if, because you've asked about the monomers uh, from the polymeric structure, some are present, of course, because this is like a leftover after the manufacturing process. But I've never encountered uh, research that actually um, examined how many of the monomers are being produced while the experimentation, either on the skin surface uh, or in the in vitro model. So that part I cannot answer. Okay, second very quick question. Did you, did you monitor pH? of the medium used for the yeah well uh, for, we've tested our materials with a wide range of uh, ph starting with uh, the one mimicking a skin surface uh, uh, in this case of this particular research we used a ph of 7.4 because this is like uh, um, condition that is crucial to have sync condition in the experimental mode. Of course, if you're thinking, I presume, about uh, uh, trying to imply our research into uh, how this formulation will act uh, in vivo after application of the skin, uh, I wouldn't make such an estimation. It is possible. Uh, we, uh, Can I just stop yeah. you here just, just, just for sure. a second? So what, what I was wondering, whether the pH changes uh, over the time or not? Uh, or over time, you mean? Buffered and how stable is the pH? Uh, you mean after or during the, the whole process? Yeah. Uh, so Reads. we are, uh, we are um, uh, uh, during the experimentation, we are, of course, monitoring how the, because the experiment uh, lasts for 48 hours. So uh, randomly, uh, samples are being examined for the pH as well and they are almost always checked at the end of the, the solution process. Um, is, does it change? Not really. So if we, we initially have a pH of 7.41, uh, after the dissolution, sometimes it's 7.38 or 7.42, as I recall. So it's like, a, it's not, it, that's neglectable. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Yes, we have uh, one question online from uh, Professor Peter Kleine Buddha, uh, and I quote, uh, marvelous presentation. Uh, can you please explain again the difference in the structure of the three polymer polymers? Uh, yes, of course. Can I ask to switch to the uh, presentation? So to explain, we... Uh, we know about the polymers. We know what the manufacturer provides us about. Uh, we also know a bit uh, through uh, from our uh, spectroscopic uh, analysis as well. But as uh, the producer uh, describes in the, um, in the specification, is that uh, what they differ mostly is the functional group. Uh, so as we can see here, we have UH, COH, and uh, uh, pure ending in here. Plus, because it's, a, as I said, it's a, those are commercially available uh, sol solutions that might be used for the transdermal delivery system produced by Henkel. They also provide some information about the donors of uh, uh, vinyl acetate groups. But uh, as it goes for the quantity, uh, we just have our own um, in-house uh, examination of the polymer. But this is what, in general, they differ in. Okay. Okay. Thank you once again. Thank you. Dr. Nikolasek. Um, now 
we are um, coming to the end. The last presentation is given from the industry side. So, and I suppose it's not it's not present online, but uh, not in the in the audience, but online. Okay, yeah. it's present online, not not in the audience. Okay, okay, perfect. So it's given from Dr. Helba, uh, Stefan Helbart, uh, the Vice President of uh, Business Development and Scientific Affairs at Aptar Pharma, one of the sponsors of this conference. Dr. Herbert is a trained biologist. He earned his PhD in Heidelberg at the German Cancer Research Center and after several positions in the pharmaceutical industry, is, he joined APSA Pharma 10 years ago. And today he's presenting us the advantages of uh, one of the technologies of APTA Pharma, that is the airless dispensing, in particular uh, in drug delivery uh, for semi-solids. So please, the audience is... Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this session on airless dispensing. It is my pleasure today to give you a background and introduction into airless dispensing as a safe and convenient means for drug delivery, especially for semi-solids. My name is Stefan Helbart. I'm Vice President of Business Development and Scientific Affairs at Aptar Pharma Consumer Healthcare. Aptar is a US-based company with its headquarters close to Chicago. We're listed at New York Stock Exchange with a favorable balance sheet and growing sales year by year. We are operating globally in the business-to-business -business space with regard to primary packaging and uh, dispensing. We have worldwide presence in manufacturing as well as in sales offices with over 13,000 employees worldwide. We're operating in three segments, which are following a market-driven approach. Uh, we're operating food and beverage. We supply dispensing systems and solutions to the beauty market, perfumery, personal care, skin care, as well as home care, and to the drug market, the pharmaceutical market, with regard prescription and non-prescription drugs, injectables, and others. Apta Pharma is a leading provider of drug delivery systems and components. But even more, we realize that there's increasing demand from the market and regulators uh, with regard to support and documentation around our system. So we are increasing during the last years our support structures and our services where we can help of our pharmaceutical partners to develop and safely market their drugs. We are have delivery systems across a wide range of routes of administration. You can see a couple of examples on the right. We're going to concentrate today on the airless drug delivery systems. Uh, one example you can find the second to the left, and I'm going to talk to that into more detail today. Today, we will learn more about the role and future of airless dispensing. I'm going to introduce and explain airless dispensing technology, which builds the basis of understanding the benefits of airless dispensing with regard to our pharmaceutical partners, but also the patient as the end consumer using such technology. We will discuss how LS Plus, our pharma range of LS drug delivery systems, can be a partner together with APTA and our specialists in a changing world with more and more requirements on the regulatory pathway. And finally, shed some light on how LS dispensing system can be a handle to enter the digital health environment. If you look into the topical drug delivery market, you realize that the majority of formulations are of semi-solid nature. If you consider that even some transdermal products are formulated in gels or creams, it might be well close to 80% of bulks, drug bulks in the market, which are semi-solid. How are semi-solid products delivered to the end user today? The dominant majority is delivered in tubes. If it's low viscous, potentially bottles with closures or bottles with pumps are used. Larger containers are typically jars, especially in hospitals and practice settings. 
If you use a unit dose, unit dose packaging is done in sachets or stick packs. A more niche product is a pressurized system like the bag on valve. And finally, the airless systems, which are our primary topic today. On a global scale, airless packaging is already used in three main regions. That's led by Europe, but close to 35%, North America and Asia Pacific, whereas in the rest of the world, airless packaging is not used so much. If you look into the different categories where airless packaging can be used, it's led by cosmetics and skincare. And this has been historically true because for more than 10 to 12 years, airless packaging is known in the cosmetic and skincare place. But during the recent years in pharmaceutical dispensing, airless became fashionable and we are realizing a nice growth of 3.7% over the next five years. Let's concentrate for a while on airless technology. But first, imagine one of your soap dispensers in your bathroom. Usually that's a normal lotion pump. And while the product is going out uh, with actuating it, it lets air back in into the bottle to equilibrate for the outgoing product. Now, Alice technology does not let air back in. So bringing out a product from an Alice dispenser means you need to compensate for that outgoing product by other means. So how do we do that? There are two systems which basically compensate for the outgoing product. You have either a moving element, like a lower piston, more on the left side, or you have collapsing pouches or maybe a tube. Depending on whether you use a pump, a dosing pump, or a continuous valve, you have metered systems, dosing systems, or non-metering systems. Piston systems typically are designed only for semi-solids, so they would not handle any liquids, whereas pouch-based systems on the right side, they could handle semi-solids as well as liquid products. Let me show you a short video and explaining again the piston airless technology. To use the airless device, Remove the protective cap to access the actuator. While pressing on the actuator, the upper valve opens, dispensing the product from the dosing chamber through the dispensing orifice. With each actuation stroke, a consistent, reliable dose is dispensed. By releasing the actuator, the dispensing head moves up, driven by the mechanical function of the pump system. While the upper valve closes, the lower valve opens and the next amount of product fills the dosing chamber. The lower piston moves up to offset the resulting pressure difference in the container. After use, place the protective cap back on the dispenser to ensure the cleanliness and integrity of your airless device. After understanding the piston technology of airless systems, I would love to present you the variety of systems we have available at Aptar. We have systems that can be filled by the bottom or by the top with various characteristics or connected to a tube-based system. The wide range of options comes on one hand from the container sizes, from very small ones, portable ones, up to 200 milliliter containers, different doses associated with these different container sizes, but also different way of um, actuator designs. They are available for a wide range of viscosity. So if you would change your viscosity during your pharmaceutical development, don't worry too much about it. Up to other systems can handle a wide range of viscosities. If you don't find a standard container, we can customize fill volumes without changing the standard design of the Alice system. And furthermore, if it comes to filling and snapping of the device, this can be done in atmospheric conditions, which makes it very easy and can match common filling processes so the filling lines will not need a lot of change or a lot of change parts and also that's an area of expertise we can consult with so we have experience in a smooth manufacturing path during implementing an airless system with your product also for the healthcare market we are offering a wide range of applicators that helps very much to pick one of for your brand and differentiating your brand already with our standard portfolio of airless dispensing. 
if it comes to very sensitive bulks or very clean dispensing, APTA has a self-closing actuator. That means there is a valve situated in the dispensing orifice. And as, as long as the actuator is not in use, the product in the dosing chamber will not be accessible to air or other environmental influences. Finally, if you want to protect your kids and others not using the medication, APTA is proud to present for a couple of years now the first child resistant senior friendly airless system specifically designed for, for using semi solid medications in the market. Based on the technologies, what are the benefits and values of airless technology? One thing for sure, safety and reliability. So for the manufacturer, that means we have a good protection, we have good light protection. Uh, I talked about the tip seal, which means it's protecting against air and the airless technology does so. Uh, we deliver a reproducible and precise dosing. Uh, and for the end consumer, that means airless technology avoids that the product is drying or clogging and the pump functionality is, is tampered with. And we have means to additionally protect uh, miners against accidental use. The product experience from a manufacturer side, we can offer a wide range of viscosity, it can be handled with airless systems. It's very easy to fill, use existing filling lines, and there's a premium in differentiating design of these airless dispensers. For consumers, it means a nice look, maybe emotional connection to it, intuitive handling, and for um, topical dermatology, it might be interesting that these dispensing systems operate in all directions. So there's a, a clear and a clean 360 degree dispensing. I'm gonna talk about the customer development and how APTA can partner with you uh, and some more details later in our regulatory session. Also, I'm gonna shed some more light on the sustainability aspect. Uh, recognizing that we are dealing with full plastic dispensers. So how do consumers, so users of airless drug delivery think about that technology? We did a consumer study in 2018. We performed that in the New Jersey area. These were participating 27 adult patients. They all were suffering from one or multiple of uh, dermal conditions. And they were evaluating the benefits of airless dispensing in comparison to common tube dispensing. There were three phases in each interview. There was initial spontaneous assessment. We had samples of both all these systems. And then they had a quick educational introduction to airless dispensing technology, and then a final round of feedback and discussion. And I pulled some of these attributes of, of for airless dispensers from, from that study. People felt airless dispensing is somehow innovative. It is differentiating to what they commonly see in the market. Uh, while handling, they felt it's very convenient to use. It's, it's clean dispensing, it is not messy. Uh, they even felt that the dosing is contributing to that convenience and they felt they had a good control on the dose. Uh, then finally, they, they learned that it was very easy to empty, that basically the system empty itself while you're dispensing. And once you realize there's no dose coming out anymore, uh, the, the system is really empty. And they very much appreciated that. And then the last one was a very dominant one. Uh, basically everyone had the experience and feared that the dermal packaging or um, pharmaceutical packaging was emptying during travel and um, spoiling their luggage. And they realized that airless drug delivery systems were very much robust and had the promise that they would not explode in their luggage. Let us not listen, but at least read some of the quotes during that interviews. Some people said the pump is easy, it is intuitive. Uh, they were really appreciating understanding that everything comes out with anything to do. They felt that was a real big deal. And they thought they can very good, they are in control of what they're taking. They wouldn't overuse it in a very easy manner. Uh, they, again, better control of people not wasting have a very nice and controlled and easy access. Some people understood from the airless technology and felt that they would keep the medication protected against environmental influences, light, air, and they felt that might keep the medicine stronger during use. I mentioned about the frightness to, ex uh, to have the packaging exploding in their uh, office, in their, their travel luggage, uh, and, and basically spilling the content all over. 
that was something they really tried to overcome and they were very much appreciating that this was um, overcome by Alice Drug Delivery. And finally, we asked, how would you value these aspects and these benefits? And even 50% of, of uh, attendees uh, said they would consider paying more and picking even a slightly more expensive packages if it would come into an Alice Drug Delivery system. A switch to sustainability, recognizing that these ones are plastic-based containers. I talked about the evacuation rate, so the, the product being empty when it's thrown away and only very, very little up to none um, drug product being inside anymore. Because it's not a pressurized system, we are not using greenhouse gases. Uh, we supply, su support very much recycling streams, uh, especially as the Aptar Air Structure Relief Systems are 100% plastic dispensers. We don't have any metal, we don't have any springs, we don't have any elastomers inside. And uh, that means that the recycling stream can be very much plastic driven. And that's not only what we observed, uh, we can certify about it. And one of these um, outside certifiers are Cyclus HTP. And we asked them to have a view on our airless drug delivery systems with regard to existing recycling streams. And for those countries indicated in the brackets, we are, have a recycling efficiency of 96 to 98%. Uh, so the differences come from the different sizes, but in general, up to airless drug delivery systems are recycled through the polypropylene stream and there's only very little uh, other material inside, which does not conflict with the recycling stream of polypropylene. Even in the manufacturing process, anything we, we not need for the, the device molding uh, is reused into the, the molding process. And if it ever goes out, out of the company to be uh, thrown away. It is not just thrown away, but it's given to recyclers who do uh, better things with it and just doing it into landfill. Especially for pharmaceutical developments in recent years, there had been a, a raise of demands and needs from regulators and requirements from, from the uh, packaging systems and the drug delivery systems. Let me introduce a couple of trends and how we can address those ones with Airless Plus. We see regulatory trends emerging in two regions of the world. In the US, there are changes to the United States pharmacopoeia with a long transition period into the new USP ending in December 2025. But in the recent years, we see demands with regard to the drug device combination packages. So imagine your product in a, in a dispenser is considered a drug device combination and there needs to be more documentation and insight delivered for the device part. Very much like in Europe, where the implementation of the medical device regulation in May this year ask for the same demand, more documentation about the device. And that's something where we can help you as a pharmaceutical developer to create the right amount of data and documentation, which then goes into your final drug device combination filing. Alice Plus and Alice Plus ES is Aptas' answer to those regulatory demands. It all starts with the material, the raw material. So we are using medical grade resins for our Alice Plus range. We partner with our suppliers so that we understand what is inside these resins and how they can support us with, it, with our products. We then create our Alice Plus devices. We creating product specifications, technical drawings. We use these uh, raw material supplier certificates and put everything together in a customer file or into the drug master file in the US and Canada. With transparency on the raw material use and the support from our suppliers, we can leverage good pharma change control management. So that means we get early heads up from our suppliers if there are changes. We can work with the suppliers and our clients to build safety stock to support your transition into the new material. With regard to quality, we have the appropriate manufacturing conditions. We add certificate of analysis with each batch. We have batch retained samples to investigate if anything happens in the market. And finally, we have different uh, teams which have expertise in, in various um, topics in, in that uh, device environment. We have an expert regulatory network in APTA. 
We have technical support. We can assist in filling with you or your CMO, filling CMO. And we have a couple of labs, lab tests where we can qualify with together with your product, whether it it's, makes sense to use an airless delivery. If it gets more tougher with regard to what I presented before, uh, Aptar Airless Plus ES, which means the extended support for the airless range can deliver extractable study reports, we have biological reactivity testing or physical chemical testing according to USP or ISO. And if it's a drug device combination designation with your product, we can create the device part to fit into your documentation supply. Let me end with the last topic of creating a digital health environment. So there's a lot of talks about telemedicine, uh, digitalization of, of medication and pharmaceuticals. But what do we mean by smart device? So if you look at the left, there's basically a shell, a transparent shell with a small white disc at the bottom. And that white disc holds the battery and holds the electronics, the uh, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth device and a small LED indicator of activity. And that connects to the smartphone. I don't need to explain the smartphone, but in the middle you see that our LS drug delivery systems can slide into that outer shell. And that outer shell can be used for at least a year. So you could refill basically the airless system by sliding it into the outer shell and reusing the connected piece with your smartphone. And on the right, you can see basically the connection. In the basic functionality, the, the disk collects the numbers or the actuation basically of the pump and sends this actuation event to the smartphone where you can um, generate the data from. Now in the smartphone, you are familiar with all these apps and that means in connected uh, health, that you can run a lot of help for the patients, especially in chronic disease, like ectopic dermatitis. Uh, you can have um, disease diagnostic tests like the SCORAD. Uh, you can run quality of life questionnaires. Um, they, you can basically have a feedback on with pictures of your skin disease, of your lesions, and how they develop if people are compliant with the medication. So you have an active feedback for the, the patient taking the medication once or twice a day, every day for a long time, that they actually benefit from taking the medication by getting the symptoms better. You can give a, a health environment, for instance, well, what do you do for sports? What, what are tips and tricks from maybe uh, peers from the same disease? Or you have a uh, possibility to run information about the medication they are taking. And everything, all the data you collect, you can share with your doctor. So the, the physician and the dermatologist have a key access to data on symptoms uh, ev uh, evolution when and uh, together linked together with whether the patient has taken the drug. Who benefits from that? So primarily patients because they will, by, while taking the drug, they will have better outcomes. Their disease will be better their symptoms will be less, they will have better experience with the treatment and certainly benefit from an improved quality of life. And that's on the view of the healthcare professional, the HCP as well. So doctors will realize there's cl better clinical outcome, they will waste less medication, uh, people will have better experience with the treatment, have potentially better compliance with the treatment. And that might, together with the use of telemedicine, might open new sources of revenue. For payers and the pharmaceutical companies, uh, that outcome is beneficial in a sense they have cost savings, they have better uh, adherence to the medication, so people will favorably look at the medication they are dispensing, and they might, in discussion with the payers, uh, negotiate a favorable price because we have a lot of outcome-driven price discussions today, and that will not go away in the near future. And finally, large employers, especially if they have a, a health plan with their employees, uh, they will have cost savings, they have avoidance of costs, they will um, appreciate increased productivity, and the employees will um, basically have a better satisfaction. Let me summarize today's session. I introduced airless drug delivery technology and introduced APTA's answer to the raising regulatory market and end consumer demands, which is APTA Pharma Airless Plus ES. We're offering a broad range of airless drug delivery systems to help you differentiate your brand, 
or cope with your challenging drug development project. Thereby we leverage our renowned standards in innovation and quality, but also adding technical and regulatory knowledge and expertise to partner with you. We have a proven track record of more than 50 market references, all done in airless dispensers by APTA. Moreover, we're adding multi-level support and more services around our devices to de-risk and accelerate your drug development projects. And finally, we are building a digital healthcare environment where airless or e-airless could be the first uh, handle to open the door. With that, I'd like to thank you for attendance and I'm open to questions. Um, it was nice to end this uh, afternoon with also taking into account about um, um, drug uh, devices, not only drug and formulations and so on. And now I'm sure that Dr. Herbert is happy to answer to the questions. Please do. Thank you very much, Jörg Breitkort from the University of Düsseldorf. Um, is your dispenser stable also for organic solvents, for example, for gel? Yeah, thank, thanks for the Please? Uh, sorry, are there, are there any issues with organic solvents in the nozzle? Thanks. No, usually not. We don't experience any issues with the common formulations we have tested so far. Uh, we know there are a specific oil that might be very tricky ones. So what we usually do, and I think it's a matter of courtesy, to um, run a quick test, a quick assessment, uh, usually a quick one, really quick one of about a week, but then a more uh, prolonged one about three uh, months in accelerated conditions, just to make sure our dispenser does not fail with the formulation. So I wouldn't say we would not experience any in now or in future, but we haven't seen a lot of uh, formulations failing, actually basically two in my life of 10 years. Poland. I do like the additional functionality regarding the dig digitalization. This is really an important tool to get the medication adherence. And this is meanwhile written very bold. The question I have, is this product already on the market? Are you selling this product with this additional digitalization functionality? No, we don't do so far. And I can very much agree. Um, I did run a couple of clinical trials uh, in my earlier life, and we really have problems with uh, ongoing intake by patients, even in clinical trials. So I could see the value there as well, very much like you indicated. Uh, we, we have two uh, products on the market with asthma inhalers. I, from my experience, that's something which is similarly difficult, like uh, taking drugs in atopic dermatitis or, or skin disease in general. Um, so there we see and start to create data, whether it's really beneficial. Uh, we have a couple of projects running with digitalization in, in dermal, dermatology, semi-solids with airless systems, but not on the market so far. But I expect to see that coming onto the market in the near future. Okay, very good starting point for the next question. I was <laughs> willing to, to ask about the inhalers. So uh, which functionality you have in the only the medication adherence or if the inhalation done properly or both? It is actually both. Uh, we have, and, and that's by, by acquisition of a company and which is publicly knowledge for Hero Health. Uh, they have a medication adherence tracker, which can work with uh, current MDIs, for instance, a lot of, of uh, different um, products on the market but also provide the environment uh, on, uh, together with the app and uh, e-spirometry, at-home spirometry, where you can basically check your lung function as a patient itself. And then all that connectivity around it so that it could be transferred to the healthcare pro uh, professional or data collected anonymously, uh, whether it's going to be in clinical trials or a normal telemedicine, could be both. Okay, we continue the discussion later. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you.
a little question for me. Uh, so mm. thinking about uh, pediatric and geriatric population, um, about uh, pediatric, uh, is it this device actually the DRLS dispensing, addressing the, the need of reducing the number of excipients and or the, at least the, the concentration of the excipients and toxicity related drawbacks in pediatric formulations and also and about geriatric formulation um, is it actually easy to be handled by other people thanks for the question i think for the pediatric formulations are uh, the, the the breaking or, or blocking the environmental influences uh, should help um, to get formulations done which which lower excipients and maybe even lower the amount of preservatives. Um, we need to understand it's not a preservative free. So we have preservative free containers or dispensing systems in eye care and nasal administration, but the, the early systems are not. But I, I think the audience knows about um, bacterial growth and semi-solid formulations, which could be just blocked by, by the absence of water uh, and even we, we talk now in the microbiome space that people are developing a dry formulations in the semi-solid space. And then blocking by a packaging uh, outer influences could imagine that it's, it's really contributing to lowering the amount of excipients. Um, that's something to be tested and, and we have experts who could consult on that as well. Now for the elderly population, um, I'm not, overly positive about that, recognizing that um, I, I talked to my dad who has very dry skin, he might uh, have challenges opening that packaging because it's just very, the, the surfaces are, are not designed for, for a good grip in the end. It is easy to open, it's just to release the cap, you have seen that in the video, and, and the, the button to press is, is pretty big. And, and what helps as well is that if you press to the downwards, you would deliver one dose. So, in contrast to a tube or maybe a continuous system, uh, it might be easier to get the, always the same dose out. Uh, but it is not, in a sense, designed for geriatric uh, populations. And that's something where we investigate quite heavily because we realize population on one hand is getting, getting older and, and older people have more skin disease. Uh, and and that's, that's a common trend since years. I, it's, I don't think it's going to go away with more and more people getting older and older. Uh, but clearly, yes, I believe there is some improvement to be made to even those dispensers. We're not at the at the final stage yet. Thank you for this honest answer. So we need to be honest in that space. Oh yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, and have a, enjoy a great session. So. So I leave the microphone to. So thank you very much for the next day of our symposium.